May now be seated. We now proceed to the session two, which is on the advancements of interventions for ex situ management of conservation priority species. So I now invite Dr. Karthik Vasudevan, who is the chief scientist of the Laboratory for the Conservation of Endangered Species at the CSIR Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, to share his, uh, his work on the advancements. Slide up. So good morning to all. This is a, a spillover from the yesterday's uh, session because we could not hold it uh, yesterday in time. So I'm just uh, proceeding with the talk that I wanted to share with you. And this is an assemblage of uh, uh, work that has happened in Lacons over a period of the last uh, 10 years. Many of you would have come in the previous zoo directors meeting, I might have spoken to you, so I apologize if there is a repeat. But certainly I want to uh, discuss with you about uh, the way we can engage with zoos and how zoos can uh, you know, enhance their capability to uh, uh, conservation breed endangered species using our expertise. So this lab uh, is uh, in Hyderabad. And many of you have visited or accessed uh, the facilities here. And we are part of CSIR. Uh, and uh, CZA is the founding institution of this lab. And when it, uh... yeah, OK. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the uh, next slide, please. So this uh, project was initiated in 2001 by CCMB, and uh, later on it actually became a separate institution, and we have a, a full-fledged lab right now. And uh, the 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 way we have progressed uh, is. Uh, um, is not as uh, rapid as we would expect. Uh, we still have many uh, issues that I would uh, like to share with you that we need access to samples from different zoos, which I will bring up in my uh, coming slides. So I've just highlighted some of the strengths of this institution. We have a, a PhD program and many PhD students go through this lab and a uh, lot of other uh, uh, students come and access the lab and do the dissertations. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, one of the important uh, accomplishments of the lab started with uh, the problem with uh, the Asiatic lion. And uh, you might recollect uh, way back in 1980s, there were scientific findings suggesting that the inbred population of Asiatic lion are going to go extinct. And uh, that is when Lacons was asked to uh, come and present uh, some evidence that this population would indeed reach that fate or it would change. And uh, some of the scientists at that time in uh, uh, CCMB went to GEAR and uh, did uh, reproductive assessment of some of the males, uh, male uh, lions in the population and found them to be re reproductively active. And uh, they also assess the genetic diversity. And as uh, uh, other scientific find findings have pointed out, the diversity of uh, 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 the uh, genetic diversity of the lion population is low, but it is as much as what uh, other big carnivores had at that uh, point in time, as we know. So uh, right now, we also have a whole genome, a reference genome of the lion. and. Uh, we now know that uh, the Asiatic lion has uh, very low heterozygosity. Uh, and this uh, is also characteristic of some other big cats, which are found elsewhere in uh, the world. And now we are talking of the Asiatic cheetah or the 
African cheetah, which is going to come. So similar problems exist with several other species. Next slide, please. So another important uh, work that happened at uh, Lacan's, again, back in uh, the days when it was established, is the rescue and rehabilitation of wildlife. Many animals, an example here presented is of uh, the star tortoise. And uh, thousands of these uh, juvenile star tortoises were being uh, caught at the ports of exit and entry in the country. And uh, they, they, they're not in small numbers. They would go up to 3,000 individuals. And uh, when you bring them into the zoo, obviously the zoo, the first place where all these land up, and uh, uh, they are asked to keep them, uh, and then till, uh, till they find a home, like any other wildlife which is res rescued, we have to quickly find a suitable home and release them. And when they come in such large numbers, we don't know where they have been got from. So uh, some of the initial genetic assessments that were done of uh, populations from Western India and Southern India could establish how populations can be identified using the genetic markers. Now we are also uh, using uh, the modern genetic tools like the next generation sequencing to identify population specific markers therefore we can quickly assign large seizures of these star tortoises to specific populations and uh, we are also moving on to using some other technologies like uh, stable isotopes and uh, be able to identify what these uh, populations might be and uh, this uh, study also led to uh, you know successful the establishment of those populations that were rescued. Next slide, please. This is a work of my colleague, uh, Dr. Umapati, and uh, he works on non-invasive uh, assessment of reproduction in uh, wildlife. And uh, his work has focused on assessing reproductive hormones from fecal matter and uh, because that is the most easily accessible material for uh, wildlife. And uh, many of the reproductive hormones are pretty stable in uh, fecal material, and they can be identified using standard protocols. So we have uh, uh, done many uh, assessments for captive animals, particularly with uh, big cats. And uh, this is a problem because very often we don't know whether the female is pregnant and uh, whether some special attention needs to be given to animals that are reproducing and how to identify a reproductively active individual. So all this uh, could be achieved by, uh, you know, the samples that have been obtained from uh, the initial period. We had a lot of support from uh, the Nehru Zoological Park from Hyderabad and we continue to receive support from them to do our uh, work regularly. And uh, these samples have established clearly that you can predict when uh, the, the onset of uh, pregnancy and what measures need to be taken and how you can identify reproductively active individuals. And another area which we are, uh, which uh, Dr. Umapati is also uh, developing his expertise in is in uh, evaluating environmental DNA tools and how we can apply it to perform even surveillance, you know, uh, from air or from water, if we can identify uh, pathogens or any other uh, organism, even an invasive species in an aquatic ecosystem, and how we can play a role in mitigating the, uh, the threats that might emerge from either the pathogen or the invasive species. Next slide. So uh, microsatellite markers are very important uh, tools for assessing population. Uh, you might have already heard yesterday from uh, our uh, Akanksha Madam where she talked about uh, the, the pillars of the vision plan for zoo. So the first four pillars are, have a very strong scientific input. We need a scientific basis to make 
those fillers active, those fillers, uh, you know, uh, available for implementation. So we require many of the genetic tools to be mobilized to help the zoos implement conservation breeding programs. So microsatellite markers are, uh, have been well uh, uh, established as tools to understand genetic diversity in populations. And we have used this very effectively in many populations. And uh, you might know that there are 24 species prioritized for conservation breeding. So, uh, but unfortunately, we don't have assessments of the founders of majority of the 24. So we did one for, uh, we have done for uh, the red panda, we have done for snow leopard, we have done for mouse deer, but all other species, 24 species, we have no idea about the founder. There are probably records uh, which are of the identity of the males and females involved in the conservation breeding, but we don't know what has happened to F1, F2, how they have planned the breeding subsequently, because the founders are obviously not there now. So there, is, uh, there are many generations that have passed. So there is a need to establish the diversity the genetic diversity of the founders. So I'm just highlighting one example here of how we proceeded with the mouse deer. Uh, so we had uh, a good panel of markers which we could assess the genetic diversity. There were seven individuals to begin with and uh, we could plan the breeding of those seven individuals. Next slide, please. So uh, this approach has helped in uh, making the population genetically viable. Now we have a, a growing population in Nehru Zoological Park, which is the coordinating zoo for the conservation breeding of mouse deer. And we have gone one step further in making sure that this population also goes into the wild. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I just mentioned to you, from a very small founding population, the population is has become well established in the zoo and this requires uh, a very thoughtful engagement with the captive population of how much uh, relatedness is there between individuals and how you can plan breeding between them and knowing the reproductive biology of the species we know that the species has very distinct uh, reproduction uh, uh, reproductive biology compared to other ungulates. So we need to intervene and take measures to ensure that the population is planned and bred. Thank you. So uh, this is uh, just a, an example of how engagement with the zoo and the scientific institution can lead to spin-offs which are uh, really important. Uh, one is that we could show that the evolutionary relationship of the mouse deer is very distinct. It is not related to any of the existing, we call it a deer, but it is not really a deer. It is a, a group of uh, uh, ungulates called Moshiola. So they are very small tragulids, which are uh, don't have antlers, and uh, uh, they are very distinct to the Asian landmass. And then uh, we also know that they have a very distinct reproductive biology, that they show postpartum e-stress, and uh, they, there is uh, clear pheromonal uh, uh, signatures that attract the uh, male towards the female and indicate its re her reproductive condition, and there is uh, mating soon after uh, the female gives birth. So the population can be rapidly ramped up in a very short time. So uh, in 2010, there were, uh, you know, uh, there were just seven individuals. And uh, in 2018, 255. So this is uh, uh, a very significant achievement by any uh, conservation breeding uh, program of a species. And uh, 2019, can you click? So we prepared a, a reintroduction plan for the species. And believe me, in 2019, when we were asked to prepare the reintroduction plan, 
uh, I searched uh, for many, uh, you know, sources where such things have happened. For ungulates, there are not many, okay? So we were given a month by the State Forest Department to prepare a plan and reintroduce them. And uh, this was done in Amrabad Tiger Reserve. And then subsequently, three more uh, reserves in the state. So uh, it gave a lot of confidence to the State Forest Department as well as the zoo and us as scientific institutions to engage with the uh, state to implement such a big program. And it is going on very uh, nicely in uh, the state of Telangana. Yeah, wildlife diseases are uh, a big challenge and uh, we have uh, several new ones that are getting included in the, uh, in the uh, fray for becoming very significant threats to wildlife populations, both in captivity and in the wild. And uh, we have, through the support received from the Central Zoo Authority, developed some uh, assays to diagnose very, uh, 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 very common uh, diseases that uh, affect uh, wildlife, particularly large carnivores like uh, CDV, CPV. And we have multiplexed uh, these assays so that we can readily diagnose these uh, diseases quickly. And we are also working on other uh, diseases which are impacting wildlife. And we are developing assays that will be able to uh, diagnose them reliably. Thanks. Another area where I think we should uh, really uh, enhance our capacity is by biobanking. And um, all the three species that I have uh, indicated here, like the black-footed ferret, uh, the cheetah, and uh, more recently, the northern monarchan rhinoceros. So we have examples where biobanking and cryopreservation of uh, genetic resources has helped in uh, enhancing the population from very low levels. So that is uh, a very significant advancement in our ability to bring back species from extinction. And we should uh, develop our capabilities in this. And if you uh, look at the accessions of zoos, uh, more than 60,000 animals in Indian zoos, several of them are important to be uh, preserved in the form of uh, genome resource banks, in the genome resource banks. So we need to uh, get these samples in time and be able to preserve them. Next slide. So this is just a map, uh, a very recent publication on assessment of uh, uh, a global assessment that took place. We were able to put uh, India in the map that we have a biobank, you know. So the, we, uh, there, are may, there are about 23 biobanks and IUCN is starting to create a specialist group on biobanks. And uh, uh, for the entire region, if you see, there are not many. There is, uh, uh, there is one in Thailand which is developing, but uh, they have more accessions than us. They are more recent than us, but they have more accessions than us. Uh, as I told you in my earlier slide, we have been there since 2007, and our accessions are only 23 species, which is very poor compared to what other biobanks are doing globally. So we have to really raise our uh, levels of participation in the global efforts to biobank species. And uh, repeated assessment of different uh, uh, taxonomic groups, next slide please, have revealed the need for biobanking. For example, in India, the need for biobanking is huge, but we have one biobank, and what are we, what are we able to biobank there? Very few. Uh, species and the limitations are something that we will discuss. So, uh, if you if you look at the reproduction of any animal, we have uh, uh, of any endangered species which are involved in conservation breeding, we are worried about the founder population and the fertility of the individuals. So, I discussed these two points earlier that we can reliably establish a good founder population, a genetically viable founder population. And uh, there are tools to do that. 
and we can also assess the fertility of these organisms. That can also be done. And once we do it, we need to also make sure that the, the, the germplasm of these species are brought into biobanks. And that is going to establish a very long-term strategy to uh, breed these species effectively. So the, the strategies we employed, uh, we employ are all uh, listed there. Uh, we have trained people to perform these activities uh, and we have uh, all the instrumentation and the capability to do these uh, uh, ustered reproduction techniques. And we have uh, cryopreserved many uh, germplasm of uh, endangered species. So this is my colleague who takes uh, all the effort of doing the biobank uh, in uh, Lacons. And uh, uh, the effort to do this will only be successful if all the zoos commit to contributing to the biobank. And uh, we have already, uh, I think, uh, 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 the director from uh, Padma Janaidu's zoo will also be speaking sub subsequently. We have been able to help them also establish a, a biobanking facility in their zoo. So uh, it is a question of time how we scale up this whole effort and make it available as a, uh, a national resource for all the people working towards conservation of endangered species. Next slide, please. So we are targeting all these tissues, probably more, the list is not as, as exhaustive as I'm showing here. And uh, as you know, the, uh, the science in terms of harvesting useful genetic resources from any uh, small fragment of uh, biological matter is, uh, is just uh, rapidly expanding. And uh, people are biobanking human uh, uh, tissues, uh, pathogens, and uh, we should do uh, almost a matching measure for all the wildlife. Next slide, please. So this is our uh, uh, biobank on the right side. Uh, we had uh, the union minister come there and uh, inaugurate this uh, facility. And uh, Dr. Sambashiva went to San Diego Zoo where they have the frozen zoo and he was trained in that zoo to perform these uh, activities and he's taking the lead in uh, uh, running this facility. Next slide, please. So uh, I just wanted to mention here that on the 17th of this month, we are having a, a workshop in Hyderabad and many zoos have already been nominated for it. And we hope to have a, a very engaging session with uh, roughly, I think uh, 17 zoos have been nominated. And uh, we will have a, a very uh, fruitful session, I hope, where all the zoos will commit to contributing to this uh, biobanking effort. So uh, just to summarize the salient contributions of this uh, lab and how we can contribute to the future of conservation breeding of uh, endangered species and working alongside zoos uh, has been a, a very rewarding journey for us and we would like to continue to do so in a more purposeful way in the future. Uh, I just wanted a, a small uh, you know, question or a hands up from people here, those who are involved in uh, conservation breeding of prioritized species. How many of you have got your founders genetically tested? Yeah, I, I mentioned red panda and snow leopard. Yeah, it's only a few. I mean, I don't know, Nehru Zoo is there. Yeah, red jungle fall, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we have a few, but you, uh, I mean, the Vizag Zoo still hasn't done the uh, wild dog assessment. So there are, yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, but it's still worth. Uh, it's still worth. Uh, you know, the, I I understand that. Uh, you know, there are issues with how these accessions were originally made. But uh, given that you have them and you are employing them for the conservation breeding, I think 
the logical step is to first make a clear assessment of what you have. <clears throat> so yeah, this uh, itself is a good uh, indication that we expect a lot of zoos to come up to us. We are not tasked enough, if I may say that very uh, uh, frankly, we are not tasked enough at Lacons. Uh, we should be asked more questions. We should be asked more uh, analysis reports. And uh, uh, if we do that, I think uh, the zoos will be benefited and uh, we will be happy to have done our job. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karthik, for giving an overview of the lab, of the work that your lab deals with. And I hope that the officer in charge of the other zoos will also, you know, go ahead and take a proactive measure to do what you have formed. So now following this uh, plenary talk, we now I now invite Mr. Ajit Kulkarni, who is the executive director of the Sri Chama Rajendra Zoological Garden, Mysore, to share the conservation breeding perspectives from his zoo. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here to present about you know conservation breeding efforts of Mysore Zoo. As you all know, uh, this February we completed uh, uh, 130 years of you know existence of Mysore Zoo, and uh, many of the species which Mysore Zoo has you know taken up for uh, conservation breeding. Uh, in fact, you know like in uh, many of the zoos of our country. At Mysore Zoo also they are you know breeding very well. Uh, but uh, the dedicated you know the conservation breeding efforts based on you know scientific principles uh, started recently, I would say. And uh, next slide. Yeah. So as per CJD's recognition, uh, we are uh, coordinating zoo for uh, Indian Gaur and participating zoo for uh, lion tail macaque. But on our own initiative. We want to take up, you know, conservation breeding of uh, Indian Grey Wolf, Dole, uh, Nilgiri Langur, Giant Squirrel, and uh, uh, Grey Jungle Fall. Of these uh, seven species, uh, the facility. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Facility for you know four species, you know, has already been established. For that is for Gar, uh, Grey Wolf. Dole and uh, lion tail macaque, uh, we could establish. Uh, uh, we must be knowing Mysore Zoo, the limitation is area. We don't have you know, uh, space luxury in Mysore Zoo as such. Uh, we should be thanking Karnataka state government. They have allotted 113 acres of uh, land, uh, which is in the outskirts of uh, Mysore city as such, to uh, you know, establish dedicated uh, rescue and rehabilitation facility and conservation breeding facility. Uh, within that, you know, 50% of the area we have reserved for uh, taking of conservation breeding activities in coming days. Next slide. This is this is the area allocated for different species. Next. We also have come up with, you know, separate you know, administrative building plus uh, veterinary hospital. And our idea is to develop this center into, you know, center of excellence in coming days by involving institutes and other uh, organizations who are involved in uh, uh, wildlife as such, especially focused on uh, biology and uh, veterinary aspects. Next slide. This is the veterinary hospital exclusively for rescue center plus conservation breeding center. Next slide. Yeah, as, as I was mentioning, facilities are ready and uh, wild dog, Indian gray wolf and uh, gaur has started functioning and LTM, it is yet to start. Next slide. Lion tail macaque. Uh, it is, you know, I would be knowing it is, you know, critically endangered species, so less than, you know, 3,500 left in the uh, world as such. Uh, in fact, you know, Europe and America, they have done much better than our uh, us. Uh, I am told that, you know, uh, Europe has around uh, 500 individuals and uh, America has around 400 plus individuals. They are doing much better. As a range country, all put together, we don't have even 100 in our uh, collection. So that is, you know, where the, it's, it's, you know, it, it is a species which needs uh, to be preserved through active involvement of, uh, you know, ex-situ conservation. 
yeah this is our expert committee we want to really you know do it on scientific principles we have involved ccmb and uh, mysore university and ncbs and even you know dr werner he is a, earlier he was a coordinator for isa for ltms he also agreed to be a part of our expert team and uh, we are uh, looking forward to start our uh, project as soon as possible slide in fact they want to start you know uh, capacity building and in, in werner himself you know he wants to engage our biologists veterinary doctors and uh, keepers in uh, proper uh, uh, husbandry and veterinary care of uh, ltms as such but we are waiting for uh, approvals uh, because of that you know we are uh, asking him to wait for some times uh, because what happens should not happen we uh, conduct training now by the time we get approval it would be too late so we don't want that next slide next slide even you know we involved experts at every stage even involved you know selection of a site finalizing design enclosure design and what should be the population from where we need to acquire next slide acquire you know wild individuals next slide it is a year old photo next slide see we were told that as per you know molecular study uh, there are two populations in uh, lion tail macaque one is south of palgat and another is north of palgat uh, for mysuru zoo they are suggesting take a population uh, found stock from a population from an uh, you know area which is not north of palgat which is you know well represented in a uh, state of karnataka within karnataka we want to capture from two sites one is kudremukh national park and uh, another is from you know uh, karwar uh, forest division next slide in case of ltm we wanted to start with you know four is to six uh, founders uh, population uh, from wild but our uh, state has told you start with the two is to three to begin with later we will see what to be done so we are waiting for approvals and uh, once we get approval we will start with that and indian gaur uh, indian gaur uh, in fact mysore zoo is housing you know indian gaur from 1958 and we have bred uh, bred around 130 plus individuals in mysuru zoo uh, they are doing pretty well as of now we have around uh, uh, 20 plus 28 recently we you know till uh, recently we had around 38 recently we have given around uh, 18 individuals to another zoo in karnataka which is coming up with a safari for gaur next slide this is you know first block developed for a uh, conservation breeding of uh, gaur it is around 9 uh, acres of land next slide uh, recently we got uh, you know approval for uh, acquiring wild individuals uh, one is to two of that we could uh, so far get one is to one from you know uh, designated areas of karnataka forest areas next slide these are the young calves you know we got from uh, forest areas of karnataka recently we are waiting you know maybe in within next month or so we'll be getting another female from a forest of karnataka yes as as sir mentioned we need to do that you know genetic assay of that indi those individuals to assess how they are different or related we'll be taking uh, you know taking up in coming days we want you know them to settle down first and later we'll sedate them you know draw the biological samples next slide this is a tentative you know what we are planning indoor housing is also required for you know so you know breeding of a species for close monitoring and veterinary care this we would be taking up in coming years next slide dol uh dol in fact you know we got our found stock from vizag zoo uh, they are doing pretty well and they are breeding well and uh, uh, our experience been you know their uh, um breeding success is better in i uh, know uh, dedicated facility compared to zoo zoo there will be you know whatever we try there will be little bit of uh, disturbance but given privacy they are you know prolific breeders litter size is very matlab uh, it is huge you know in one litter we got around 13 14 pups so that is the size and uh, survival is also very high next slide again you know as sir was mentioning we need to do that you know genetic analysis to assess how diverse they are next slide uh, next slide this is the facility uh, in a dedicated uh, breeding area next slide 
the breeding well and uh, with the technologies like cctv and all we are able to monitor how they behave and how they take care of their young ones and all they are pretty good but very sensitive even for you know vaccination you know it is a, it is a task they are very sensitive come into lot of stress and uh, you know vets really have a great challenge to you know vaccinate them if they rush there is a mortality because of myopathy so that is a thing it is a, but very sensitive species prolific breeder next slide next slide gray wolf again uh, we have been housing them for last 40 years they are also doing pretty well uh, you know again to start our breeding on scientific principles uh, we have acquired our you know found stock one from indoor and another from uh, uh, mumbai zoo and uh, not pune and uh, uh, mysore and uh, we are planning to acquire few more individuals from rajasthan and uh, madhya pradesh so that you know it becomes genetically diverse population next slide next slide this is the facility uh, we are ready to you know acquire more of uh, found stock to make it in you know, a viable sort of population next slide next slide next slide again all you know data is being maintained on you know gyms as well as uh, mi system of uh, cjd uh, documentation all is uh, proper uh, but uh, here what we are facing uh, problem is uh, in uh, even beat wolf or dole uh, we have to identify the release site with these being you know carnivores and you know at times especially this uh, wolf it is very likely to get into conflict so identifying those areas is uh, you know major challenge because its natural habitat in you know state in the state of karnataka is it's under the you know anthropogenic pressure a lot of mining is going on in that area because of that we getting you know release site is you know it is a uh, challenge as a precursor you know two years ago in fact we had a sort of you know stakeholders meeting in the you know balari district where they are found naturally uh, to begin with you know we have to create a sort of stake in the population as such so we were planning to come up with a, a sort of a safari for uh, wolves as such so that when they, when they identify uh, wolves as their ambassadors then they may involve in their conservation after that we will go to field and uh, we'll try to release them but release site has is you know it to be identified next slide uh, good thing is you know many institutes are coming forward and the technologies are there we should leverage that to place our efforts on scientific grounds breeding grounds uh, and uh, we are trying to you know involve experts in the relevant field so that our efforts become you know scientifically correct next slide yes this is one more uh, one important thing is that and we need to have uh, sufficient you know technical staff for that we need to have a biologist or a field officer who knows about the nitty-gritties of breeding so that we need to uh, as of now it is in a, we are in a nature nascent stage our uh, zoo veterinary officer and zoo biologist is you know managing they are managing but in coming days we want to have a dedicated uh, biologist for each of the species so that everything is documented properly next slide yes another important thing is uh, we should take up uh, breeding only when things are you know conducive not only climatic conditions everything administrative so, you know set up financial supports clearances everything you know everything is important one thing uh, delayed it becomes a problem i just want to share you know one issue uh, we built our uh, facility for gaur in 2017 but approval took us you know it took 43 months so meantime what it happened they raised the objection that it is a wasteful expenditure because you have not put into use that facility so that should not happen so we need to address that issue then only you know uh, we can proceed uh, further uh, that's it from my side thank you any questions here yes sir
सर यस सर सर आई एम नॉट generally the conservation program is uh, taken up for highly endangered species and species which are difficult to breed in captivity but uh, as far as gaur is concerned its uh, its breeding is very good and uh, as you know in mandalo zoo we have more than 40 50 gaurs are there what is the scope for the conservation program for gaur we are taking up you know we are taking uh, Conservation program for difficult species. To sir, breed. thing is, zero. Uh, it is not only about breeding. We should know everything about that species. It could be an you know, old disease surveillance. It could be a difficulties in breeding. It could be artificial insemination. Because the what I am told is, and what I could read is, that their population, global population of Indian goat is less than twenty five thousand. You know, lesser than our elephants. So we need to standardize other practices also, right? if you want to go for assisted reproduction what could be what are the difficulties what could be the way ahead and all we need to standardize then only we can you know prepare for worst situations in coming days that is one of the reason you know why cjd you know included that in a conservation breeding programs of us cjd okay yes sir uh, this is regarding this uh, uh, dole dole species and wandlu uh, zoo is the pioneer in breeding the dole for the first time Okay, I was associated with Andalusia Zoo those times, and we bred successfully. But uh, as you say, because of the repeated breeding from the same population, the there is you no know, genetic diversity, and uh, later on the, the we fail they fail to breed. As you say that uh, genetic uh, um, manipulation is necessary uh, with the wild animal, wild wild species, so that we can the population will be in a good condition. So congratulations for your effort in taking up this project with Dole. I published a paper in Zoo Biology. Yes, sir. The first breeding of uh, this species in India. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, I wanted to, uh, you know, add on a uh, few words about that inbreeding. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, we had a old stock in Zoo uh, because of inbreeding. There was, you know, deformed legs. You know, pups yeah, yeah. or high yes. deformed legs. We had to sterilize them so that they don't breed anymore. Uh, and uh, we got the stock from Wizak, and they are doing. But in coming days, we need to infuse you know new blood from wild. Yes, that, that's, that a, that's a must. Yes, sir. yes sir. repeated you, breeding. Sir. We have that same experience. Yes, sir. and as you say, the isolation, the privacy is the True, uh, <laughs> main factor for uh, breeding. If True, you isolate uh, the thing, they breed very well. Yes, sir. Thank it should sir. not be exhibited to the public. Yes, sir. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you so much, sir, for giving an overview of the conservation breeding uh, perspectives from the Mysore Zoo. I would also like to inform the participants we will take questions uh, post the session. Means once the session is done, we will take questions from all of you. I think there was another person who had a question for Dr. Ajit, so we'll take it then. Uh, I now invite uh, Dr. Basavraj Holayachi, who is the director of the Padmaja Naidu Himalayan Zoological Park, Darjeeling, to share his ex. to share the exit to breeding initiatives that are placed in place in the zoo idha uh, good morning to you all uh, respected madam and uh, uh, Hello, participants. I would like to present advances in interventions in uh, ex situ management of conservation priority species in uh, Darjeeling Zoo. Uh, our zoo started in 1958, but since uh, middle uh, in the very early beginning, the focus of the zoo uh, went on to conservation breeding of uh, endangered Himalayan species. the park includes uh, three conservation breeding centers first one was established in early 1980s uh, old conservation breeding center then uh, satellite zoo for herbivores and pheasants at daw hill and conservation breeding center for at topkedara for uh, red panda and snow leopard both established in uh, in last uh, one decade
Oh, the, we are coordinating Jew for uh, five species, uh, snow leopard, red panda, Himalayan wolf, Himalayan newt, and satetragopon, and participating Jew for blue sheep, uh, uh, gray peacock, Himalayan tar, blood pheasant, and monal. And other than that, we are taking up conservation breeding of uh, uh, various species on our own, uh, Himalayan goral, markor, and takin. Markor and Talking like not exactly conservation breeding, like we had founder population and uh, the breeding is taking up successfully. We need to plan it further. And we're doing it for Khalid's pheasant, Tamik stragopon, red jungle fall, and also like exotic species. We can say like uh, they are breeding well, golden, silver pheasant, and lady amres. Thank you. Next. So this is, these are our two conservation breeding facilities, uh, one at Topkedara, which is established within uh, Sinchal Wildlife Sanctuary. Another is at Daw Hill, which is in five hectares of uh, reserve forest of Kershaw Division. Uh, just click it for video. So this is a, a drone view of our conservation breeding center at Topkedara. You can see there it is established in a very natural setting within the wildlife sanctuary, and there's hardly any disturbance of for uh, humans. So this boards very well for uh, conservation breeding of uh, especially red pandas, which is its natural habitat. Next. So uh, coming to the red panda, which I, we have been doing very well. So this is the basic uh, introduction, which is a schedule one species. And it is distribution uh, is uh, from Nepal to east of uh, China. There are two sp subspecies. And uh, together, there are less than 10,000 individuals. But in West Bengal, there are only less than 100 individuals left, including two protected areas, which are uh, un connected with each other. So this is a matter of serious concern. Even though we have connectivity with Sikkim and Nepal in one side, uh, but uh, like the species is under threat because of the small number of population that is left. So it is an unusual and highly specialized indiv individual, which is a carnivora occupying a specialized niche as a bamboo feeder, like giant panda. Right? So like uh, the conservation breeding started way back in 1980s with uh, four uh, individual populations from wild and 94 two cubs were, bo uh, were born, which is the first birth. And then uh, in 2002 to three, we had healthy population of 23 red pandas. And since 1994, there are 76 births of uh, red panda in the zoo, including uh, six this year, which has been the highest in a single year. And we have given uh, red pandas to other zoos like Auckland Zoo, Gangtok Zoo, Sikkim, Nainital also. And uh, since 2021, we are the stud book uh, keeper of uh, red pandas. Earlier, it was only Netherlands Zoo. So reintroduction of red panda first started, started in 2003, where we had released two female red pandas in single illa, and which were tracked with uh, VHF collars. And in 2004, one of them gave birth to a cub. And since then, the reintroduction has somehow stopped. And uh, in the, now we are in 2019, the red panda augmentation project took place, wherein we'll be introducing red panda, captive bred red pandas in both single illa and uh, Nura Valley. And it includes multiple aspects. One is captive breeding and reintroduction. Another is uh, taking care of the habitat. But there's no point in reintroducing animal if the threats uh, which are existing continues to be there. And also, we want to develop expertise in rehabilitating and captive breeding also. So these are the four individuals selected. And uh, the genetic analysis of the individual was done at uh, CCMB Hyderabad and the Institute of Science Education Research, Kolkata. Based on that, uh, the individuals with highest heterozygosity were uh, selected. Because once they go back to, into the population, they add this heterozygosity into the wild population, which could be having high homozygosity because of uh, small number of populations in a limited area. So we also check the relatedness between the individuals through genetic studies. And we individuals which were, uh, were high, um, like distantly related and highest heterozygosity were selected for the release. And uh, selection of collars is extremely important in conservation breeding program because red panda weight is around four to five kg. We need a very light uh, collar with high, uh, latest technologies. So we selected uh, uh, litter back iridium collars, and uh, these which are less around 200 grams. And they have uh, trans satellite transmitters, time release device, looped antenna to track it on the field through VHF uh, antenna, and a foam, because it, uh, which will give cushion to the neck. Otherwise, because there's a rainy ter uh, terrain, and there could be fungal infections, bacterial infections, which could be fatal to the individuals. But these are some of the issues which we are facing now. 
So big acquisition of these scholars is taking prolonged time because being uh, it has to be imported from outside and at, at several levels, DGFT and MOF. So this needs to be sorted out. Otherwise, like taking six months, seven months for uh, getting governor to call it and very expensive. So now it has become more than six lakh per caller. So it, any like uh, startups within the country should be promoted who can develop these kind of callers within the country because now we are taking up conservation during of so many species across the country. So this will be of uh, great help. Right? So like before uh, release, we went for intervention behavioral competency because these are Jew bred animals, but they should be told that they are going to be in the wild. So they were exposed to all kind of uh, wild uh, uh, situation gradually because like sudden introduction could also be not suitable. So association with feed was uh, disconnected by switching it to natural uh, feed and induced various anti-predator and hu human associate threats, which are uh, which they will be getting exposed in the nature. So because of this foraging and vigilance behavior was observed. Only then uh, we decided that they can, they are fit enough to to be released in the wild. So this is our uh, soft release facility before living into the wild, uh, 1.74 within the Singalila National Park. And this is how it looks like in uh, uh, when there is a snowfall. And we have two researchers and field assistants permanently stationed there to monitor the animals. So back to the finally, like four, the, they were released in January 15th and finally they were released in uh, 26th March. So this year again, we are uh, planning to release three more animals uh, later this year. So uh, this was one of the project like in conservation breeding uh, uh, program, it's, uh, nutrition becomes very important. Way back before 2019, all our red pandas were obese. Like we, we could not figure it out because like uh, the plumpy red, red panda looks very cute and uh, people liked it also. But once we observed it, like they were averaging seven kgs. Ideally, they should not be crossing five kgs. So overall, like it will like 40% obese. So like feed was decreased, this, uh, after this study, feed was decreased, white uh, bread was removed, and they were made to run around for the feed, which is natural uh, in the wild. Uh, so because of that, the weight came back to four to five kgs. And this resulted in increased births in last uh, three years. So this is also very important, like right kind of nutrition is very important. And they're very responsive to change. Within one or two months, we can bring back their weight. So wish we could have that kind of system with us. So diet and weight of all animals are continuously monitored uh, uh, for uh, after these studies you know, for all the animals in different conservation breeding programs. So now we are planning to acquire more animals because like we have to enrich uh, genetic diversity con continuously. Two females from Rotterdam and two from Hals Gap. They here also like ex excessive delays has caused lot, causing a lot of problems because one New Zealand Jew had to bring it. It took two years and they ref straight away refused that we can't uh, go on like this. So like here, these are also like uh, going on for last two years. So finally now it is lying at DGFT. So this issue needs to be sorted out. Then coming to snow leopard, not to go into much details, like these are the places where it is distributed and you can see that Darjeeling is not a uh, natural habitat of uh, snow leopards. Still, we are, we are one of the Jews which is taking a most successful conservation breeding program of uh, snow leopards. And we started uh, way back in uh, 1983 uh, and in 1986, first pair was brought from Zurich and later from uh, uh, US Jew and the uh, pair gave birth to uh, two female cubs, which was the first successful birth of snow leopard in captivity. And since 86, we have 72 animals born and uh, presently we have stock of uh, 10 animals. And we are coordinating Jew and participating Jew are Lake Kupi, Nainital and Gangtok. In 2004, we gave a pair of uh, snow leopards to participating Jews, Gangtok, Nainital, Kufri and uh, Shimla to establish uh, uh, subsidiary snow leopard conservation breeding centers in these Himalayan uh, Jews. And uh, this is one of the study again in conservation breeding uh, program monitoring health is extremely important. Like one of our female snow leopard was uh, detected with hyper uh, cholesterolemia or triglyceridemia, which means altering the animal uh, like high amount of triglycerides in the blood. So the, we can see left the blood has become literally whitish. So like again, the intervention was uh, take, taken up and uh, it was given high, uh, uh, replaced the uh, food, red uh, meat was uh, completely stopped and they were given more of chicken and they were uh, made to 
uh, live feed was given so that they will run around and also like for the first time we ourselves tried uh, saroglitazar tablets and over the period of time the blood came down, the cholesterol came down so you can see it in the right side so this was uh, published in uh, 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 the international article also so future direction because as with respect to snow leopard we are at a crucial junction because this was the recent document published by CJ Day, National Stud Book uh, for uh, rare, uh, Snow Leopards. So breeding and maintenance of genetically viable captive population through acquisition and exchange from national and, and international juice is very important to maintain genetic diversity of the captive population. And CJ Day recommendation accordingly like uh, 30 individuals in next 20 years need to be uh, uh, developed. So need to have a roadmap and detailed uh, plan to achieve this. So because like we, our maximum capacity is 15 individuals, so we need active co coordination between participating Jew also, so that we'll be able to have this thriving uh, population. So we can get uh, a pair of snow leopards, both for our Jews and also participating Jew, so that we can develop a genetically diverse backup population, not just in one place, but in multiple places, which we can exchange with each other. So augmentation and reintroduction program in collaboration with different agencies. So maybe it can be explored in the near future based on uh, proper studies. So again, uh, one more animal, Tibetan wolf. He started in 1990-2000. So ours was the first Jew to have successfully bred uh, Tibetan wolf, So which we got from Sikkim. Total, there were 24 births. But animals were transferred to Sikkim, Nenital, Kufri. But current stock is only to five. So in here, like we need the international, we have to acquire animals either from uh, wild or uh, from other Jews. Otherwise, like it, the inbreeding is setting in. For so last two three years, there is hardly any birth also. So there is heavy inbreeding and uh, no breeding for last five years. So we need immediately bloodlines to continue this uh, conservation breeding program. Yeah. Yes. So Himalayan newt, another small species, like uh, we have 50 individuals. Now further we have to develop this uh, uh, further by in inducing new uh, bloodlines as per the guidelines of uh, this uh, uh, seizure day. Then these are another species like uh, Tragopon, Himalayan molan, blood pheasant. So like uh, satire and blood, we don't have any birds presently. So we need to acquire them uh, from wild or uh, from other Jews. So issues uh, conserving why pheasants, like we need uh, new bloodlines on new individuals immediately other, uh, so that we can continue with these uh, programs. And uh, we can have also for the species like blood pheasant and monal, which are highly endangered in the wild. We need to have a long-term uh, reintroduction plan also so that they're highly threatened in the wild. So these are some of the advances we are now through artificial incubation. Our uh, incubation and hatching has improved substantially in the last two, three years. So again, another uh, gray peacock, the same uh, problem. Then Himalayan thar, we are breeding uh, thar and uh, blue sheep successfully. So like currently we have 10 is to uh, 6 stock of thar and 10 is to 7. So we need regular exchange of these herbivores also so that uh, the bloodline can be maintained. Even though the breeding is very successful, but we need in the long term because the exchange of animals. And we can even explore reintroduction of this species, uh, especially Himalayan thar in native habitat. And Himalayan goral, even you were not participating in Jew, like uh, we have been successfully conser conservation breeding of goral. And uh, la la this year we released two individuals. And later this year we are planning to re reintroduce six animals in Mahananda Wildlife Sanctuary. So we are like presently, this is the proposal. And we want to propose, we, are, we, can't be, we can be participating Jew for clouded leopard, golden cat, and siro also. These are native to Himalay, uh, Darjeeling uh, hills and the sightings and uh, the individuals in the wild are reducing. So we, we want to be participating Jew for, uh, if CJ Day agrees, they, we can, it, yeah, Darjeeling can be included uh, in this conservation program. And also we are planning to do conservation breeding of two endangered butterflies also, uh, Kaiser Ayind and uh, Bhutan Glory. Over the years, many uh, butterfly watchers have reported that the population of these two butterflies is coming down. So we have come up with a detailed project to do conservation breeding and reintroduction of these two butterflies. So these are, pro uh, these are the reintroduction program. And some prophylactic measures are very important. We are regularly doing to stool tests to identify parasites in the population. And we have come up with a handbook on gastrointestinal parasites 
of wild animals in captivity. So member secretaries are kind enough to write the foreword, and uh, this is under uh, printing. So it will be circulated to other Jews also if required. Uh, next, this blood test, we have been continuously doing blood tests for various hematological parameters to continuously monitor the blood for any kind of uh, abnormalities or uh, carrier of uh, blood parasite. Again, we have come up with this handbook or on baseline hematological and zero biochemical values to know the range of, we don't know the range of various blood parameters. So this study, we have tried to establish the range so that we can, come, we can get to know the abnormality if the range is uh, there is any deviation. So thanks to WBJ and CJ, they also like we got a lot of uh, funds last year. So we could acquire many of the advanced equipments so that we can do all the in-house anal uh, analysis in-house itself. And important research works like uh, research is very important part of uh, conservation breeding. We are doing gut microbiome uh, study with the CCMB, habitat analysis in Neura Valley in-house research. And also we are characterizing behavior and reproductive biology of Takin and Markor. With respect to Markor, this is going to the first paper because we, there is no single research paper. Basically, it is in the higher reaches of Pakistan and Afghanistan. So even we are planning to go for reproductive hormone profile and DNA, mitochondrial DNA sequence also. And uh, so these are planned research projects in the coming years. So feed analysis of red panda in wild with CCMB. So because presently we are doing through visual observation or studying the scat, which is highly, there's a lot of limitations, especially in red panda, sighting itself is difficult. What it is eating in small quantities, even in scat, most of the, uh, the, the things get digested or absorbed, like uh, berries or insects. So with the with collaboration with CCMB, like through DNA sequencing, we'll be able to know the exact uh, composition of the feed and assessment of genetic variation and museum study also, we are comparing DNA of museum specific with current to know the difference. Huh? And biobacking at cryopreservation approved, like it can enhance conservation breeding uh, exponentially. So the, some of the general issues that the, the delays in approvals is causing a lot of difficulty. If you can have a coordinating committee between DGFT, CJD, and MOF, so that uh, biannually we can sit and sort out these delays, it will be very useful. And regular be meeting between coordinating participating Jew is important for uh, strengthening conservation breeding program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Basavraj, for giving an overview of the Padmaja and Aito Himalayan Zoological Park Conservation Breeding Initiative. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to take questions after this session because of the lack of time, but I hope you know you can interact during the lunch and catch up on the pertinent issues that you thought. Uh, we now move on to session three of today, which is on the wildlife diseases and One Health. One Health, as you all know, is a collaborative, multi-sectoral and transdisciplinary approach to optimize health outcomes across uh, sectors. So I now invite Dr. Sindhura Ganpati, who is a visiting fellow in the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor uh, to the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, who will speak to us more on the priority areas and the activities related to One Health. Good morning. Is this on? I have a hard time staying in the same place, so I, so I took. Good, thank you. Uh, it has been a privilege uh, to be part of this group. In some sense, I feel like I belong here, and in some sense, I feel like I don't belong here. Last year, I met many of you in Kevadia. I'm a veterinarian by training, although I worked in human health for uh, most of my career. So I see many veterinarians, people deal with uh, animals. So that's, in that sense, I feel like I belong here. But I know almost uh, nothing about this topic. So you have been very kind to educate me on various issues, opportunities, and uh, I have made a career out of knowing superficial things. That's what I will uh, talk about this now, uh, which is going to continue uh, in this form of one Health, which is, a, which is an area that I have been tracking and part of for more than a decade now globally, and used to be very frustrated with the way this topic is being defined, which is very vague, uh, which is human, animal, planet, which almost feels like everything is included. You know, you have to go to Mars to find something that is not One Health. And when that happens, it's very hard to f do something about it. It's like world peace. Everybody agrees with you, but what do you do about it? And uh, with uh, COVID, 
uh, this topic has really exploded and you, every place you turn, there is this term One Health being talked about. Uh, in, in India, many ministries have been working, uh, had been working on it, uh, and it has been decided that we need to coordinate all of it. And from our office, we initiated this national effort towards creating a national mission on One Health, which is what I would like to talk to you about. And I added, I added this word, uh, these two, productivity and conservation. Uh, One Health for better health, uh, productivity and conservation. Because health is usually the most dominant theme when you talk about One Health. These zoonotic diseases and they, how do they come to us humans and you know, impact us uh, disruptively. But very few people uh, think about uh, productivity, which is as we speak, there is a pandemic, our technical word is panzootic, the outbreak happening in cattle uh, in the form of lumpy skin disease and in pigs, African swine fever, and very few people know, and it's gonna have profound consequence for the sector and in return, in turn for humans, as humans in the form of uh, food security and economic. And this is even less thought about, because oftentimes uh, both of these, sectors look at you and say, you are the source of 70 plus percent disease. And I have not put that slide in because I hear that as the introduction for the most part. But very few people put your, themselves in your shoes because your job is conservation. And you look at those two and say, source of disease <laughs> uh, for, for you, you know, foot and mouth disease or uh, the same uh, outbreaks, including COVID, uh, and many issues that impact you in return. So. The goal for One Health is to take all three, and I see that as very complementary, and they are not mutually exclusive. Oh, it changed. Okay. Many of you asked who I am and what is PSA because it is. It, it seems like uh, it's not very uh, obvious uh, uh, outside of Delhi circles. So PSA stands for Principal Scientific Advisor. Uh, that is my boss. Uh, current PSA is uh, uh, Professor Ajay Kumar Sood since uh, March. And our office is basically the science and technology, uh, the forward looking and cross ministerial areas of science and technology across the board uh, and looking uh, after that and uh, advising various ministries in the government. Uh, and the very first PSA was the iconic uh, APJ Abdul Kalam, and since then there have been many. And uh, we look at many areas from defense to health to uh, environmental technologies and whatnot, and I focus mostly on the health part uh, in the office. Is there a lag? Okay. Now, this is an informed audience. I don't have to say that these are pictures of monkeys. Uh, and I showed this at some uh, place, and somebody who knew showed me there was a discrepancy between the name and the, so I'm always afraid of uh, <laughs> putting these pictures in front of people who know. But the reason why I wanted to show this picture is, this is a Casino Forest disease, KFD, which many of you probably know. Arbovirus comes from uh, mon uh, largely monkeys to humans, although it is still uh, fully uh, not settled through tick. Uh, and causes mortality and uh, hemorrhagic diseases, both in monkeys and humans. And, and since its discovery, its footprint is expanding. And now it has gone beyond uh, Karnataka to five states and potentially even beyond five, st uh, five states. That is not just with this disease, but many diseases we see this pattern, uh, including monkeypox. It was localized for a long period and then suddenly uh, it's everywhere. And that is true for, uh, oh, so this is th that what makes it very uh, complex is the multiple hosts it is in, uh, 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 that, that are engaged, um, difficult to do surveillance if you are not uh, careful about it. And we don't fully understand the uh, epidemiology of it for, it for us to impact it in a proper coordinated manner. And there aren't good effective interventions. I didn't even click. I guess I just pointed and somebody's clicking. <laughs> oh, sorry, this is uh, it's going to be a bit inefficient because I didn't expect uh, I expected this to work. So there are too many animations. Now, this just shows uh, it's schematically. You have this wildlife compartment, and I for the for the ease, I also separate it to free range and captive. 
and it has implications both from a surveillance management perspective and the animal husbandry and human health systems. And diseases, diseases uh, go back and forth. Some diseases uh, impact or go back and forth between a couple of the compartments uh, like foot and mouth disease. Um, and many diseases go across these uh, compartments. And some of them go one way, like rabies, largely one way. Whereas uh, tuberculosis uh, or other diseases go every which way, and we don't have a good sense of their transmission dynamics across these compartments. Um, and they do share a bottleneck. That is, there is a mode of transmission uh, involved in here, which is important both from a surveillance point of view as well as control point of view. While diseases go horizontally, our uh, programs go more like this for administrative reasons and uh, they are largely vertical. And they go sometimes more often like this, uh, which is uh, different schemes and vertical schemes. This I put it to show center and state <laughs> divides. Sometimes it stops here and sometimes it starts here. And I've seen examples of uh, all these flavors in my uh, tenure uh, in the government now, even in the short, short ones. What we need is to make things into horizontal way, just like the diseases go horizontally. That includes how you, how you sample for information or uh, how you use technologies to address it. But most importantly, how you, this is the most important part. This is how do you link them through administrative incentives? That is the hardest part and it's the most important part, especially when some of these are divergent in that the problem is in one place, impact is in another place, budget flows in a different perspective. So what's the incentive for this person who is impacted, who doesn't have control uh, over the other side? That is the challenge for One Health. Now, um, for, for this mission, we're going to be focusing very much on the disease control because uh, uh, that is the largest, uh, most important, most obvious part. Although it involves, One Health can involve AMR, water quality, I mean, climate change, everything. But we are going to see whether we can make progress on this focused disease control part. And I'll say more. And uh, we had a review of all the concerned uh, ministries and their efforts. And then following that, we had a discussion in uh, uh, something called as forum called Prime Minister Science and Technology uh, Innovation Advisory Council, PMST Act which is chaired by the PSA and all the key uh, representatives of all the relevant ministries were part of it, all the at the secretary level, including Niti Ayo and NDMA. And we, uh, that happened in July and the decision to launch it as a mission mode uh, was uh, taken up. So it's still fresh and we're just building and that's why when they asked uh, me to come here, I rerouted my plan so that I could discuss and engage, and this has been quite valuable, even this sideline discussion where you tell me about areas that I hadn't thought about and how to incorporate it in this. Um, these were the areas that were put forward. One is integrating existing activities, especially from a you know, disease surveillance side, uh, integrated disease surveillance, I'll come to that, and efforts on data, it's a huge uh, thing in, in and of itself. Um, and pandemic preparedness, and but that is both human pandemic as well as animal pandemic preparedness. Uh, and uh, R&D, uh, because for us to be prepared, it involves us to be planning for which diseases we care about and investing in them, stockpiling necessary uh, tools and activating them when it is needed not just to mention R&D in the other aspects such as surveillance where uh, things such as environmental surveillance have huge implication, but we have not yet tapped that across human, animal, and uh, livestock and wildlife side. And linking these things to the global effort because there is a lot happening globally uh, across these. Now, the idea is, the reason why NDMA is going to be a very close partner to this along with other ministries we want to think about pandemics and disease outbreaks as a disaster, how we think about whether it is earthquake um, or floods uh, or even war, how preparedness is thought about in that. Um, 
so that we actually uh, bring those lessons and uh, things that have worked in those areas and then apply it to our health or disease outbreak preparedness. And that is being currently thought about and there are many uh, implications at the national level, state level and local level because preparedness for flood or, uh, or earthquake is quite, quite a bit local and how you get the community engaged and we learned during COVID if you don't have that, we will uh, face serious uh, problems in the way, you know, messages go through uh, and uh, in the way preparedness go through. Now, I men mentioned integrated disease surveillance. I would like to take a few a quick examples on what is happening in the uh, animal husbandry side, what is happening on the human side and what may happen, what could happen in the wildlife side. In the animal husbandry side, one big step change or uh, revolution that is happening is uh, in the building of this digital architecture where you, uh, animals are uh, uniquely identified like human Aadhaar and moving of uh, more and more transactions uh, for the farmers through mobile, which is quite accessible now, so that they are able to access their animal records through their mobile just like us humans should be able to access our electronic health record. Uh, and transact with the uh, market um, and uh, frontline workers, largely veterinarians, para veterinarians, moving to uh, digitally enabled system for them to either provide e-prescription or, uh, uh, or whether it is uh, sending a sample to the lab, but the animal ID follows it and the response comes back digitally and linking all the diagnostic labs through uh, laboratory information uh, management system and that is linked to this field and uh, call centers and all of the data living on the cloud and I mentioned all of this in one sentence but the, one, one few sentences but this work has been happening now for about 18 months which I initiated when I took over uh, about two years now and uh, um, the idea is that we will be able to move, uh, we will be able to link all these aspects where you actually make the transaction and life of the farmer and veterinarians better. The point of point here is less about data. It's not about a joint secretary wants to uh, track a program, so how do I build a system? Oftentimes that's how it uh, uh, happens. But here you have to think from the user's perspective, how do I give the value to the people so that for example, when a government uh, uh, wants to give subsidy, there is a new program called as uh, eRupee, which is more digitally uh, loading up their mobile uh, directly. And that will have huge implication on their value proposition on why I need to use this system. Right? What's in it for them to have animal tagged and use that? So that's how it is thought about. And uh, uh, quite a bit of, you know, this is just to, there is fair bit of background technical architecture that needs to be built, just like UPI. When I use my phone pay and pay 10 rupee or 2 rupee, what I, do, what I don't see is this. But this exists behind the scenes. Same with Covin platform. So that's why when I joined, I brought people who design uh, UPI, Aadhaar, uh, and there are a few people who have that uh, really uh, fantastic ecosystem, technical architecture brain, and brought them to help support this uh, work. And right now, as we speak, uh, TCS is building this back-end architecture and it's being rolled out um, as we speak. And that will have an implication of how disease tracking happens in animal husbandry side uh, going forward. Uh, where you actually ca capture uh, diseases uh, from, I just wanted to click through the whole thing. Uh, multiple sources so that your disease surveillance cannot be one person reporting. That will not work because the person is busy, it's, it doesn't help their routine job and your data is not accurate, you cannot triangulate and it's not based on actual events in the field. Right? So here the idea is that uh, this uh, will now link source data and metadata will be captured as they transact through their routine uh, things. And you can have different levels of data that gets captured, whether it is through uh, field activities or some of the things that you do as an ongoing program. Now on the human side, similar, uh, let's click through that because this is not really, uh, 
there, you know, in a public uh, human health system, there is identification system, and there is preventive population health approaches, and there is this uh, uh, public health uh, public health system where you have primary, secondary, tertiary facilities, and there is also private care where most of the care happens. There, these two are almost like merged. There isn't that kind of distinction between primary and secondary. Um, and what is happening there is uh, through National Digital uh, Health Mission, the idea is that electronic health records become part of the routine uh, care so that your data and your access to care follows you, whether you access care here or here. And, uh, that, and care is supported through you know, uh, uh, wide coverage of insurance. Um, and the whole ecosystem um, is built uh, where, uh, where you are able to track uh, longitudinally as the person goes through their life journey and care, as well as the referrals as a, a, a pregnant woman showing up at a primary care and identifying as a risk because the, she, is, she has uh, twins, when, the, when, she, when she shows up for a delivery, will that information track with it, right? Because you need to have that uh, risk identified and appropriate referrals uh, link. So all of that is likely to be possible if we actually activate and uh, follow through this kind of vision. And this becomes the source of data for uh, seeing whether the disease outbreak is happening and what diseases and where it is, et cetera. Now, we need to have, a, then for us to be uh, comprehensive, there is uh, livestock I covered, the human side I covered, what about wildlife? Right? So right now, that is the gap that we need to fill. And that's where uh, National Referral uh, Center, uh, NRC, uh, you have uh, probably heard a fair bit about it, that comes into picture. Um, the, the big part there is, you know, how do you do disease surveillance in the wildlife side, where you have so-called captive compartment, and you have free-range wildlife, and your ability to sample is quite divergent between the two. Uh, what we need is, one, need to figure out how to provide a, uh, access to, whether it is technologies, assays, uh, laboratories, institutions. Uh, so that's why what Karthik was saying was quite uh, 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 relevant. And we need to think about it more from an ecosystem perspective, so that you have access to higher level assays that you want to do, as well as local level uh, um, problem solving you need to do at the zoo itself uh, or a protected area. Now, our ability to sample is quite high in this captive space, in, in a zoo. And, and zoos, as I was uh, discussing, I uh, sit in this very unique uh, and learning through this conversation, sit in this very unique uh, system where you're exposed to huge human footfall and population. You also have a, an interface with the wildlife, uh, free range wildlife through either animal release or just you know, birds go fl flying between the two or humans uh, uh, going by, back and forth. And how do you sample this, where your ability to sample them is very sparse? You cannot keep sampling them, collecting you know, uh, swabs or whatnot. So there, uh, some of the opportunities should be how you think about, uh, for, for, for example, whenever there is rescue, how do you enable that, uh, uh, that, that point of intersection to collect samples or ability to collect information? And environmental uh, sampling uh, that is able to capture information across the board because we don't really use it. And say, say in summer months, water holes become the source of uh, multi, you know, entry point into the information system that you may not be able to access otherwise, and, and so on. But all of this should be thought. The reason I put this is oftentimes we build this disease surveillance for somebody else to make a decision at the top. But that's not going to work, uh, which is very uh, uh, almost obvious from lessons learned from other places. It has to be useful for the stakeholders that the zoo directors here, or the uh, zoo veterinarians, or the animal handlers, and what's in it for them? 
right? So how do you make it useful for the local uh, decision making? And as a result, you have to you will have a much better uptake, and that becomes the source of data. So the I don't yet know how this could work. I what I was able to think through in animal health side. How could we make it work in this side? I don't quite know, which is where I like your engagement and brainstorming and come up with ideas. This is how it should be designed, where it helps me, it helps my people as a director, but you will get be, be able to extract data and information which will be useful for uh, state level, national level, or uh, beyond yeah, decision making. That's the, that's the synergy, if we could figure out, it'll work. Uh, and the idea behind this uh, center uh, now is, I'm just speaking on behalf of whatever work is being done at uh, Caesar Day, which is the uh, nodal body uh, setting this up uh, under MOEF. And uh, I was fortunate to be just be part of, a uh, small part of the uh, bigger group that is actually designing it. The idea is that we fill the gap that exists in the form of not just an institution, but a overall ecosystem for disease management in the uh, in the wildlife sector because you have many uh, interested parties to work on diseases with wildlife sector either because zoonotic con uh, concern or because uh, 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 animal husbandry is worried about uh, diseases coming from uh, wildlife reservoirs but the goal here is to look at it from inside out what what uh, it can do for the wildlife sector from a conservation point of view uh, and beyond. And uh, addressing zoonotic diseases become one of the uh, byproducts. So the idea is that this institution will engage with uh, regional centers and local uh, uh, implementers. Uh, it is not a top down, at least envisioned to be top down. And also engages with the global collaborations. But the main focus is both disease and health management and uh, surveillance and outbreak control and all of that disease control uh, activities that need to be taken up um, and information management at a uh, at a uh, ecosystem level or the national level but it should be developed from the point of view of users so that this information management system is useful for you yeah whatever uh, currently digital systems you have is one small part that needs to be expanded to be useful for you to do whether it is your logbook or whether it is your uh, whether your disease reporting or whether it is your approval process how to make it easy for the users that in turn will lead to uh, a better data capture from the national level and on top of data analytics that gets become part of the uh, decision making um, and uh, capacity development uh, and training, all of that uh, is obviously going to be part of it. And big part is shaping the policy. There isn't a single coordinating body that is actually developing and shaping policy for what needs to happen in the uh, wildlife side, which is a gap that this entity is supposed to fill. And I'm just giving you a quick overview, but I, exp I expect uh, Dr. Shukla uh, or uh, Akanshaji to talk more about how they envision and this to become reality. But this is still at the early stage and it needs to be matured with con con conversations with uh, uh, stakeholders. To sum it up, what has happened at the national level now is uh, two committees have been formed with representation from all the relevant ministries. Dr. Anup, who will be speaking after me, who is representing uh, at the, uh, from the ICMR side. Uh, this is an executive group that basically, and Dr. Shukla uh, is also part of the uh, committee, this One Health Action Group. And above that, uh, we have a uh, APEX uh, uh, steering group that is chaired by PSA and all the key secretaries. And the idea is that we are going to basically develop, uh, ground up, the One Health uh, mission that has four pillars, prevention, integrated disease surveillance, that I mentioned a little bit more uh, detail, An integrated outbreak response, that happens more at the local level, but sometimes when the things go out of hand, it needs to be coordinated at the uh, national level. But for those things that go out of hand, those diseases, we need to have a serious pandemic preparedness uh, plan in place. That also I mentioned, that includes early warning system, stockpiling, uh, exercises to find out gaps and so on. 
and things such as data and R&D. And this is very important uh, for the people who work in the One Health space. Right now, there is a lot of frustration and very justified frustration. If you want to work in this space, approval systems are horrendous because you not only have to follow the human, if I want to work on, say, brucellosis, uh, I have to not only follow the human health side guidelines, follow the animal husbandry side guidelines, and follow wildlife side guidelines. And each of them are complex on their own that I would not dare to take on. Now we are asking for a divergent asks from this group. On the one hand, we say we don't understand, we need more data, we need more information, we need more studies in this. On the other hand, we are creating an approval system that just basically chases people out. So I actually presented this as a real gap that we need to, regulatory is okay, actually. Uh, product approval process is uh, re reasonably streamlined. Uh, whereas study approval system has to take a serious view now and uh, requires streamlining. And uh, that is uh, the goal of the mission. Uh, and I would love to take uh, questions afterwards and uh, the conversations to improve and gaps and feel free to just poke holes. And it is totally up for revamping. Uh, I believe in uh, uh, strongly or passionate ideas, but loosely held. So I'm very passionate about the idea, but I hold it very loosely that I can change it. If you come up with a new uh, way of thinking, I'll change it 180 degree. Uh, thank you so much. So these are just the uh, just the family of uh, ecosystem players that we need to, and pretty soon I will likely grow very old. Uh, this is just the key stakeholders from a national level. This is not the entire ecosystem. Because obviously there is private sector, there is uh, uh, non-governmental uh, active uh, partners to make this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sindhura, for the lovely presentation, which gave an in-depth review of the wildlife disease surveillance, the protocols, as well as in, on One Health. So now we move, when we talk about disease surveillance, occupational zoonosis, especially in the present times wherein we are reeling from the effects of the pandemic, is of pertinence. And it is the most common where, you know, you have animals and human interfaces, especially at work. So to speak more on this, we have with us Dr. Anup Velayudhan, who is the scientist at the Indian Council of Medical Research, and he will provide more information on this topic. Good morning. Uh, First of all, let me start with an expression of thanks for inviting us here, Dr. Mahajan, Dr. Sir. And uh, it's a whole new world for me out here, but interacting with you has brought me happy memories of zoos and a childhood well spent. You know, the first memory of zoo is always a happy place for any person in this country, and it brings happy places to me as well. And one thing that came across these two days were the kind of passion that you exhibit towards your work that is really really contagious let me tell you that and hats off to all the conservation work that you're doing in this space so i'll be talking about occupation zoonosis and surveillance uh, let me run you through the contents uh, i would like to talk about zoonosis to one health the journey and the evolution of the whole paradigm the current research in zoos and wildlife that we have documented and the ICMR's One Health profile going through it. I would uh, touch base on the current work that we are doing as part of the ICMR mandate and uh, slowly move on to animal health and the forest regions and then the expectations. And we are as part of uh, what Dr. Sundura has been telling. Um, and thanks for setting the tone in motion, sir. And it's a tough act to follow you. But then uh, the whole focus and thrust on One Health has had a regenerating effect. And we as ICMR would uh, like to have committed ourselves in your effort with other ministries and to follow through and build collaborative bridges across to work together. So this is also a study pitch for an, a proposed study that we plan to do in the zoos as well. So broadly, you know that zoonosis is any disease or you know uh, infection that gets transmitted from vertebrate animals. Uh, there are over 200 known types of zoonosis where uh, we, as in, in, in the case of Indian culture and population, we live in close relationship with agriculture as uh, agricultural animals, 
companionships and also as part of the natural environment. And any disruption uh, in, in the whole ecosystem leads to disruption in the production and trade of animal products also. That is one thing, the economy, that we need to be cognizant about. Zoonoses comprise a large percentage of new and existing diseases in the, in the human beings. And uh, it also a percentage of all newly emerging diseases are also zoonoses. You know that HIV is today an, uh, an, uh, a human disease, but at first it started in the animal sector and in rhesus monkeys. We also have recurrent disease outbreaks of Ebola and Salmonella every day. And even the novel coronavirus that causes uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we know the stories and the mystery surrounding it. It's also said to be of uh, the wet market origin and came from the animals itself. Next. This is the importance of zoonosis. Uh, one billion cases of illness. When I talk about illness, this is human illness and death occur every year from zoonosis. And 60% of emerging diseases, that uh, emerging diseases, I mean diseases which not have actually happened but are coming up, those are reportedly zoonosis. We have new human pathogens of 30 numbers that have been detected in the last three, de 30, three decades, and 75% of them have originated in animals. So we basically started out from uh, bovine spongiform encephalitis, uh, and then you have Nipah in 2000. We have the Marburg virus that had common in. We have different varieties of influenza coming in, and then we had Ebola, which wrecked havoc in the African continent. And then we have Zika coming in, and uh, 2020, we lost three years of productivity due to COVID. And today, we are facing the imminent danger of monkeypox, even in our country, where several cases have been reported with or without previous contact to animals or even with human beings. Next. So as Dr. Sindura mentioned, One Health is a big topic. And uh, all of us were rearing to go. There were many ministries that have been worked to go. We must realize it's an all-encompassing umbrella of which we have to work together solidly shoulder to shoulder and to share knowledge, labs, and resources wherever possible. So environmental health, ecology, and veterinary medicine is a part, along with public health, human health, molecular medicine, and even health economics. We can't talk of just individual health or you know, population health and ecosystem health in separate compartments where we know it's all interlinked. Uh, traditional approach has been that we look at antimicrobial inf resistance, bacterial infections, viral and vector-borne and parasitic infections. And then there was another whole compartment where zoonotic infections, like uh, you look at bio threats, bio safety, food safety, and then there was the whole component of surveillance, vaccine, therapeutics, and vector control. So this comparative and translation medicine is a different field. But the whole umbrella we have to recognize is One Health, and we all stand under it now. Next. So these are the, some of the publications that I wanted to present to you that uh, ha actually happens among zoo workers. So this is a publication in 1991 to 2010. Uh, uh, so this was a publication among Auckland Zoo staff where they found that there is a small percentage of work-related infections including Ercipilis, Giardiasis, and Campylobacters that was previously undetected in zoo workers. Also, there were zero prevalence of antibodies to hepatitis A infection and Toxoplasmosis gani, and three veterinary clinical staff had raised Chlamydiasis, Cytokosis antibodies. These are previously undetected bodies when there was a research study, and then they found that these are the infections already prevalent among the zoo staff in that country. Again, this is another study from Vienna, where they found uh, only when they looked for this study and they suspected and did, did this research study, they found 97% of them had antibodies to at least one zoonotic agent. So the problem is the eye does not see what the mind does not know. If you don't look for zoonotic diseases among the population that regularly interacts with animals, as in the case of zoos, uh, sanctuaries or national parks, you would not be able to find them out. So the many, many new infections like influenza, H1N1, orthopox viruses, leptospira, and even a brucella species were found, which were new to that population and not previously detected. Next. So these are the publications from India. This is a review study 
which states that the, uh, the role of India's wildlife in emergence and re-emergence of zoonotic risk pathogens have been huge. So it's already documented that, uh, you know, wildlife origin diseases can affect both livestock and human diseases, which includes what uh, Dr. Sindura had alluded to, KFD, influenza, Nipah, Japanese encephalitis, rabies, plague, leptospirosis, anthrax, and leishmaniasis. I have been speaking to a few of you, and you have mentioned that, of course, leptospirosis and rabies that you commonly encountered. But the whole factor that anthrax being a biosafety, biosecurity agent, and you have animals who harbor anthrax, and then it can come on to the human population pretty quickly. Thank you. So this is also a review paper that looked at occupational zoonosis in zoo and uh, wildlife veterinarians in India. Uh, this was published in 2013. You know, cutaneous leishmaniasis, KFD, Nipah virus even, and then scrub typhus. These were the diseases that routinely have been found in uh, zoo and animal life veterinarians. And in a time span of 68 years, there was also brucellosis, Japanese encephalitis, leptospirosis, and listeriasis that had come up. So a very, very different world that when we look at stuff, you find to you tend to find diseases that previously haven't existed. Next. So this is also a KFD, uh, an outbreak investigation of case new forest disease that happened in Bandipur Tiger Reserve. So they, we find a number of uh, sample positivity in humans, monkeys, and even in the tick tick pool. So it's not that we have escaped from the threat of zoonosis. It's pretty much there where you want to find it. And slowly and steadily, we have been finding inroads into doing research and detecting it wherever it occurs. Next. So um, ICMR has been doing pretty much um, formative research in this field by way of its projects and isolated research. So this is an, uh, two of them are publications from in EID. This is identification of a human case of avian influenza. Uh, that was an 11 year old boy with acute myeloid leukemia brought in, in Delhi. Again, we found out a, a novel reassertant avian influenza virus that was actually found out during an environmental sample during surveillance in Maharashtra. We also found out lab-confirmed avian influenza in 2019, which was in a seven-month-old boy with severe respiratory infection. So these are some of the cases where spillover has taken over from the animal species to the human species in a very serious form. Next. So ICMR has also been uh, handling human and animal surveillance. Uh, we detected the first confirmed case of CCHF from Rajasthan. And we also helped detect the canine distemper virus in the Gujarat state. And uh, in 21 gear lions, we detected um, uh, the canine distemper virus. So you know, Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever and canine distemper viruses can have a lot of economic implications. And uh, the, the studies help to determine that these diseases actually occur here too. Next. We also have been, uh, we have institutes which look at vector surveillance and vector biology. We actually uh, wrote the first report on transmission of Zika virus by ADIPC during the 2018 Zika outbreak in India that was primarily started in Kerala. And we also have evidence of the infection of Orientius susogumushi in vectors and animal host, that is the scrub typhus that comes down and uh, forms, gives rise to, you know, uh, it starts with a fever, but it can go on to acute encephalitis syndrome, infecting children all over India. Scrub typhus has to be found to be the major etiological agent in uh, encephalitis syndrome in UP, West Bengal and Assam, and in a host lot, lot of uh, acute febrile illness findings. So, Apart from that, we have also established zero surveys in many parts of the country. Uh, we did zero surveys among patients uh, and contact of patients, and we found that there are infections among contact of patients, even when it's not apparent. We found three subclinical infections. Two people had IgM and IgG bodies, and only one had IgM against Nipah disease. We also did a cross-sectional zero survey of CCHF 
fever in IG in livestock. That is one pioneering study where we received around 5,000 samples from animals and we detected IgG in positivity in 354 samples. So these were some things that was as an iceberg phenomenon not detected apparently before. Next. So currently ICMR has a network of next generation sequencing. We can find out the uh, pathogens and we can diagnose the undiagnosed even if it's a novel pathogen discovery and that forms the pathway for doing an early detection of zoonotic spillover. We have capacity for training and capacity building and that is where we would actually find out the next pathogen that is coming in. So we also have our research and development capability in uh, R&D in rapid detection of CCHF and in standardization of the RDT of NEPA itself. Thank you. Next. So one of the strengths of that ICMR harbors, and I think which should not be repeated, and these facilities are all open for collaboration. We have a state-of-the-art BSL-4 facility at ICMR NIV Pune. We are coming up with a dedicated ICMR One Health Institute in Nagpur. We have collaborations with veterinary colleges, ICAR, MOEF, uh, state governments, and also the National Center for Disease Control. These are the research that we have undertaken all over. We also have an indigenous mobile BSL-3 lab that can actually go to the field and stay there in case there is an outbreak and actually help in detecting the field detection itself at the very level. And this is one IJMR, Indian Journal of Medical Research, which we dedicated to One Health last year. Next. So this is where we want to put a dent into. This first diagram is uh, what you see. Uh, most of the spillover uh, happens in the animal sector, and then there's a the spillover which happens to the domestic animal population. There is genetic amplification here, and then it actually happens to the human beings. So this is the timeline that it actually takes from a spillover from the animal sector to the human sector to come back. So in 7 to 21 days, if you have a forecasting mechanism available, you can actually detect a pandemic or an outbreak coming up. You can actually institute a rapid response, which actually benefits the animals themselves, be it wildlife or be it zoo sector. And then you can have control operations, which actually controls and benefits to the people. So a timeline of such proportion, it tells us that you have enough time to respond and there are ample opportunities for you to set up surveillance and detect the pathogen before it affects humans. Next. So this is the governance structure for One Health that we currently have. We have the DG ICMR, we have a technically advisory group, and these are the partners that we work with. Uh, we have an expert lab group that is currently working on diagnostics and availability of tests not only at the labs, but also point of care test. Anybody presenting with an illness can get a point of care test that is being developed. We have an expert clinical group that is looking at One Health pathogens, their constellation of syndromes, and which would be identified at syndromic surveillance. And we would also constituting an expert surveillance group so that we can put up targeted surveillance in you know zoos, um, other unorganized sectors such as slaughterhouses, abattoirs, wildlife sanctuaries and even in wet markets that we think as we go ahead next so the current work that is going on in we have started out with a syndromic approach a syndrome means a constellation of symptoms that a patient comes with and we would have an tired algorithmic surveillance for one health in india we have the vrdls viral research diagnostic laboratories that look for a constellation of syndromes like diarrhea, respiratory fever, fever of unknown origin, rash, jaundice, encephalitis, hemorrhagic fever, and conjunctivitis. We have these three working groups that are working on redefining these constellation of syndromes, which we would actually adapt and work to the One Health world. And then we are also working on the Interministerial Action Council on One Health in KFT and in Karnataka, which will be a close uh, collaboration as well. Next. So this is the study that I would like to introduce to you uh, that is being proposed. And uh, a big thanks to the Central Zoo Authority for hearing it out and having the initial meeting with us. So 
this is titled the incidence of one health priority diseases among zoo workers in india it includes veterinarians animal handlers and zoo keepers and anybody who has a contact with the zoo animals themselves so we will set up a system of reporting new cases as per case definitions that would pitch up in each zoo we will have surveillance protocols as per the surveillance working groups uh, we would request that zoo personnel and staff be asked to report if they feel any symptom falling in the listed syndromes we would dedicate personnel to the zoos at the stations to assign codes and approach them for study enrollment we would also do snowball case identification so that if any other person is also sick in that zoo he can also be brought on next so the aim is to describe the one health priority diseases among uh, zoo workers veterinarians and animal handlers the objective is to set up a sentinel site surveillance system for one health to ascertain the incidence of one health priority diseases and to strengthen diagnostic capacity including next generation sequences to identify unknown and novel pathogens these are the secondary objectives to have outbreak investigations conducted in zoos if you have a cluster of cases that come up of any origin be it animal origin or be it a cluster of human cases next so this is the methodology that we are hoping to adopt uh, it would be a cross-sectional sentinel study site of six site using syndromic surveillance and a tired algorithm these are our strengths uh, in different parts of india so we hope uh, that uh, in pune chennai uh, trivandrum gohati kolkata and rmrc bhuvaneshwar next uh, these are the zoos that we propose to have set up this study this is still a work in progress uh, uh, it's my it's our, my humble request that if uh, you are in these cities or in these regions and if you would like to be a part of the study please uh, please let's talk and find that out so this is just a proposal that has still to be formed and uh, discussions are going on in this next so these are the case definitions that we would use an inclusion criteria with an exclusion criteria on helping us to find out who would be recruited into the study next and then we would in, uh, use an uh, syndromic approach as i informed earlier we would use case definitions constructed by a working group of clinicians to identify the case and then the each person would be approached for enrollment after taking consent we would also take re relevant clinical samples and uh, sociodemographic data and beef history so that we know the basic exposure pattern and the risk profile of the patients also next so we will use a tired algorithm which would use rapid detection tests serological and rt pcr a big plus or the amplifying factor would be that we would all the undiagnosed samples if we don't find anything they would be subjected to next generation sequencing so that at the end of the day you have an etiology at least to 70 to 80 percent factor we would also collect the environmental samples wherever possible to corroborate the diagnosis and also establish etiology next so this is the implementation plan we hope to identify the stakeholders that's still in process protocol and data capture form development we will pilot out in one or two zoos and then expand it data collection process data analysis and data disseminations so we hope to do this through a period of 36 months with the icmr headquarters and other icmr institutes identified as stakeholders next so the expected outcomes is that we would have baseline data of various types of infections among zoo personnel we would identify common one health priority pathogens from the baseline data we would have a model of one health syndromic surveillance to pilot in other organized sectors such as uh, wildlife parks sanctuaries and the unorganized sectors such as abattoirs and wet markets we would be able to identify gaps in the detection of priority pathogens and also enhance the capacity for surveillance detection and response next so this is the concept diagram that we have uh, any person who works in the zoo gets one of the syndromes or starts coughing we collect the case details on a form and also take the sample and he is sent to the laboratory for diagnosis and then we also collect environmental samples like ticks poop or the insects or any sample that is available for collection and then next 
then you have a diagnosis which is corroborated by clinical diagnosis, environmental findings, and if possible, also clinical samples from the animals itself. And then you have a referral mechanism for the case who can then be referred appropriately with the diagnosis, and then he can be adequately treated. Next. So there are uh, ample avenues for us to collaborate. As I said, our doors are open. Uh, we want to learn from you. We want to work with you. So we want to learn more about zoonotic diseases themselves, uh, how they occur, the risk factor studies, the transmission dynamics, how we can be sampled. We want to see how we can get human samples, environmental samples, and also blood from animals if possible. I'm not sure how that works out. So we can set up integrated real-time molecular surveillance, as Dr. Sindura has been saying. We can also have a coordinated outbreak response and management system if we work together. It's just that people have been traditionally used to working in silos and working in sectors that actually have to break the chain. We can also have a shared database of uh, you know, detailed demographic details, clinical examination features of people, of animals, of ticks, insects, all put together so that the database is common for researchers. It's common for people who look for diseases and for you know, newer diagnostics and vaccine. Next. So uh, eventually, One Health involves everybody. It involves all kinds of people, agriculture workers, pet owners even epidemiologists, lab workers, ecologists, policymakers, and scientists. The last word in One Health is that we are one, and the health of the human and also the planet is one. Next. Thank you. Uh, I'm leaving out my number and my details for you to contact. As I said, I would like to reiterate ICMR is championing the cause of One Health in a big way, and we want to learn and work with you in a big way, too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manu, for informing about the current and ongoing work in the field of zoonotic disease surveillance and prevention, and also for enlightening on the potential areas of collaboration. So before we move on to the experience sharing by zoos, I would just request all the, uh, the audience members to please keep their phones on silent mode as you know, mark of respect for the speaker. And I would also request them to please adhere to the time limits because we're really running short of time. Sorry for that, but I mean, that's how it is. So now moving on to the second session for the zoo experience, we I now invite Ms. Vati Sungla Amar, who is from the Nagaland Zoological Park, to share the zoo, Nagaland Zoological Park's experience on the zoo. Respected uh, officials from CZA, uh, directors and participants from various uh, zoos, a very good morning to you all. Uh, I'm representing Nagaland Zoological Park on behalf of our director, uh, Dr. Zupeni IFS, who is away for her mid-career training. To begin with, uh, let me just give a brief introduction about Nagaland Zoological Park. The Nagaland Zoological Park is the only zoo in Nagaland with an area of 176 hectare uh, located in Timapur and it was officially inaugurated on the 28th of August 2008 and it is recognized as a medium zoo by the Central Zoo Authority of India. The Zoological Park has formulated uh, the objective in tune with the policy of the department and with the requirements of the people of the state to make it as the center of ex situ conservation program for the fauna of Northeast and Nagaland in particular, to initiate captive breeding of endangered species endemic to the region, uh, to make the zoo as an institute for awareness on wildlife conservation, for scientific studies, for recreational and educative purpose to the people of the state. Next slide. The zoo has a collection of 44 species with a total population of 356. Next slide. Uh, these are some of the civic facilities that we provide to, the, to our visitors.
Uh, these are some of the activities uh, that are undertaken throughout the year in our zoo. Uh, some of them are the an animal rescues that is rescued from different parts from the different parts of the state, uh, keepers training and outreach program, health monitoring by zoo veterinarians, and the security patrolling by staffs around the zoo. Nagaland Zoological Park, as of now, is undertaking conservation breeding of two species. One of them is the uh, Asian brown tortoise, which is an endangered species and the only uh, genus with a mount nester that shows parental care. It has a long history of overexploitation and lack of awareness, which have led to unsustainable rates of consumption by the local tribal communities. And because of its rapidly shrinking population and with no specific studies, this species this species makes it a high conservation priority. And so the, uh, the Nagaland Zoological Park is working in collaboration with the Turtle Survival Alliance India and has successfully established an assurance colony. At present, we have 12 founder adults uh, along with 72 hatchlings and juveniles with proper upkeep and necessary uh, husbandry interventions. Their diet includes uh, some leafy vegetables, fruits, and flowers in the hatchlings and to maintain humidity. And to maintain the humidity, uh, we keep the enclosures uh, sprinkled with water twice a day, and that results in the decaying mulch resembling that of a forest floor topped with some dry leaf leaders. And the hatchlings are soaked in uh, lukewarm water every 15 days. Uh, fortnightly, weight measurements are also taken to keep a track of their growth. Plants are planted inside the enclosures in order to facilitate shade for nesting requirements. Uh, this is the artificial incubation that we do in our zoo, and we usually use a styrofoam box uh, that is filled with vermiculite as the incubation media with an upper layer of nesting leaf litter and misting is done in uh, every alternate days. The clutch size uh, varies from 30 to 60 eggs, and it normally takes 60 to 90, eggs, uh, 90 days for the eggs to hatch. At present, we have 104 hatchlings that are successfully surviving from 2018 to 2022 batch, and that makes it the largest captive population in India. We have also identified some potential release sites in one of the districts of Nagaland, that is the Woka district. That is, a survey was conducted and based on habitat characteristics and through revealing of indirect presence of Asian giant tortoise, a 135 hectare patch of forest around the Bhakti village, that is in one of the districts, that is Woka, was selected. And the other was around the Lishiomo hill, which means Manuria Hill in English. Uh, these two sites were selected and there were presence of preferred dietary elements of Manuria as well. And a conservation agreement was signed between these villages last year on September. Outcome still date shows a significant increase in the overall weight that was recorded from January to June 2022 in the cohorts of 2018 and 19. Eggs were being artificially incubated even this year in 2022 and were hatched successfully. Over 100 uh, local people in the particular district called Woka was sensitized over this matter. For the pilot release, we are planning to come up with a stakeholders meeting that is with the administrations and with the villagers to raise a community support. For soft release, enclosures will be provided with a 5,000 square feet bamboo fence uh, enclosure. And then health assessment will be done before the release. Uh, before, after the release, tracking will be done weekly for 24 months by the local volunteers to collect data on their survival and dispersal. The project intends to uh, release 10 captive bred individuals 
tech with transmitters and BID techs on a pilot basis with the help of some experts. We are also working on conservation breeding of uh, Blitz Trakovan, a brilliantly co co colored pheasant. Despite being the state bird of Nagaland, uh, their population is uh, still dwindling and is estimated to be even less than 1,000 due to overexploitation. So in order to replenish and strengthen the wild population via a conservation breeding, the Blitz Dragoban Conservation and Breeding Center was set up in 2012 at Kohima. The main objective of uh, this breeding center is ex situ conservation of Blitz Dragoban with the uh, possibility of introducing it back to its wild uh, and then to do a research on its uh, behavior, habitat and breeding bi uh, biology in captivity. Uh, the breeding center consists of three of exhibits uh, with night sheds and uh, enclosures are given enrichments by wooden birches placed at variable heights and this disinfections are also being done every uh, three months with disinfectants and treatment of so soil inside the enclosure with lime. Their diet uh, consists of greens, vegetables, sprouts, fruits and small quantities of hard boiled eggs are also offered to the birds. Nesting platforms are also being made by the second week of February every year with the nesting material made from bamboo baskets uh, collected with uh, dry leaves, ferns and dried moss. And these are collected from the natural habitat, which is located at Konoma. The nesting and laying of eggs occurs during the month of March and April, and the clutch size is usually just two to four eggs, and the incubation period lasts for 28 to 30 days. And these uh, chicks, they reach the age of fertility only after two years. And uh, with the technical inputs from the experts from CZA, the Plight Raguban Conservation Breeding Center has been successful in hatching these birds for the past three years as compared to other years. So to conclude with, uh, I would like to cite that the conservation breeding of Plight Raguban is still at a nascent stage and will uh, require lots of improvement, both in expansion of the aviary as well as strengthening the infrastructure for management of the breeding center there is a need to train and orient our staff as well for the conservation breeding techniques and physiotherapy management through capacity building program. More awareness has to be conducted for the stakeholders so as to work towards protection of the species. We need to survey and identify sites for soft release and design an enclosure for soft release as well. So for successful release and implementation of the program, it needs we aim to do assessment of the outcomes along with continued management and monitoring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Fati Sundar, for the presentation on the zoo and the practices that are being followed there. I now invite Dr. Utkar Shukla, Deputy Director, Nawab Wajid Ali Shah Zoological Garden, Uttar Pradesh, to present to us on the zoo experience on this. Very good morning, everybody here. Before I go through the, my small presentation, I want to say something a little bit more. First of all, presentation is very small. It is very small. So, when I came here, there were also some people who were saying something to say here, तो मैंने सोचा कि आपसे वो भी शेयर कर लूं तो दो बॉडीज होती हैं सर कि फर्स्ट इज द 
एजुकेटिव बॉडी होती है पहली जो और दूसरी होती है जो प्लानिंग प्लान करती है तो दोनों के बीच में जो डिफरेंस है वो मुझे लगता है कि कहीं कहीं गड़बड़ करता है वो जो आप सोच रहे हैं वो हम कर नहीं पाते हैं और जो हम करना चाहते हैं वो आप शायद सोच नहीं पाते हैं ये थोड़ा सा मुझे लगता है कि कहीं हम लोगों के बीच में तो इतनी कहानी सुनाने का मेरा आशय था कि मैं दो लाइन सुनाना चाह रहा हूं कि हमें खतरे का अंदाजा है लेकिन हमारे घर में दरवाजा नहीं हमें खतरे का अंदाजा है लेकिन हमारे घर में दरवाजा नहीं और तुम्हारे घर में दरवाजा है लेकिन तुम्हें खतरे का अंदाजा नहीं तो अगर हमारे घर में दरवाजा हो जाए और आप लोगों को सबको खतरे का अंदाजा हो जाए तो मेरे ख्याल में कि जू में लोग मुझसे कहते हैं कई बार कि इमोशनली नहीं जुड़ के काम करना चाहिए लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि जो बात इमोशनली स्टार्ट होती है वही कर सकते हैं अगर हम अपने परिवार से अपने घर वालों से अपने दोस्तों से अगर इमोशनली नहीं जुड़े हैं तो हम उनके लिए क्या कर सकते हैं तो कई बार मुझे इसको टोका जाता है कि तुम इमोशनली काम करने की कोशिश करते हो या काम करते हो तो मुझे लगता है सबसे पहले आप इसीलिए आपने जो एक पोयम बाहर लिखी देखी होगी पोस्टर में बनाई है तो कभी किसी टाइम पे वो लिखी गई थी तो मुझे लगता है कि सबसे पहले जो एनिमल्स हैं जो हम लोग काम कर रहे हैं जिनके साथ में जब तक हम ये नहीं सोचेंगे कि एक लपट क्या सोच रहा है या उसके मन में क्या चल रही है उसको सोफा नहीं चाहिए उसको बेड नहीं चाहिए उसको सीमेंटेड या फ्लोरिंग टाइल्स की नहीं चाहिए उसको वो चाहिए जो उसको मांगता है और जब आप जब उसके बारे में आप समझेंगे जानेंगे पढ़ेंगे और उसको ज्यादा से ज्यादा समझने की कोशिश करेंगे तभी आप जो है क्योंकि आज हम इस डायस पे यहाँ खड़े हैं और आप लोग यहाँ बैठे हुए हैं हम लोग इतनी दूर से आए हैं सिर्फ इसलिए आए हैं कि हम लोग एनिमल के साथ काम कर रहे हैं हम लोगों में ऐसी कोई क्वालिटी कोई खास बात नहीं कि हम यहाँ पर आए और यहाँ पर खड़े होके आपस में बात करें क्योंकि हमारे पीछे जो कम्युनिटी है वो हजारों एनिमल्स की खड़ी हुई है इसलिए हम लोगों की इस देश में इज्जत है हम लोगों को काम को सहारा जा सहारा कम्प्रिशिएट किया जाता है अगर ये लोग ना हो तो शायद हम लोग ना हो मेरा हमेशा ये कहना है कि आप इमोशनली क्योंकि जब भी मैं किसी चिड़िया को किसी बर्ड को किसी एनिमल को बैठ के देखता हूँ और वो सलाखों के पीछे या मोट के पीछे बैठी है और उसको अगले 20 या 30 साल तक वहीं पर रहना है तो आप सोचिए उसके लिए बहुत बड़ी आप सारी सुविधाएं भी दे दीजिए आपको इसी होटल में अगर रख दिया जाए कि आप 40 साल तक इस होटल में ही रहेंगे तो मेरे ख्याल में आप पाँच साल दो साल बाद बीमार पड़ जाएंगे जबकि यहाँ पर सारी सुविधाएँ आपको बहुत अच्छी मिल रही हैं लेकिन आपको ये कहा जाएगा इस पर मिस्टर से आप बाहर नहीं जा सकते हैं आप यहीं रहेंगे तो मुझे लगता है कि प्रेजेंटेशन तो जरूरी है मैं अभी अभी बता भी दूंगा कि हम हमारे जू का क्या सिनेरियो है हम कहाँ पर काम कर रहे हैं लेकिन मैं चाहता हूं कि इस मंच पे अगर मुझे ये सौभाग्य मिला है ये मौका मिला है तो अपने जो बात है वो मैं पहुँचाना चाहता हूँ कि सबसे पहले जो भी एनिमल है या जो भी चीज है उससे आप इमोशनली अगर जुड़ जाएंगे कहीं तो ये सोच लीजिए कि आपको मंदिर मस्जिद और गुरुद्वारे जाने की जरूरत नहीं कहीं पर भी आप अगर वहां पर थोड़ी देर भी आराधना कर लें अगर आप अगर डायरेक्टर जो है हमको हमको डायरेक्टर्स जो हैं वो वाइल्ड लाइफ एक्सपर्ट नहीं चाहिए हमें वाइल्ड लाइफ मैनेजर्स चाहिए जो संभाव से सब चीजें देखें सबको वो बढ़ई को भी देखें वो बिजली मिस्त्री को भी देखें वो पानी वाले को भी देखें वो कीपर्स को भी देखें वो सिक्योरिटी को भी देखें वो वेटनेरियन को भी देखें वाइल्ड लाइफ एक्सपर्ट की जरूरत नहीं कि आप बहुत बड़े पीएचडी हैं किसी उसमें ऐसी जरूरत नहीं है हमें मैनेजर चाहिए सिर्फ मैनेजर अच्छा होगा तो मेरे ख्याल जू चलेगा बहुत बढ़िया चलेगा और मैनेजर जब अच्छा होगा जब वो कहीं कनेक्ट करेगा एनिमल से कहीं ना कहीं कभी भी आप देखिए कि जो एनिमल हैं किसी भी तरीके के उनकी आंखों में आप अगर यहां से जाएं 
और मेरी बात अगर मैं 28 साल से काम कर रहा हूँ अट्ठाईस तीस साल मुझे हो गए एक ही जगह पे काम करते हुए और आप कहीं बैठ के हो सकता है आपको इमोशनली ये बातें लगे कुछ लोगों को और बैठ के सिर्फ किसी की एनिमल की आंखों में थोड़ी देर आप एक दो मिनट देखिएगा तो आपको सब समझ में आ जाएगा सिर्फ उसके जो पीपल है और रेटिना है उसको आराम से ध्यान से देखिएगा तो समझ में आएगा इसने मुझे दस ही मिनट का टाइम दिया इसने ज्यादा नहीं बोलोगे तुम जारी भागती हुई तो इसने मुझे कहा है लेकिन फिर भी मैं सोच रहा हूं कि जो जालियां होती हैं जो जाली पूरा पुराने में जाली लगी रहती है और सलाखें लगी रहती हैं तो वहां पर होता क्या है कि वो जब भी कोई लेपर्ड को देखता हूं तो पता नहीं वो आसमान की तरफ क्या बेचारा सोच रहा हो शायद खाने का इंतजार कर रहा होता है या कुछ और देख रहा होता है मुझे समझ में नहीं आता बहुत जानने की कोशिश करता हूँ कि सोच क्या रहा होगा इसके मन में क्या चल रहा है तो सामने सलाखे हैं या जाली है या मोटेड है लेकिन कुछ ना कुछ ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन है उसके सामने उसको देखता रहता है और जब भी देखता हूं तो एक बहुत बड़े शायर हैं आपको कोई फिर शायरी सुनाने लगा लेकिन अब सुनी लीजिए जब दिमाग में आ गई कि हमारा नाम भी बारा दरी पर नक्श करना बारा दरी होती जिसके बारह दरवाजे होते हैं और बारह दरवाजे इसलिए करे जाते हैं कि छह हमारी ज्ञान इंद्रियां होती हैं और छह ज्ञान इंद्रियों को अगर डबल कर दिया जाता मतलब वेंटिलेशन भी होना चाहिए आने और जाने का भी रास्ता होना चाहिए इसलिए हर हमेशा बारादरी में बारह दरवाजे बनाए जाते हैं तो छह आने के होते हैं ज्ञान के और छह बाहर भी उसका बाहर भी इनपुट भी होना चाहिए और आउटपुट भी होना चाहिए तो जो एक हमारा लायन या लेपर्ड या टाइगर सोचता है कि हमारा नाम भी बारादरी पर नक्श करना ये जो जालियां लगी हैं हमारा नाम भी बारादरी पर नक्श करना ये सारी जालियां हमने निगाहों से बुनी है और सारी जिंदगी उन दस साल पंद्रह साल तक वो बेचारा उन्हीं जालियों को देखता रहता है और हम लोग यहाँ पर बैठ के उस पर यहाँ पर साइंटिफिक पेपर लिखते हैं अभी जोनोसिस की इतनी भयानक बात हुई कि हमारे कई कॉलेज जो थे वो अपनी हार्ट बीट चेक कर रहे थे और कुछ देखने लगे कि मुझे फीवर तो नहीं हो गया हेड तो नहीं हो गया उनको इतनी अंदर से होने लगी कि जोनोटिक इतनी ज़्यादा उन्होंने यहाँ पर डिस्क्राइब करी तो डरने की बात नहीं है अगर आप थोड़ा भी प्रिकॉशन रखें और उसके बारे में जानते हैं मैं टॉपिक पे आ रहा हूँ नवा वजीद अली शाह लखनऊ जोलॉजिकल गार्डन नेक्स्ट इट इज सिचुएटेड इन द हार्ट ऑफ द सिटी एंड इज कंप्राइज ऑफ ट्वेंटी नाइन हेक्टेयर इट इज एग्जीक्यूटेड बाय द जू एडवाइजरी कमेटी एंड मैनेजमेंट ऑन बोर्ड इज जू इज ऑल्सो ए मेंबर ऑफ द स्टेट लेवल हेल्थ एडवाइजरी कमेटी नेक्स्ट objective infotainment of the visitor conservation and breeding of the rare and endangered species particular the swamp deer we have around 100 of swamp deer in our zoo scientific study and the research of the animals recruiting and the wild animals and the keeping them the temporary in the zoo we are also uh, a big thing to for the rescuing the animal like tiger leopard next Total number of enclosure in our zoo is moated about uh, 52 moated enclosure, 38 uh, about uh, close, and uh, open enclosure is about uh, 42. Total enclosure number is 152. We have the uh, also the nocturnal house, and a, a, a good animal hospital, kitchen store, administrative block, but we have the beautiful uh, butterfly plaque, souvenir shop, nature interpretation center, 3D hall. and historical baradari next we also having the toy train for the children's with the beautiful platform paddle board canteen food court children park fountain parking this is the uh, we are total number of species 88 and total number of uh, animal is one, uh, around 1000 we also online ticketing for the visitors next in the year 1927 national uh, we are uh, collaborated with the national Bot uh, botanical uh, botanical uh, research institute and they have uh, identified the 95 species more than the 5000 uh, uh, plant in our zoo along with the routine activity the zoo we also having the conducted rescue operation of the wild uh, i al already mentioned big cats and it is resolve the many animal conflict at present we are having 11 tiger 11 tiger 
11 uh, rescued tiger and 13 rescued uh, leopard in our zoo. This is a big problem for our zoo because uh, we are very limited space uh, in our hospital and this quarantine unit. Next. These are recently received four cubs from the Pilibhit Malar range. Next. We are also having the parking, pram, wheelchair, locker facilities, ROV, uh, water, uh, drinking water for the visitor, visitor shed, guide map, online ticketing, toilets, canteen, mobile lab, augmented reality, virtual reality, mobile lab, audio tour. Next. Veterinary facilities, we are having the X-ray unit, one mobile and one the fixed. One mobile ultrasound unit, surgical room, isolation ward, quarantine wards, incinerators, pathology lab, ambulance and rescue van. And next, total number of species is, we are having very less species, 88 species, 89 species total and uh, more than the 1000 animal in our zoo. Main animal is lion, tiger, white tiger, leopard, leopard cat, fishing cat, jungle cat, fox. We are having only one serval cat and one caracal. We are looking for the uh, pairing of this, uh, these animals. Primates, lion tail macaque, chimpanzee, bonnet monkey, macaque, stump tail, langur. We are also having uh, a lone uh, female chimpanzee in our zoo. Next. Like other zoo, we are also having the swam deer, black buck, chinkara, hog deer, spotted deer, barking deer, giraffe, we have only female giraffe in our zoo. Zebra, we are recently received five zebra from the Israel, hippopotamus, ostrich, emu, Indian, giant squirrel, nocturnal louse. We are having different type of uh, owls. Birds, we are having different type of birds and uh, Basically, are we are breeding, well breeding in this uh, blue and yellow macaw. We had uh, more than 20 blue and yellow macaws. Reptile, gadial, crocodile and different type of turtle and snakes. We are having aquarium. We have two, uh, two uh, floor aquarium, Indian uh, exotic fishes for th next. We are the unique braille gallery for the challenge uh, children's and for the they, we gave the total information about the animal for them we are to, to, total 42 braille uh, signages in this gallery thank you Thank you, Dr. Shukla, for your words of wisdom as well as for the overview of your Lucknow Zoo. Uh, we take a slight deviation from our sessions today and we go back to the talk that was scheduled for your, the session one, which was on the vision plan. And we have with us uh, Ms. Kalpana, who is, who is the director of the Mahindra Chaudhary Zoological Park, Punjab, who will speak to us more on the vision plan objectives and the efforts that have been done by the zoo there. Good afternoon to our uh, seniors and our colleagues. And uh, I would just quickly run through because of time constraint and uh, I would not go too much into details. We try to align our uh, ongoing projects with the vision and uh, we'll just let you know if any unique or innovative things have been done in Chatweed Zoo that will be helpful uh, for other zoos also. So I'll quickly run through. On, uh, the, I'm linking the Chatweed Zoo's uh, established in 1977. It's one of the large category zoos. And uh, one of the uh, prime or uh, you know good appreciation we get in our zoos because of the standard protocols that are followed, cleanliness, and uh, the area is uh, located in uh, a protected forest. So the greenery is uh, very good and lush green. And apart from that, uh, we are a member of uh, Waza, and uh, we are also the member of uh, Species 360. And we have this. Uh, uh, we take feedback continuously from the visitors and we have kept a system wherein every visitor who visits our zoo gives us uh, Google ratings also and we review it personally and if anything negative comes we'll try to address it and uh, as of now 4.3% is our uh, rating. 
And uh, with respect to, next slide, please. So I'll just link it and quickly run through each pillar and what how we are doing it in our zoo. Uh, regarding pillar one, strengthening of ex situ conservation of endangered species, I'll just say that captive breeding is good in certain species like goral, uh, black pathogen, gadial. And we have done successful breeding of tigers in 2019 to uh, tiger cubs. It was a successful breeding program. And after that, we're still trying to mate uh, 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 the uh, pairing is done right now and we are still in the process and uh, we are waiting for uh, successful breeding of uh, uh, tigers uh, since we are uh, participating zoo in it. And uh, this is our, uh, next slide please, this is our artificial incubation and we do uh, 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 breeding of uh, some species like uh, red jungle fowl, golden pheasant, carnage pheasant and uh, chakut patridge etc. And uh, next slide please. I'll run through this, uh, how a zoo played an important role in serving as a linkage between in-situ conservation and uh, ex-situ conservation. This is a unique case wherein uh, in the Punjab, uh, Bias, uh, Indus River system in 1960s, there was, uh, uh, you know, reported, uh, last Gadial was reported. So the keystone species of the Indus River system got uh, extinct because of local issues like fishing and hunting, etc. So uh, Punjab government decided since 2014, uh, this issue has been uh, decided in depth and uh, the Punjab State Wildlife Board decided that why not we introduce reintroduce, uh, reintroduce Gadial in that uh, system. And a lot of work was done and Chhatabir Zoo played a huge role uh, right from the capacity building and getting trained in the Morena uh, MP uh, breeding center, bringing in hatchlings, doing the soft release in Chhatabir and uh, releasing them back in the wild and in a new area. So field study also in the BIA system, uh, Chathweed staff are involved. So this has been going in, uh, uh, going for uh, you know, a few years and uh, till 2021, uh, successful uh, 98 Gadials have been uh, reintroduced in uh, uh, BIA system. And uh, I've served uh, in the border for two years, which is very close to the Indus River system. I've been DFO Ferozpu Wildlife also, and uh, I've seen very closely how Chathweed Zoo played a role in uh, uh, re, uh, reintroducing them in the river and after that the monitoring is done by the respective wildlife DFOs and uh, WWF India. So this is one of the successful stories and uh, Punjab takes uh, great pride because it's not easy to reintroduce after so many years uh, in a unique system. It is also unique for uh, uh, Indus River Dolphin as you all know. And uh, uh, I'll quickly run through the first pillar. Uh, uh, Strengthening it in situ and ex situ conservation, I've just covered it with Kadial. Otherwise, also, we are uh, uh, coordinating zoo and we've been conservation breeding program for falcons. We have been uh, selected by CZD. One of the, uh, it had a lot of gaps, and right now we are again trying to kickstart it and by doing field survey. And our new chief well award is interested to uh, take, uh, uh, put more focus in, uh, into it. And we are still in the nascent stage and uh, we'll be initiating. And we're hopeful by 2022, 23, 24, we'll be able to at least bring in a wild uh, data regarding the falcons that are there in Punjab. The study is more important just to identify what are the wild populations. So uh, we are, uh, we have started the process. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, to optimize animal welfare to achieve parity in current, uh, with current global practices. So this we are linking it to uh, the major infrastructure works that we are doing, which is closely connected to this pillar too. Next slide, please. Uh, recently, there is uh, uh, just uh, we inaugurated uh, the facilities which were created in Chhatpur Zoo. I'm just trying to show that we have uh, built a critical care unit wherein, uh, uh, as you all know, Punjab has a extreme summer and winter, so it becomes very uh, important that if some vulnerable animals are there, it has to be treated. It has to be treated under all weather conditions. So we created a quarantine critical care center for the uh, tiger, uh, lion, and also in the hospital. So, uh, in Wildlife Hospital. Then uh, one more uh, important thing was a service circulation pathway, which was around three, three kilometers. That was also uh, uh, established in Chatbir Zoo recently. And metal barriers uh, for the visitor interface with the uh, enclosures, that was uh, done for the first time with uh, the stainless steel. And this was also appreciated by many uh, experts who had visited our zoo. And we had renovated our feed kitchen. Uh, next slide, please. As you all know, we try every every zoo does it in their best way, and we are also trying to use as many local materials which are biodegradable as possible in every uh, season-wise and species-wise. So this is a summer care arrangement and uh, winter care arrangements. Next slide, please. So as you call, uh, can see, species-wise, we do different uh, enrichments here, and we go as per our enrichment plan. We have a, a study which was done by Caesar Day 
I think uh, four five years back, in which we have a enrichment uh, research which was done, and we try to abide by it, and we are trying to improve uh, with our experiences also. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are the pro these are the uh, um, targets that we have fixed for ourselves, taking from the vision plan document, and we'll try to move towards it. So I would not like to waste uh, the time on this. Next slide, please. And this is uh, rescued animals. Uh, since Chatbir Zoo is ma ma uh, made as a center uh, where, wherein people from uh, different parts of Punjab, Chandigarh, and Haryana contact us because of the expertise that we have. So we have uh, played a huge role in uh, rescuing, uh, you know, when, wherever animal, uh, human uh, animal conflict is there, we have tried to uh, save as much as animals and we try a level best. 99% uh, of our effort is to release it back to the wild. So we give our uh, capturing expertise treatment, but we try a level best to release it back. That is our uh, focus because we don't want to uh, take uh, the burden of uh, maintaining the rescued animals when they are okay to be released in the wild. But we, uh, we have a rapid response team which immediately uh, responds to any uh, emergency situations. Next slide, please. Uh, we've proposed uh, based on the tar target, we, are, uh, we will be proposing an infrastructure development scheme to uh, go for uh, construction of a new uh, rescue center also. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the fourth pillar, which is basi uh, basically related to the research uh, that is carried out. So these are the list of the research, uh, 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 research projects which have happened in uh, the zoo, uh, zoo from the different, different uh, universities all over India. So we do uh, take the findings from that and try to implement as much as possible and we try to get it uh, till the level of the zookeeper that they have to understand it in the most simplest way, uh, simplest, uh, simplistic way. That is any technical thing, uh, we have to make it a point that till the level of zookeepers are able to understand it. So the team works uh, specifically for that if any good findings can be implemented immediately in the zoo. Uh, uh, these are technologies. Uh, this is a uh, next slide, please. This is a zoo app wherein uh, visitors can download it and they will get general information about zoo. We are right now working on uh, uh, visitors and animal enclosure interface. Once it is launched, we will definitely share the information. Uh, we are still in that process, and a few articles are also published in uh, different publications. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding fostering linkages between uh, zoos and societies, uh, we have our student zoo clubs which are very active and uh, expert talks and online webinars have increased uh, after Corona. We have, uh, it is a blessing in disguise that a lot of online interactions are uh, happening in between uh, universities and uh, Chathweed Zoo and also with uh, school children and uh, workshops are also carried out. We have uh, recently carried out a, a cyclothon which was a, a success event all over Punjab during uh, our Ramrit Mahotsav event and a lot of participation was there uh, for Gadial reintroduction wherein people are People who are not aware of Gadial reintroduction, they were uh, doing uh, cycling and they spread awareness among the public and it was a, a proud moment for Zoo also. And uh, uh, there's a small part of uh, an interpretation center which has been built by Punjab Tourism uh, Promotion Board. Uh, we tried to revive it, it's, it was lying uh, empty for two uh, years, so we just established a small uh, hall wherein we made it very interactive, uh, uh, displays had been made, wherein we introduced, uh, next slide please, I'll just show the pictures. Uh, we brought, uh, uh, for the chil for, uh, to make it interesting for the children, we made it a point that we'll cover major important topics in a sh uh, short span of time. We introduced displays and uh, interactive uh, 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 information boards wherein uh, it was appreciated by the minister also recently because uh, we didn't go for any boring uh, displays of just information. So this was uh, hugely appreciated recently. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is awareness activities which we regularly uh, carry on, and uh, this is our strength. And this is uh, the this is this is where you get your advertisement also. So I think this is where all zoos should focus uh, to promote more awareness. And next slide, please. Uh, uh, as you're all aware, Chatwid is famous for its walk-in aviary. Uh, we have different themes, the rock and duck theme, Japanese theme, and uh, uh, the, uh, the exotic birds theme. Right now, you're trying to expand it and uh, attach uh, new themes like Amazon theme, Australian theme, wherein you get a, a excellent uh, experience that you are inside the dome structure of uh, the birds. And uh, this is one of the uh, structures and uh, designs which has been appreciated all over India. 
because we have field visits from others who, who try to uh, imbibe the same. And recently, Chandigarh Bird Park also uh, uh, took our uh, design and uh, took inspiration from it and uh, made a successful uh, you know, exhibit of uh, exotic birds. Uh, next slide, please. This is a dinosaur park, uh, which is an ed education park uh, of Mesozoic era, how uh, wildlife was there and everything. We give information at the same time, it has robotic models wherein children enjoy a lot. But one thing that I would tell all zoos is this is one of the unique uh, uh, mode in which we brought in a facility inside Chudbir Zoo by PPP mode. We didn't have to invest anything, we took the permission of the government. And what we did is uh, the uh, private party, we tendered it and they established uh, the facility and we increased the ticket price and uh, Jitna, we have put a percentage that they'll be taking it and they'll be operating it. So these are, this is one unique mode wherein we did not invest and lose any money, but at the same time we are generating revenue and it's one of the unique things. So public private partnership was explored for the first time in Chatwir Zoo. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, something which is uh, ongoing and uh, we try to eat in there and we use a gym procurement uh, and uh, uh, we are planning uh, to increase our uh, digitization in the zoo in the coming years in all the animal management and also in construction wing and other areas wherein we require to purchase and maintain records also. Next slide please. Uh, build financially sustainable business models, uh, prioritizing fiscal autonomy. We can link it with different things. Key, uh, uh, where do we have the expenditure, which is a recurring expenditure? How do we generate revenue? So most of the facilities are uh, uh, tendered and we uh, take rent for the facilities. We have canteens, food courts, and uh, we have our battery operated uh, vehicles. And apart from that, uh, we also have uh, for finance uh, animal adoption schemes. And we are still lacking uh, behind in uh, CSR. It is, uh, we have to promote it as much as possible and focus on industrial areas, wherein we uh, in that way, uh, this is an area which we have to focus and we find that it's our weakness. We'll be uh, going forward with it in the future. And uh, apart from that, uh, uh, in of uh, energy, uh, energy saving is also somehow linked with your uh, fiscal autonomy. You do need not expend more in future. So we have a solar power projects also, uh, where uh, we do the cost cutting of energy uh, uh, costs that we have. Next slide, please. Uh, develop skill motivated and empower teams. Uh, this is uh, where we have to have a planned uh, way of uh, training our zookeepers, training our doctors. And we find every opportunity that we find, wherever in India we could send our staff to get trained, we do that and we give support to our staff as much as possible. But apart from that, uh, a unique thing was done by Punjab Zoo Development Society, wherein uh, we made our zookeeper the hero. Uh, uh, next slide, please. This is a small example of a zookeeper. Uh, he was, he's, no, uh, he's no more now. He expired in, when he was 45 years old. He's famous all over Punjab, beat any animal, beat bird, beat... Uh, Lion, tiger, beat python. He was someone who handled with so much care, and he's emotionally attached to every animal, and he can handle anything. He was considered to be the god of handling animals. Suddenly, he expired uh, at the age of 45. So, to uh, make him, uh, that is, make his uh, name permanent in Shadbi Zoo, we made it a point that through Punjab Zoo Development Society, we got it approved from the society, and the state government has uh, uh, approved this award. His name is Mr. Uh, Apurva Dekha, and we made the Apurva Dekha Award, and this will basically given at the and uh, to recognize the works done by zookeepers. So, this was a moment of pride wherein. Our staff are very proud that zookeepers are recognized and there is an award in a zookeeper's name. So this is one of the areas where you can motivate your staff also. Thank you. Uh, uh, prioritizing infrastructure upgradation, uh, this zoo wall which is uh, uh, very old. We uh, uh, strengthened our wall and uh, it's still going on and 2021-22 uh, we did uh, major infrastructure work in that also and open air uh, zoo education plaza with that we are also building our first wildlife training uh, and research center and it has hostel facilities also phase one is complete and phase two is still going on and uh, next slide please next is the uh, green initiatives which which is there in most of the zoos we have our uh, battery operated uh, feed van battery operated vehicles and uh, vermicompost 
And next slide, please. Ongoing green initiatives. This is how our collaboration is there. We have collaborated with Punjab Energy Development Agency, and uh, we are developing a solar power plant of uh, 300 kilowatts. With that, also we are uh, uh, along with that, we have a major project which will be done in three phases. We have collaborated with Punjab uh, Department of uh, Sanitation, and uh, we are uh, reviving our uh, upgrade, reviving and upgrading our sewerage network, and we are bringing in STPs also. Next slide, please. So this is our uh, projected uh, uh, plan, and uh, we would uh, try to source it from each and every scheme as possible, like Kampa and state funds and Punjab Development Society, including CZD also. Thank you for giving the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Kalpana, for giving an overview of the vision plan objectives that are being uh, taken up in your zoo. So now we move on to the session four, which is on in situ and ex situ linkages. So as you all know that in situ and ex situ conservation focuses on the maintenance of species diversity within or away from their habitats. So integration of these two methods is of important to consider, you know, conservation directed science. And to speak more on this, we have with us Dr. Uma Ramakrishnan, who is a professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore, and she will speak more on the integration of both these conservation methods. Oh gosh, hi. Hi everyone, I'm Uma and uh, <clears throat> thanks for inviting me. Uh, really excited to present some of our work and ideas to all of you. So um, I basically work on tigers. Uh, you've probably heard a lot about tigers and hopefully you saw uh, some yesterday when you visited the zoo. Next slide, please. Uh, the several big questions, starting out with big questions. I'm a scientist, I should uh, say that right up front. I'm not a manager. And there's many questions which remain uh, about tigers. We've already seen extinctions of South China tigers, uh, of uh, the Caspian tigers, of Javan and um, other tigers as well. So I guess the questions that remain for us is, will tigers go extinct in India? Why and where? And can we actually do anything about this? Uh, it's a hard question. Uh, maybe we don't want to express it, but it is something which is on all of our minds. So as a scientist, the first thing you will ask then is, what is extinction? Why does extinction happen, right? So extinction happens, of course, because of small population size. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of literature over the years which has shown us that uh, there are threshold population sizes when the number of animals is above, say, 100 or so, extinction probability drops substantially. So if we have viable populations in the wild where the numbers of individuals are higher, their chance of extinction are lower. Next slide, please. Um, at the same time, isolated populations have high chance of extinction, right? So again, something we know, uh, this is data from butterflies, and it basically shows that when there are a few isolated populations, chance of extinction are higher. Keep going. Uh, the third part of what drives extinction, something which I work very closely on, is genetics. And there's been data which show that populations with low genetic variation also have a high chance of extinction. But why is this? Genetic variation is low. So why does that cause extinction? So there's two main reasons for this. Uh, next. And one of them is basically when you have a small population size, genetic variation is low, and there tends to be inbreeding. And inbreeding is basically mating between relatives. That leads to inbreeding depression, and you're all very familiar with this. On the other hand, in small populations, you also have chance fluctuations. So you tend to lose genetic variation, just as you do in zoos. You tend to lose genetic variation because of processes like drift or stochasticity. Next slide. So uh, before I jump into uh, most of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, I'll take a quick uh, detour and tell you a little bit about some work we did uh, last year, where we looked at global variation uh, in tigers across the world. Keep going, you can just, because there's a lot of animation. So basically, we showed, uh, as expected, that um, there's these different subspecies group genetically. So there's a sampling map. Uh, and you can see that we, we haven't sampled tigers in Thailand, but we've sampled most other tigers across the world. And you see that uh, in this PCA, basically, which pulls apart genetically distinct populations, that you know the subspecies are 
independent, uh, you know, clusters. What's very interesting is that Indian tigers actually have substantial amount of genetic variation. What you see here is how much genetic variation different subspecies have. And you can see that Indian tigers have a disproportionate amount of variation. So not just does India have 75% of the world's tigers, we also have a substantial amount of the species genetic variation. But what also stood out is, uh, this is some index of inbreeding. You don't have to worry about the details that while Indian tigers have as a total high genetic variation, individuals are already showing signatures of being in bed. These are all wild individuals. Next slide, please. Can I just do that? I feel bad to keep asking you guys. It's OK. So uh, why does this matter? And why am I talking about it here at a meeting of zoo directors? Well, actually, a lot of the samples, which you can see in boxes uh, from Sumatran individuals, Amur and Malayan individuals were actually from zoos in the US. This is some work I did when I was on a sabbatical in the US. And basically, they are uh, descendants of like two generations wild caught individuals. So it's very difficult for us to access wild uh, genetic material from tigers in Sumatra. But on the other hand, because uh, proxies of these individuals exist in zoos, we're able to understand the genetic makeup of Sumatran tigers are more tigers and so on. Next slide, please. And a very uh, funny thing happened after that. Basically, um, a few years ago, a tiger cub was confiscated. Sorry, oh, great. I feel so bad asking this to do. Uh, this little cub was like two months old. Uh, there was a teenager driving across the US Mexico border, and he had it in the car with him. And the uh, authorities confiscated this cub. And they handed it over to San Diego Zoo because it couldn't survive on its own. It was so small. And the first question San Diego Zoo asked was, who is this cub? What is its ancestry? Because in the US zoo system, they only support Amur, Malayan, and uh, Sumatran tigers. They don't breed Bengal tigers, right? So they immediately thought of us because they knew we'd done this work looking at tiger genomes across the world and genetic ancestry. Um, yeah, you can keep, you can just click a few times. And basically what we found is if, so basically what we were able to do is we sequenced the genome of this cub in the US. It never crossed any uh, borders. And we found that, for example, you see that in this case, uh, Sumatran tigers are uh, basically this uh, orange ancestry. Uh, Malayan are this red ancestry. Bengal are these blue ancestry. And Amura, this green, and this cub was a complete mixture of all ancestries. So there's a lot of under the carpet, like under uh, illegal breeding, which is happening in places like the US of tigers, for example. And so this cub could not be incorporated into the zoo system. It was given up for adoption to a rescue center because it's not a pure ancestry individual. So this is an example of how what seems very much like academic research, what are these populations of tigers can actually very quickly be implemented in a case, for example, of trafficking. Next slide, please. So uh, overall, my work the last 15 or so years has been on tiger conservation genetics, among other things. Uh, and I've worked on, uh, in the past, on connectivity a lot in central India. And I'm not going to talk about that today. You can keep going. Uh, but I am going to talk about two studies very briefly. One is on isolated populations, and the other one uh, is on uh, inbreeding. Keep going. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, just very briefly, most of the time, like most wildlife biologists, we want to be out in the field, and we go to the field, we collect samples. Mostly it's scat, shed hair, saliva, and so on, non-invasive samples, bring them back to the lab, uh, and. Uh, mostly now we sequence genomes or look at many, many uh, markers. Next slide, please. So this was something which happened a few years ago, a completely serendipitous project that we got involved in, initiated by uh, uh, Dr. Swain and others from the NTCA and the Odisha Forest Department. This tiger was camera trapped in Simlipal, and it was very intriguing that it had this really beautiful uh, coat pattern. And I guess you saw an individual like this yesterday in the zoo. So the first question was, why does this tiger look like this? Is it a genetic mutation? What is it, right? And 
if we of course turn back to the literature, it turns out that people have worked on cats and they have found that this specific gene has mutations which make this cheetah, which is a regularly patterned, you know, cheetah, look like this. And this cat, which has, you know, regular stripes, look like this. So basically, this gene and mutations in it result in a disruption of pattern. Okay. So we immediately thought, okay, maybe that's the mutate, that's the gene which has a mutation which is causing this pseudomelanistic tiger or this black tiger to look the way it does. Next slide, please. But how do we actually figure that out? We need an individual who looks like that, and we need DNA from that individual, right? So again, we were very lucky. It so happened that in Nandan Kanan Zoo, there was a litter born which included pseudomelanistic individuals. And next slide, please. We were able to then get their DNA from blood, saliva, sequence their genomes, reconstruct a pedigree, just like we do in human genetic studies, where we study cancer or diabetes or whatever, we were able to reconstruct, uh, I mean, we could use the pedigree to look at what was the mutation, was there a mutation, and what was the mutation in this gene which results in this phenotype. And basically, we were able to find a point mutation, a single spelling mistake right, just one spelling mistake because of which this tiger now looks like this. And the statistical analysis from the pedigree suggested that this particular mutation was 300 times more likely to be the one which caused it than anything else. Next slide, please. But was that the mutation in Simlipal? That's something we had to figure out. So we went back to the field. So from the zoo to the lab and now back to the field where we collected samples, we identified which were from tiger, which, uh, how many individuals there were. And then because we were looking for a specific mutation, we were able to look at how many of them had this mutation in two copies, one copy, or none at all. Next slide. Sorry, trying to click, click, click. So basically what we found was, uh, sorry, this is uh, 2018, 2019, when we did the field work, we found, we identified a minimum number of 12 individuals. It's not a population estimate. We didn't do it in a framework, but just a minimum number based on genetic data. And amongst those, four of them were uh, had two copies of the allele. So what this says then is the frequency of this mutation, this spelling mistake in Simlipal is almost 60%. Next. And what was even more curious is when we looked at about 400 individuals outside Simlipal, right? So maybe we just missed it. Maybe it's always been there in many places, but it was in one copy. So we didn't see black tigers, but the allele is there, the mutation is there. What we found is it was absent, or I guess very rare everywhere except Simlipal. It is present uh, in some zoos, Ranchi Zoo, Nandan Kanan, and uh, uh, Chennai Zoo. But as for the wild, it seems to be absent. So why is it then that it is so high 60% in Simlipal, but kind of absent everywhere else. Next slide, please. So this is where we go back to ecology. And basically, when we compare Simlipal from a genetic perspective to other populations in the central Indian landscape, it stands out, suggesting it is genetically distinct. Why might it be genetically distinct? Because it is small, because it is isolated. That's why I harped on that in the beginning. Next. And we also looked at, though our, our samples are non-invasive, so they're not so good, but we are able to look at relatedness between individuals. And we find that on an average, individuals in Simlipal are almost like siblings to each other, okay? And this uh, is, for example, tigers from Central India and South India, overall relatedness is much lower. You can see Ranthambore is very high, in fact, higher than Simlipal. These are wild individuals. spectacular views, amazing photographs, and the greatest place to see tigers. But it actually so happens that uh, Ranthambore is also an isolated population. And what we did to investigate this is we sequenced whole genomes from across India, but specifically from wild tigers in Ranthambore. And what we found was the tigers in Ranthambore are twice as inbred as tigers anywhere else in India. That's pretty uh, amazing. 
we were also able to look at these genomes and identify spelling mistakes which potentially could be bad, right? We can do this because we know so much about humans and we know so much about mice and we know so much about the genetic makeup of other species, though we don't know as much about tigers. And what we found also with those analyses is that there's a signature for purging. That is, when you have very high inbreeding, a lot of bad mutations come together and the very, very, very bad ones will result in the animal just dying. It's a lethal, right? So those will be taken out, purged, cleared from the population. Next. Yet, there were many, many bad mutations which persisted. So even, these are predicted, right? These are our predictions that there still seem to be in Ranthambo tigers, bad mutations which are still around. Next. So this is just actually down to us, did an article about this and they had a nice illustration but this shows, for example, when you have inbreeding, you will have the sort of suboptimal uh, in terms of, so, so far we're just talking about it very generally, right? We're saying, oh, low genetic variation is bad, you should have more genetic, that's a very broad hand sweeping statement. But why is it bad? Because there's high genetic load or high amount of these bad alleles, bad mutations as well. But how do we know what will happen because of those? That's something which we don't yet know. This is just also showing how potentially genetic rescue or bringing in an individual with lower load, with better alleles could potentially infuse. When we say infuse genetic variation, what genetic variation? You want to infuse not the same bad alleles, but different alleles which are potentially good. Next slide, please. So basically, this is what, where we are now. That's work over the last four years or so, from five years or so. And what we want to do now is take this one step further and actually ask this hard question, how will, how will inbreeding actually happen in Ranthambore? I'm just saying to you, you know, they're inbred and all that, but what is happening? Ranthambore tigers are breeding, right? So how is this inbreeding depression going to take place? So the way I, I can find that out is if I know what those bad mutations do. Just as I did with the black tigers, I figured out that this spelling mistake results in the tiger looking like this. So I need to find out the effect of a specific bad mutation. So, so basically, there's two ways we would like to do this. One is more kind of academic, is to look at known bad alleles in humans and mice and so on, and to make predictions about what it might do. The other is critically dependent on all of you, is to basically use captive individuals as a proxy. Uh, next slide, please. So for example, uh, this is just to show you that uh, for the genomes we already have from Nandankan and tigers, there are several mistakes already in their genomes, right? So for example, here we have this particular protein is actually supposed to be you know, this long, but it's much, much shorter. So clearly, if something is supposed to be long, fold a specific way, do a specific thing, but it's actually not that, it's going to have some effect. So one way is, like I said, to make those predictions based on data we already have. Next slide, please. The other way is to actually look at individuals in captivity which have disease states or specific conditions, use their pedigrees to find the mutations which result in that state, right? So for example, we know quite well that there are specific phenotypes which occur in inbred tigers. For example, bull face, uh, strabismus, I always say that wrong, cross eyes, right? And by the way, there is already a cross-eyed individual in Ranthambo. Now I don't know whether it's got to do with inbreeding, what is the allele, I don't know all of that. But I'm just saying that in cats, eye conditions uh, tend to occur quite often with inbreeding. Next. There are also other things like cardiac defects, very common in cats, uh, cardiomyopathies, which cause heart attacks, uh, ulcers, uh, disc protrusion, deafness, etc. This is all, and there's some, there's one paper suggesting, uh, uh, you know, that there may be consequences to inbreeding and so on. This is also data from Nandan Kanan. So the idea would be to look for these disease states, look for, you know, 
uh, these things and see whether they correlate with inbreeding and then use genome sequencing and pedigree analysis to identify what are the mutations and then go back to the wild, go back and look whether those bad mutations are in high frequencies. So can I predict that I will see cross-eyed phenotype showing up in Ranthambore? Because why is that important? Because that means that inbreeding depression is really starting and that is when we need to think about a management intervention of rescue or something like that. Next. So of course, uh, for all of this, uh, it would be wonderful if we could work with you, we could collaborate uh, and do this together. So I think it's also important, so I'm, I'm just talking to you about I'm really using captive tigers for ultimately doing something uh, in the wild. But I think it's also important uh, even in the context of captive tigers alone. So this is the pedigree, uh, inferred pedigree of Nandan Kanan individuals. This is the individual potentially which uh, could have carried the pseudomelanistic allele. Uh, next. For example, if we looked at genomes of these captive tigers, we could think of understand what is the ancestry because there's so much of wild caught individuals mixing with pedigree individuals. There's a lot of uh, matings of different kinds going on. We can actually ask what is their ancestry? Are they quote unquote Central Indian, Southern Indian, and so on? Or how admixed are they? Uh, what is their inbreeding? Uh, and they're similar to wild populations. And we could actually rank individuals, come up with a tiger Aadhaar card. I don't, I know Aadhaar card is <laughs> invasion of privacy, but uh, just as a pun, I'm using it, where you could actually ask, you know, this information could be there for all individuals. And this is something which we are hoping to work with Tandan Kanan Zoo. Uh, they've been very uh, open in discussing and thinking about these ideas with us. And this will also help understand whether this individual has any potential for going or contributing its genes back to the wild uh, and how it fits into the broader screen. So hopefully this will allow for really high tech uh, evidence based or information based uh, breeding strategies. So I'll just summarize that uh, captive individuals, you know, we talked about this in situ, ex situ conservation link. Uh, and captive individuals have already helped us understand wild tigers better and have facilitated conservation. Whether it's that very simple case of uh, the trafficked animal, uh, or hopefully there'll be some conservation action to think about connecting Simlipal or increasing connectivity to Simlipal at some point. Um, and as fragmentation continues, in understanding inbreeding and what is actually going to happen, real inbreeding, not just using it as a term, is going to become critical for many species, right? And it's going to become an important, it should, I don't know whether it will, it should be an important part also of reintroduction, rewilding, and captive breeding. Uh, so, of course, this is going to be true not just for tigers and many other species. And I hope this is a time to think about this idea more broadly of integrating these novel methods and genetics, not just as a tool to count tigers or look at connectivity, but true genetics uh, into uh, thinking about uh, captive animals uh, and conservation. So thanks, I'll just, uh, sorry, I did take too long. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Uma, for the wonderful presentation on how we can link in situ and ex situ conservation and you know build on the genetic diversity. So we do have ten minutes before we break for lunch break. So if there are any questions and answers that que sorry questions that are there for the speakers, so answers you can take them up. <laughs> I'm happy sorry. to listen to answers. We can take them up now, uh, and then we will return back by by for lunch for the session five. So if there's anything. All, so this is all regarding all the three sessions and yesterday yeah. ses session one, which was on the vision plan. So if you yeah, do have, can probably come. Yeah. yes. So Dr. Sindhu, I mean, yes, fine, fine, fine. All right. So, so should I go or I can be here? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. I just wanted to know, you said key means the tigers at uh, Ranthambore, they are most inbred. Yeah. So means, uh, what was the basis of this conclusion and whether the same, whatever the parameters we used, including the intensity of study, was it applied across the different other tiger zones that we have in the country? Right, right. Yeah, great question. So the thing is, uh, traditionally inbreeding is measured with pedigrees, right? 
you look at how related the parents are and that is what the inbreeding coefficient or inbreeding is but what happens is when your parents are related they have uh, the same dna stretch in their genome which is identical because they have a common ancestor and so you inherit if i'm if my parents were related i'm going to inherit on both my chromosomes the same same stretch of dna this is called a run of homozygosity so basically parts of the genome where there's no variation at all okay and this is a genomic way by sequencing the genome to look at inbreeding and the longer the run of homozygosity the more recent the inbreeding so yes we used genome sequencing to estimate inbreeding and all the samples were treated the same way so we had 55 genomes we sequenced across india and we compared these runs of homozygosity in ranthambor slash rajasthan tigers because we had some sariska individuals as well to those in central india to those in southern india and so on uh, in in simlipal we do not have any so for doing whole genome sequencing ideally you should have a good sample like blood or saliva is also good uh, but in uh, simlipal we don't have any such good sample it's all fecal samples so we're not able to estimate inbreeding uh, in the same way in the simlipal study that is true does that answer your question I didn't ask about the process. My simple oh. question was whether all the areas were covered. You said means the sure, sure. Yeah. So of course uh, we have uh, we have samples from Central India, mostly the central part of Central India. Oh, thank In you. The Western Ghats we have mostly from Central Western Ghats. We do not have samples from say Southern Western Ghats, from uh, Eastern like parts of India uh, and so on. But we do have samples from Sundarbans. Overall, we have a lot of uh, different areas covered, but of course, not everything. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything to uh, prevent that type of inbreeding in random bore? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think that basically uh, what we are, I, I just wanted to again distinguish between inbreeding depression and inbreeding. So inbreeding is mating between relatives and inbreeding depression is when you start seeing the effects of the inbreeding on animals, their reproduction and growth rates, right? So uh, as of now, we don't see inbreeding depression yet. Maybe it would happen in some time. And at that time, uh, what we've suggested this is in the paper. So this is, I'm not a manager, like I said, uh, is uh, potentially the only solution is genetic rescue, bringing in individuals from somewhere else. But of course, you have to be sure that those individuals are not bringing the same, you know, shared bad mutations. So if you if you look at Sariska, it's even more inbred than Ranthambur. So there's absolutely not much point moving individuals from, uh, say, Ranthambur to Sariska or vice versa. Thank you. Definitely, absolutely. I mean, that is the best option: is functional connectivity on the ground. Uh, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, just to add what uh, Dr. Uma was saying, actually, uh, there are uh, two things like uh, one, either we introduce from some other, uh, other landscape, yes. because what happened when we talk of, I mean, two uh, places where they got locally extinct, yeah. uh, one was uh, Sariska and another was Panna. Panna. So when we, we tried reintroduction in Panna, so we have taken the founder population from different uh, uh, tiger reserves, like they were taken from Panna, uh, for Panna they were taken from Page, Bandhavgarh, and Kanha. So they uh, all came from uh, different tiger reserves, so they have a broader genetic base. So uh, just to avoid this sort of inbreeding, and another is linking the ecology, the, making the ecological corridors viable. So that is very, very important. But just because some of the places like Sariska and Ranthambore, they are uh, isolated sort of uh, uh, landscape, mm -hmm. and they don't have any such ecological uh, corridor, live ecological corridor, so the only option is either you uh, introduce some of the uh, uh, tigers from other uh, uh, landscape or other meta population. But now coming to the study, so, so like uh, as good as your sample size is your uh, results of your study would be good. So, uh, so where from you collect the sample for such studies? So 
Uh, one good option is either you uh, get the samples from the uh, animals, either who are in the captivity or yeah. which are rescued or captured. Uh, so that gives you an opportunity to collect the sample. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult uh, from the field, uh, I mean, from the free ranging or wild uh, animals at times. So that's why it becomes very important to uh, link uh, yeah. our the animals which are in the captivity. And using the samples there, we can just uh, uh, use those, uh, 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 that study always helps in the conservation in the uh, in situ uh, locations also. Now coming to the two more uh, presentations which were done earlier by Dr. Sindura and Dr. Anoop. So uh, uh, when we talk of, uh, 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 when he was talking about one health, so uh, when we see the three verticals, normally uh, there is much work has been done in the human health and the livestock, but somehow in the wildlife uh, vertical, we have not done much. And uh, we don't have enough database also. They have a very well uh, uh, developed system in place, both human and livestock. So for wildlife, it becomes very, very important for surveillance and their COVID, uh, this uh, COVID pandemic has given a lesson and opportunity also to us to understand uh, like what are the threats if uh, any such situation again occurs. So surveillance, data, data collection, data management analysis and using it for forecasting, it becomes very, very important so that we are prepared in any such eventuality. So the National Referral Center, which is going to be established, so that is in the process. The blueprint and the major role was uh, by Dr. Sindura and uh, the other team members. So the blueprint was uh, uh, made and now uh, we are in the process of making the DPR and the center would be established in Gujarat in uh, Junagar. So that would be a referral center. Then we, uh, we will also need it, uh, the uh, support from the uh, regional and the local uh, uh, centers that their role would be very, very, very important because we cannot uh, go to the national referral center for each and every case or for every sample. So the already the, uh, many of the states who have got their own uh, sort of setup, like many of the big states, they have got set up. So they all will be uh, uh, collaborating and talking to uh, uh, the national referral center and the database which we would generate will talk across to the other uh, uh, sector also like to the human database and the livestock. So they all will, will be on one platform. So that is the concept of One Health. So for now the uh, coming to Dr. Anoop, uh, the presentation which he gave. So just because the uh, when we talk of wildlife and human interface, so uh, there are two things like the animals either maybe the in the captivity or they are free ranging in the wild. So when we talk of interface, so the it is always easy to do any sort of study. Uh, uh, with the zookeepers or the veterinarians who are in uh, on a routine basis, they are in contact with the wild animals. So just to uh, have a sort of sample uh, uh, and to study from different regions. So this was a sort of indicative list of all the zoo which we have uh, worked out. But uh, the, the most important role uh, the would be of the participating zoo. So we would be talking to them and we will be having a separate meeting with them along with the ICMR team to just come out with the final uh, uh, name of those zoo who are interested. And the uh, proactive role of the zoo would be more important in this study, which ICMR uh, uh, Dr. Anupai has uh, shown in his presentation. Thank you. Dr. Kartik had something yeah, to say, I, I think you can. Uh, I just had to mention this in my presentation, but I missed out. Can you hear? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, I, though I emphasize that uh, you know all the people who are involved in conservation breeding of uh, of uh, different endangered species should do their profiling of their founders. I did not mention that there are uh, when you do send the samples, please mark a copy to seize a day. There are costs involved. Because all the analysis and the uh, and the uh, costs that are involved in the analysis have to be met. So please uh, copy Caesar Day on this, and we can uh, find out what the cost would be if there is any. Yeah, right. I think the next question. I have a question for you, Dr. Omar. Uh, so uh, you mentioned about uh, 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 say if you have a 
leucistic tiger, uh, so-called white tiger. Uh, it's a recessive mutation. It has a lot of effects and all. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of zoo visitors, I mean, there is a fascination, uh, I mean, so to say, uh, for uh, having such uh, uh, rare color morphs, uh, visitors like to see it. So, I mean, I think this this forum is is very apt to actually discuss this particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, this this topic uh, wherein you know you you uh, whether what what would be the future steps, because it is it is quite evident that they are they still continue to breed in zoos uh, uh, the color morphs. Yeah. Leucism or melanism or whatever it is, yeah. but uh, science uh, doesn't support it really. So, yeah. So, what yeah. what would you like to add on it? Just uh, so, oh yeah, sure. So basically, uh, the reason why a tiger looks white is because of a specific spelling mistake, which is present in two copies. Now, in the zoo, to get more white tigers, you end up doing inbreeding because you have to get say two recessives together in the offspring. So actually that white mutation, as far as we know, doesn't cause any bad effects. But because you're doing inbreeding, there are many other bad mutations, the genetic load we talked about, that cause the effects which you see in these white individuals. So what you can do if you want to maintain the white allele, you have to somehow figure out which are the worst and breed them out. Just as you're breeding in white, you breed out things which are potentially really bad. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Right. Are there any more questions? Oh. <laughs> sir, uh, sir, I represent MVR Snake Park in Sioux, Kerala. Only one question regarding the CSR fund. Dr. Reddy was oh. listing out the uh, pumping of uh, CSR fund to his uh, zoo in Chennai. Why don't you have apply a consortium model that is, um, uh, in fact, Kerala, we do have uh, five or six uh, zoos. They can come together and apply for a consortium model. And uh, we, we were actually, we, everybody was uh, telling about a CSR fund, but we don't get any, cons any uh, uh, CSR funds or more. Why can you, can we apply for uh, such a consortium model in uh, uh, getting a CSR fund. That is my only one doubt regarding that. And one of the things that regarding the diversification, diversification of the zoos, I think why don't we try about uh, establishing or uh, trying an academics in the same campus of every zoos. Uh, every zoos can have facilities in faster development, etc., etc. Why don't we have an uh, uh, academic, academic, uh, campus or academic institute as a part of the individual individual zoos. We were, government of Kerala has sanctioned us to start a uh, hepatology or a life science institute recently. We are going to start that. Uh, Dr. Karthik has already uh, given his <laughs> support for such a venture personally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, in the vision plan also, if you see, like, uh, uh, it was talked that uh, we try to pull up resources from where, uh, uh, other than a state or the central fund. So this is one good option to have uh, the opportunity of using CSR fund wherever it is available. But is, it is up to a state only to decide, like, if they uh, make a, any sort of consortium, because this would certainly be a good idea. Because normally what happens that uh, the zoo if had got a good footfall and where they have got a good opportunity of uh, sort of advertising or publicity for the funding which they are doing. So they were there, there only they would like to put up their money, but not to the zoo where there is not much of footfall. So the problem of fund is not much uh, with the larger zoos, but the small zoo where the footfall is not much, they always have paucity of funds. So if any such, such consortium is made and it is managed at the state level, it would always be a good uh, sort of uh, arrangement. But this is up to the state only to decide because normally what is happening, the companies or the uh, public sector, whatever it is, uh, they are trying to uh, use their CSR money. So they uh, mostly make arrangements only with the large zoo. 
So the states can take up this issue at their own level. Yes. Just uh, supplement uh, what Sanjay just said. Uh, I actually didn't mention that one part in my presentation that all zoos of Tamil Nadu come under the uh, ZAT, that is the Zoo Authority of Tamil Nadu. So that functions like an umbrella organization. And uh, uh, like he rightly mentioned, uh, one lure zoo is more popular, a larger zoo, well recognized, so it's easier to dovetail uh, CSR funding there. But the smaller zoos which have poor footfall, uh, usually the companies wouldn't associate with that. Because there is also an advertisement, there is a business sense for them to invest in CSR. CSR is not a very altruistic uh, thing, let me be very upfront. So you have to dovetail and try to motivate them to uh, fund to these places and which can be done through a consortium, but it has to be governed by the uh, state itself. I mean, CZA cannot enforce that or you can't force any of the company to come into a consortium. So it has to be a, a voluntary thing in which uh, the state's body, the common body will try and try to get the funds for all the zoos by trying to get their uh, uh, inputs that each uh, specific zoo requires a particular thing and whether the companies are coming forward to fund that in the CSR model. So if uh, it applies to them, because please understand all companies uh, have specific objectives. Some uh, CSRs don't fund you for uh, a single project. They go into a full-fledged uh, uh, MOU for a long-term arrangement, three, four, five-year arrangement too. So you have to understand uh, what are the objectives with which the CSR is uh, operational for those companies and then dovetail it to meet the support of uh, the uh, needs of the individual zoos, particularly the smaller zoos. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And uh, we now break for lunch and we'll rejoin back at 2 p.m. for the session five. Thank you.
on it. Uh, welcome to all the participants. We uh, will be now starting with session five. I, as a repeat announcement, I would also like to inform everybody to please keep their phones on silent. So we now move on to the holistic planning of XE2 conservation in zoos session, and uh, we will just do a swap, and we will have uh, Lakshmi Narsimha, uh, our, sci our scientific officer, Central Zoo Authority's presentation first, which will be on the planned conservation breeding in Indian zoos, the history of it, perspective, and its progress. पॉइंटर कहा गया होल्ड ऑन गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks, Arundhati. So, uh, before I get into the presentation as such, uh, I, I would just like to start with a small parable uh, uh, of how uh, zoos have really contributed to uh, conservation of species. Uh, it's about a uh, it's about uh, European bison. Uh, the species. better now better now i don't know <laughs> okay uh, so yeah it's a, i was just talking about the european bison uh, a species that was it's it's one of the it is actually uh, the largest mammal that roamed europe uh, in the 19th century it was largely hunted by the early 20th century it actually got extinct in the wild so there were around 12 individuals that were brought to uh, zoos and then they started a conservation breeding program for this particular species and right now and then uh, over years they were uh, reintroduced into the wild and right now there are uh, close to 7000 individuals in the wild very classic example of how uh, uh, captive populations have uh, really uh, helped in uh, you know bringing back species from extinction uh, so there are several examples Uh, if you look at uh, uh, other species, Sphinx macaw, golden lion tamarin. So we we must really uh, you know take take uh, inspiration from these uh, programs and you know sort of try to emulate them. And uh, and I hope uh, that you know Indian zoos uh, do have the potential to you know make make an impact of of that stature. Next slide, please. so the framework in which uh, the my my talk would be focused on today is uh, conservation breeding in indian zoos uh, because these these programs have been going on for uh, more than a decade history and what we have achieved and what is the perspective what is it that we uh, we we must uh, uh, we intend to go around go about this next uh, just a quick overview of uh, the programs uh, so before i start the presentation just a small terminological clarification we generally use captive breeding conservation breeding so when we talk about captive breeding so generally when you house animals in captivity they breed but generally what happens is when when you house a population or or a species uh, or a stock of a species in zoos so they breed we have a very loose population management system so for example uh, non native pheasant species like say silver pheasant or lady amherst pheasant they are breeding in zoos but you know the management of the population how you pair individuals they are not very organized so they are quite loose and then they are on display to the visitors 
So generally, it's this is this is what broadly constitute uh, captive breeding as such. But you know, I just inserted a term. So when you add a prefix conservation oriented captive breeding, or generally what we refer to as conservation breeding. So it adds multiple layers of how you manage a particular species in captivity. One of the first uh, point is behavioral competence of individuals, which means that this individuals that are being managed in a conservation breeding program are actually uh, supposed to be as similar as possible to the wild conspecifics. How close are these individuals to the wild uh, conspecifics so that the long term goal is to send them back to the wild and they are able to survive in the wild. So behavioral competence of individuals that are managed in a conservation breeding program is, is of primary importance. Uh, we will talk about a bit about these, uh, these two aspects in detail, but broadly, uh, the population is very intensively managed. How many individuals, how many pairs, where are the individuals placed, which zoos are holding them, which zoo is coordinating, which zoo is parting. So there, there is a more, uh, multiple layers of management that we add into how the population is manage, managed. So that's about demographics and genetics. And then of course, there is a very intensive uh, aspect of diseases, which means that uh, because these individuals are actually, uh, they would eventually go back to the wild. So we'll have to make sure that the diseases are uh, very well understood and manageable as well. Next slide, please. If you look at the programs as such, uh, it has been going on for quite some time since the constitution of CZ uh, in 1992. But uh, broadly, it was kind of distilled between 2000 and 2005 that, okay, there has to be a more coordinated breeding program uh, in Indian zoos. So uh, it was, it was uh, they were conceptualized between uh, these, uh, these five years. Uh, there were some specialist groups that were formed. Uh, expert consultations were uh, taken up. Uh, the threats, the threat status of the species, that is, uh, uh, what is the status of the species in the wild was evaluated. And then, of course, there were, there were zoos at that point in time which were identified that, okay, fine, these are the zoos that would take up the conservation breeding of this particular species. Most of, the, most of these programs, uh, as such, were initiated between 2006 to 10. Uh, most of the conservation breeding programs in Indian zoos, they were uh, uh, initiated between 2006 and 10. So, there were two important documents. There was a concept paper on in situ and ex situ linkage, uh, which was broadly drafted, which gave the skeleton for uh, this particular program. And at the same time, there was uh, a guideline and norms for conservation breeding programs that was uh, uh, published by the Central Zoo Authority. This, this all happened between, uh, again, you know, around 2010 and 11. Uh, there were, the, the guidelines are much more detailed. But the crux of the program was to have uh, 250 uh, proper bred, uh, physically, genetically, and behaviorally healthy individuals of each targeted species uh, in the world in captivity. So we envisioned that, okay, if there is a particular species that is uh, nearly threatened, we would want around 250 of them in captivity, of which at least 100 of them, 100 of these individuals should be in India. So this was the broad goal we set out with, as far as conservation breeding is concerned. And uh, of course, there were several uh, purposes. The one is the classical, uh, we have to establish an insurance uh, population of threatened native species in Indian zoos, cooperatively manage these populations in order to support in situ conservation, uh, support any reintroduction efforts that might be taken up, and of course, awareness. Tell people about, okay, well, how, how important these uh, species are and uh, their conservation is. Uh, just uh, um, just a depiction of how diverse the species is and uh, the zoos that are taking up the conservation breeding programs. Uh, next one, please. If you look at the program structure as such, so as on date, so there are around 43 zoos that have been identified for uh, taking up these conservation breeding programs. These zoos have been uh, classified into two categories, that is coordinating and participating zoos. Coordinating zoos are uh, basically those which... Uh, uh, zoos that are very close to the natural habitat of the species, they are uh, tasked with uh, establishing the base population. So that is, they are the zoos that would start the conservation breeding programs in, in an off-display facility, starting with, we had envisioned at that point of time that around 25 individuals uh, would uh, be the starting point of these uh, captive stocks. And then, of course, once these coordinating zoos achieve their target number, say a zoo says that, okay, uh, like... Uh, we were discussing uh, during the Padma Janaidu presentation that they have a target population size of carrying capacity of 15 individuals for snow leopard. Once the target uh, numbers are reached, so those individuals have to be sent out to other zoos. 
So that's that's where the participating uh, zoos come in, where they support the coordinating zoos in carrying forward the uh, conservation breeding programs, uh, basically in uh, establishing satellite populations and also in uh, education and awareness. So there was a very uh, detailed process. I'll just run through them quickly before we get into the details of it. So uh, uh, keep doing that. Uh, so basically starting with identification of uh, the species, uh, what is the approximate number of animals that are required uh, that needs to be collected as a starting stock because 25 was a number but uh, it might not be feasible to always start with 25. The number of uh, animals of the species in captivity, how many of them are already existing or is it the fresh uh, population that we need to establish. Identification of coordinating participating zoos and then the enclosures had to be set up and then off display enclosures especially because these uh, all the individuals that were uh, uh, that were are supposed to be managed in conservation breeding programs are uh, are to be housed in off display facilities so that was one of the key steps and then uh, it was also deliberated uh, at a very uh, uh, you know uh, uh, briefly that founder identification of founders and genetic assessment of the founders is 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 the foundation of a conservation breeding program that was of course one of the key aspects that was taken up Marking of founders, uh, and then keeping uh, record keeping and compilation of stud book. Go next. Uh, and also, we we also had this uh, provision of interaction with uh, international stud book keepers because it's very important that uh, most of the uh, conservation breeding programs are basically run as regional programs. For example, North America has their own uh, regional programs. Europe has their own regional programs. So there has to be a very strong liaison between uh, these programs in order to. No, you in order to achieve the intended goal in the sense that okay uh, international collaboration uh, knowledge exchange and so on uh, uh, that that was point number 13 and then of course a detailed uh, health assessment of the individuals that are uh, that are uh, suppose that are that have been identified for this conservation breeding programs for this two referral centers have were identified one is the IVRI for taking up uh, the health assessment of these individuals, and then uh, of course, uh, Lacons Hyderabad as uh, uh, as as the center for uh, helping with the genetic assessment. And uh, the last two is where you you take steps towards institutionalization of whatever is learned in these programs in the form of a conservation breeding plan, and also engagement of uh, a long, biologists or technical personnel who would work in the programs long term. Next one, please. Uh, and also as a as a follow up uh, stud books uh, which support these programs uh, there have been uh, uh, more than 30 species for which stud books have been created 34 to be specific uh, and uh, they are being updated on a regular basis which gives uh, these uh, these stud books give basis uh, they provide information on the basic life history uh, traits of uh, the individuals that are managed in the population next one please okay so that was the process. Uh, what 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 needs to be done in the program, and uh, uh, I would I would now I have done a quick meta analysis of what how many species were there and what has been the progress. We will just look uh, we will just look at uh, the key traits uh, key traits of these populations that have been housed uh, in Indian zoos. So if you look at the species as such, uh, I said there are the, like I said there are, there are seventy four species that have been identified. So largely mammals. Uh, three species of reptiles, 24 species of birds, and one amphibian species. So this is the broad composition of the species that have been identified. Uh, this is the uh, IUCN criteria. Uh, most of them are globally threatened uh, species, uh, uh, critically endangered species like vultures, endangered species. There also there are uh, several, most of the species that have been identified have a strong basis of being globally threatened and that's the basis on which they were identified. Next slide please. Uh, so 74 species, so in 2007, uh, uh, sorry around 7 and 8, so there were 74 species that were identified, 15 programs uh, of the 15 species programs, they have not been initiated yet. So uh, for example, Asian Hubara, uh, there were cheetah, dolphins. So there were some species for which the programs could never be initiated, so there are around 15 of them. And then the remaining 59 species, they are housed in variable numbers in uh, different zoos. We'll just, uh, uh, look at this. So what do these programs inform? So after having run these programs, so it's been nearly a decade uh, since uh, these programs were initially uh, conceptualized and initiated, what do these programs inform us? So 
uh, one of the key traits what 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 comes out is that okay uh, it it's been like nearly a decade most of these populations still remain as very small uh, populations because there is a very strong learning curve associated with establishing uh, the captive population of a species you need to learn the husbandry you need to understand the biology you need to integrate it into the captive animal management so which is which is quite a challenge in itself so uh, most of the population as a result have you know some of them have been successful some have some of them have remained as smaller populations next slide so of all the species uh, this this is the these are the list of the species for which we have uh, 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 the conservation breeding programs are ongoing this is the uh, numbers highlighted here 250 is the global population that we started out this is the goal and this is the intended goal of okay how many of them would be in indian zoos that's 100 so if you look at the species uh, very few have reached this number and further very few have reached this number next slide so if you broadly look at uh, this 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 trend there are some species that have uh, definitely they have really bred well in captivity which is quite evident uh, prolifically breeding species like red jungle fowl indian chevrotain uh, else deer so they have been quite successful uh, in uh, establishing themselves in captivity they have bred really well uh, and then there are species that have sustained in captivity but they have always remained as smaller populations they could near uh, never really uh, breed at a very fast uh, fast pace that could uh, partly be because of their biology because they are uh, they are species with longer generation lengths that is they would uh, they would take uh, longer uh, they have longer interbirth intervals and so on so slow slow uh, breeding species say for example uh, the blue ones the snow leopard uh, and the blight stuck they have they have sustained in captivity over the years but as smaller populations and then again there are then next are some species that have that that are there in captivity but as such if you look at their breeding success and all they are not very uh, not very promising uh, for example uh, the age are golden cats lion tailed macaque and so on so the, the broadly if you look at most of the species they broad in, uh, fall into these categories so basically if you look at this data this will kind of inform ki uh, over a period of 10 years you know what kind of species we can work with which are which can give us good results and which are the species that we may have to sort of relook into or we have to reapproach in the sense that okay fine what is it that uh, we have to improvise uh, so that we can plug in with appropriate information to make sure that these programs really work so uh, that's that's about uh, the population numbers as such so it's a uh, it, it looks a bit complex but basically if you look at this particular graph so basically each line represents uh, one species on this this row is what was at 2010 and what what was at 2020 if you look at the numbers how uh, they have actually uh, the population size at the start of the program and population size at the end of the program if you look at the numbers so lot of the species have either have mostly been stable you know it's at the bottom line so they have mostly remained stable and at lower numbers very few species that have shown uh, you know increasing trends which which i showed in the previous graph uh okay and like i said uh, for species which are breeding well how have their breeding trends are like so if you look at uh, so this is basically how what i'm trying to uh, present here is that uh, so there are so many species uh, i have taken case studies from different species and i'm just projecting the traits so that we have we learn from what we have done from the past 10 years so if these are basically pedigree charts how a population has uh, descended so these are the ones marked in yellow are the founders those are the parent stocks and then the, the next uh, the individuals in the next rows are basically the next further generations so if you look at uh, these pedigree charts uh, this is uh, probably of uh, a white rump vulture if i remember correctly and this one uh, i'm sorry I, I, i skipped my mind so if you look at the pedigree charts so there are way so it might look like okay this particular population has good breeding success there is there are like i think 300 white rump vultures in captivity but if you look at the pedigree chart out of so many individuals there is only a small proportion of individuals that are breeding and uh, contributing to the overall growth of the population as such uh, which is which 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 is actually very classical this is not a very unique problem to indian zoos this is actually uh, very well documented across global programs this is what is happening so if when you bring a 25 or 30 or 40 individuals into captivity only a small proportion of them are able to really adapt to captive conditions and breed 
so that is what is happening so this this is a very uh, classical problem and the, some <laughs> this can only be achieved uh, by fine tuning husbandry but that that needs to be worked out but basically this is this is a very classical trait in most of the po populations that are managed in indian zoos only a few of them breed say for example in this there are these four individuals that are very prolifically breeding individuals because they are the ones who are uh, breeding and the the descendants are actually most of them are related so when you have a when you have a population of like this you will end up with very less pairing options over a period of time which becomes quite challenging and so is uh, the uh, that that's also issue in uh, the this pedigree also which is what i am referring to as disproportionate breeding only a small proportion of the larger number of individuals are breeding and then uh, this was also uh, like i mentioned we start out with say 25 is the number we started out with uh, in our guidelines right so large number of wild born individuals that were bought into they they failed to breed which is again uh, quite classical but these are the traits that we need to keep in mind before we proceed further okay these are the pitfalls okay and how do we avoid them so this is how we learn so large number of wild born individuals have never managed to really breed and then uh, we still have a uh, lot of unsexed individuals in the in in uh, in the populations because because of which building pedigrees uh, and managing stud books is becoming increasingly difficult for us so because uh, so we have uh, for example in this population a large number of unsexed individuals which which really doesn't uh, you know uh, make any sense when you are building a stud book because you don't know the pedigree you don't know the sex of that particular individual so that's something which we need to look at so there is somehow a gap uh, there is a stud book for a particular species and then that species is particularly being managed in the population how do we actually uh, uh, you know there has to be a link that needs to be forged between these two unless and until we do that how does the population management of a particular species uh, account for demographic and genetic so like i said so there is a pe issues in pedigree there is issues within breeding so how do we actually integrate into the population management so there are it might be very uh, technical for uh, i mean i understand that as a zoo director it may be very difficult to look into the minutest details of populations but there are some broad uh, pointers that we can look at in captive populations that will readily give you information on okay how is my population uh, uh, really faring if you could ask your biologist okay fine uh, listen we have been taking up these conservation breeding programs for so so many years give me a, a growth rate of the population so it will tell you what at what percentage your population is increasing uh, the generation length it's a very in, a very important uh, trait of a captive population often ignored so these are ready references that you could keep in your office okay for a particular species like uh, uh, kulkarni sir was mentioning about uh, starting a program uh, for ltm or gar so generation length is such an important parameter wherein okay you have one particular individual how long does does that particular individual takes to contribute another individual into the captive population in the wild generally say for example uh, uh, once a, a litter is born it stays with the mother during that part particular period maybe the individual doesn't breed what happens in captivity is it generally uh, it is extended further more extended than what happens in the wild so as a result of which the growth of the population is so slow that in the wild a particular female would breed four times which in captivity would in reality be one so you know you are losing out on the reproductive potential of individuals as such as a result of which your population growth is low so growth rate and generation length are very key demographic traits that i would request that okay you would uh, uh, one should really uh, ha have a have a hold on okay what is happening and then of course like i said the kinship issue is related to that pedigree which i mentioned in the previous slide where you have uh, just few individuals breeding and then you have a pedigree with lot of closely related individuals so uh, there are optimal levels at which you can so basically i just wanted to, so there are so many other parameters there are px value mx values so many of them maybe they are too technical and which requires very intensive monitoring but there are broader and higher level parameters that you can monitor to make sure that your program is going on the right path next uh this is another uh, uh, important uh, parameter that uh, we uh, we observed which was next so this is again a uh, this this is all about all the felids that have been housed in indian zoos all the species of felids native non native 
So the graph in the uh, purple. Purple is basically this. This indicates what is the growth that have been uh, achieved by acquisition of individual addition of individuals. That is addition of individuals, and yellow is the one. It's it's the growth by birth. Individuals have been born into the population, and then uh, this red line is where that's the stable line. If any any of these graphs above the red line means it's growing. Below the line, it's it's not growing. So that's that's the basic uh, way we would read this graph. So if you look at all the species. Most of the species, if a population is growing, for example, fishing cat is growing, or so say it's a population that's increasing, we would presume that, oh, it's a, uh, it's a species that might be breeding well. But if you look at the, uh, the, the details of it, the growth is mostly by addition of individuals and not by births. So these are some of the basic traits one uh, we, we really need to uh, you know, tackle to make sure that, okay, fine, so how do we balance this? For example, if you look at in snow leopard, it's, it's at a stable rate. And then, for example, rusty spotted cat, again, it's the same thing. Uh, cheetah, it again happened in the same way. So most of the species, if you look at, so it's called as intrinsic and extrinsic lam lambda. But uh, basically, what, what this is saying is we, we really need to address how we can ensure that the growth of these populations can be through, uh, you know, breeding within the population and not by addition of individuals. You know, that's, that's the foundation of conservation breeding and that really needs to be addressed. Uh, this was only uh, for felids what I did. So, uh, I mean, these are generic traits, like I said, case studies, which I'm presenting next. Okay, so uh, that's a lot of pitfalls that have been pointed out. So, is there really an ideal conservation uh, breeding program that can actually be set up? Uh, the answer is yes, it takes a lot of effort and uh, a bit of planning. Uh, so, there is a five step process that, that uh, generally is you know uh, adopted worldwide for uh, uh, really taking up conservation breeding program as such uh, starting or uh, maybe an ongoing program that needs to be reviewed and so on so the first thing is it everything starts with knowing what is in the wild which means that status review and threat analysis ultimately the the point of having a conservation breeding program is that you ultimately send individuals back into the wild by supporting, uh, by, uh, you know, con in situ conservation. So, a detailed analysis of what is happening in the wild needs to be uh, carried out, and uh, that should feed your fundamental question of what is the potential roles and goals of uh, having a ex situ population to start with. So. This, this sort of informs your, uh, the, the basis of uh, starting the exit to uh, program and then what is the management type and what is the feasibility? How, how successful is it, uh, how likely is it uh, that this program is going to be successful? For example, because 10 years of conservation breeding has informed us a lot. The kind of data we have is unmatched. So we know what needs to be done, what works, what doesn't work, what are the pitfalls, we know it already. So, this, this really, you know, we can really answer this question in a very efficient way in order to make sure that, okay, fine. So, uh, we, we know the particular species has a, uh, has a very high threat status in the wild, which puts it at a risk uh, of extinction. And we also have learned uh, a lot about by keeping that particular species in captivity. And then that, that needs to be, you know, sort of integrated into a vision and conservation goal and then eventually a decision analysis of potential conservation objectives, what, what is the uh, fixed objective that we, and then which, which sort of should lead into a sort of an integrated plan. So where do you actually link when we talk about linking X2 and X2, uh, in situ and X2 conservation? So how, so this is broadly how your program has to be structured so that we know where exactly you are contributing in terms of in situ, what, what exactly is the feasibility or what is the conservation objectives of this particular program. This is a five-step and globally uh, uh, accepted uh, framework, which, which uh, we don't have to follow just because it is uh, globally accepted, but it seems like a reasonable framework for starting a particular program. Next. So, again, like I said, so in order to make sure that uh, uh, we, we really put all the programs on, onto track, uh, this was uh, to have a conservation breeding plan for all the species. That's what we set out uh, as a goal. We wanted to have a conservation breeding program for all the species, which sort of lists out founders, where you get it from, how many numbers, whether I need to add, add founders over the course of the program, or I just start with 20 founders and that's it, I end. I don't capture any more individuals from the wild. 
is that how I am going to uh, go about this particular program. And our strong emphasis has to be on pedigree management uh, because uh, a lot of these programs, the success depends on how well you manage individuals in the captive uh, breeding program. How many zoos, uh, marking of individuals, uh, evaluation of individuals in the program in the sense that, okay, uh, health assessment and uh, genetic assessment. And what is the target population size? Each zoos that have been nominated, so there has to be a, a, a mechanism for knowing that, okay, for, uh, for instance, this particular zoo has a carrying capacity of 10 individuals for this particular species, beyond which they really do, should not hold that particular individuals in cramped conditions or because of the fact that they don't want to dispose of the animals. And then, of course, husbandry is not something I would be talking about because, I mean, uh, uh, I'm sure that there have been a lot of efforts for by zoos, uh, as it was evident in the previous presentations, that there have been quite a success, in, uh, quite a bit of success in terms of uh, breeding uh, individuals. So husbandry is not something I would, uh, uh, I would emphasize much on here, but rather than that, I would really focus on mechanism for institutionalization. How do you actually if there is a successful way in which you can keep and breed the species, how do you make sure that that is part of the, your uh, husbandry eventually? So it should not skip. When individuals change, uh, the management should not change. So it has to be institutionalized. That's, that's one of the uh, core thing. And then, of course, you know, technical cooperation with research institutions. And a lot of Indian zoos are moving towards this particular, uh, uh, this particular, uh, um, you know, starting, taking up collaborations with uh, research institutions, both national and international, uh, like the LTM program where uh, Dr. Werner is part of it. Uh, and then also uh, another important aspect that, uh, you know, both zoos, uh, between zoos, there has to be a better collaboration. And at CZ also we are looking at this. How do we actually manage populations between zoos so that, you know, there, is, there isn't, you know, too many individuals of a particular species that's, that's really housed. All of this have to be part of your conservation breeding plan. How do you actually address all these aspects? So broadly, this is, this is what I would, uh, uh, I wanted to emphasize on. Next. So <clears throat> as, as, a, as a zoo director, uh, like I mentioned before, you might not be able to sit and uh, analyze uh, stud book data. I mean, you have people for that. But principles, knowing the principles is very key. Uh, so. Uh, can you please go back two slides? Uh, I mean, two times back click. Ah, oh, bus. I know. So there are programs available, open source programs. I'll give you the names in the next slide. Say, for example, there is a population. Assume that uh, this is the number of individuals, and this is over the years, in the next 20 years. We have uh, data with us. Okay, we know how species. Say, for example, if we take say snow leopard. Let's take the case of snow leopard. So we know that uh, uh, this particular species breeds at this rate, we know the generation length, because we have been keeping that species for like, what, 20 years now. So there are programs that can easily help you look at uh, what would be the future of the program in the next 20 years. You, you know, you could see in this program that, okay, fine, this particular population, let us not go with the names, but basically right now we are at 12, okay? And given what, is ha what has happened over the past 10 years, I have just created a, a prediction model which says that, okay, fine, with this current rate of breeding, whatever is observed till now, over the 10 years, what will be the future of this population? That is what I did. Based on 10-year data, I looked at what will happen to the future in the next 10, 20 years, So, which, which shows that, okay, there is a red line that's going down. So this will readily inform you that, okay, fine, I really need to look at my population in a way that, okay, fine, it doesn't crash. Uh, next. So, which will also help you set targets. Uh, when we talked about carrying capacity, it's a very important thing. Okay, I need to know that, okay, in the next 10 years, by the next 10 years, how many enclosures do I need? Because I would know the approximate number of individuals, okay? With this 12, I might have, in the next 10 years, I will be, end up with, I will be ending up with seven, enclo uh, seven individuals. So, I would need around seven enclosures, say, for instance. Uh, so, you would set targets, predict futures, next. You can predict what, what are the uh, probable events that you would come across. So there are programs, uh, these are uh, based, uh, derived from stud book information. So uh, we, we, we are actually working towards uh, creating uh, the base files for these programs because these are, uh, the stud books are maintained by CZ Day. We, would, we are working towards giving these particular base files to the zoos so that managers at their level can use the programs and see, okay, fine, what is the future of my population? You don't really have to enter the data and uh, look for yourself. So 
uh, just just to uh, give an overview of what is available, what is out there. Next, you know, these are the two programs that uh, I I, uh, I would recommend that uh, we we really have to largely use. The one is the PMX, and another one is Zurisk. Uh, so these are the uh, these are the it has like innumerable number of calculations and analysis that you could do as far as captive populations are concerned. But, uh, and these are open source. You don't have to pay for using them or you don't have to uh, really pay any, get any subscriptions or anything. They are openly available, but you can really, you know, make good use of understanding, okay, fine, you can sit at your computer and see, okay, fine, in the next 10 years, I will have this issue. I'll have, uh, uh, say, a population crash or something I might have to address, addition of founders and so on. What is the possibility that my uh, population would uh, really go extinct, pyramids, calculating. So these are some of the, it's like a dashboard. It will give you uh, basic information. Uh, next. So, okay, having said all that, uh, just to uh, wind up. Uh, so, one of the first things, uh, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, graphs of why keep species in captivity declining in the wild. You found and then you grow it and then you manage it to a particular uh, 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 target population size. This is our target population. You manage at that number and then you subsequently introduce into the wild so that you know their population grows. So basically, what we do from now on should really be based on what we have learned till now. So that's that's one of the a data driven approach in in terms of okay fine if you want to start a particular program what have we uh, known uh, in all these years uh, so all the further steps should account for what has been learned uh, uh, in the vision plan uh, which we have that the, the central zoo authority is uh, intending to take up wherein uh, the species, uh, there were 74 species out of which 15 uh, have not yet been started reviewed in terms of their success, in terms of their feasibility of taking it further again, uh, and also the zoos. Uh, there might be some zoos uh, which were not identified when these programs were conceptualized, but right now they might be breeding a particular species in a better way. So we would uh, look at those zoos and the possibility of including them uh, in the process, so a, a detailed review. And then of course, uh, the, uh, if you look at these programs as such, they, they have to be more periodic review in the sense that uh, you would have, it's, it's just like how you monitor visitor count in your zoo. You can set a, a growth rate, okay, my growth rate for this particular species will be 1.1, .1, a value of 1.1. .1. Anything below that, it is a red alert for me. So you have to have a optimal value, a set target for you as far as management of the population is concerned and you have to manage your success against that. And then cross institutional collaboration in the in the sense that how how well do there is uh, you know a flow of uh, knowledge between institutions, any new programs that we really need to start should uh, we we should probably try to fit in into the the five step framework which you know I kind of outlined to make sure that uh, you know from the start itself we have a very strong foundation in terms of what we need to achieve in the long run, and then uh, plans. Uh, will give us perspective. Uh, it's it's it puts numbers, uh, figures, everything in one place, so that you know uh, when there is uh, you know change of leadership, you know that okay, fine. What what is the overall goal of the particular program? Uh, we should be adaptive in our approach in the sense that okay, whatever we have learned, we should we should co constantly improvise on what has been learned and uh, take it further. Uh, thank you so much. That was about uh, conservation breeding. I uh, I wanted to uh, talk about. Uh, the questions we can probably take in the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Narsima, for the talk. So as Narsima has very rightly pointed out, that conservation of species outside the species habitat requires standardization of a whole lot of protocols and planning pertaining to the infrastructure, husbandry, routine upkeep to ensure viable populations in ex situ facilities. So in line with that, we now move on to the first talk, which was to be done in our session for holistic planning of ex situ conservation in, in zoos. I now invite uh, Shri P.C. Tyageji, who is the former P principal chief conservator of forests and head of forest for Tamil Nadu, to please present perspectives on ex situ management and also discuss on the management effectiveness evaluation of zoos. Uh, 
good afternoon to you all uh, my presentation uh, uh, contains uh, all the contents have already been discussed so i'll be very fast and touching on very few important points basically way forward where things where we are and where we should move and how to go about it so i'll be a little fast maybe i'll not cover all the things that are there uh, and i have another presentation on me as well so i would like to devote at least 20 minutes for that so uh, maybe i'll take 45 minutes uh, for both the presentation but uh, whatever i'm going to talk about has already been you know people have spoken about it uh, whether it's conservation breeding or whether it's uh, enrichment that we have to do in our zoos but still i would like to you know say that because i have experience of you know having visited several zoos in the country not in the last 5 years but before that and uh, so i know the positions i know the uh, almost all the enclosures that are there in the zoo where the animals are kept and where improvements have taken place in the zoos and uh, this thing and it's been reflected in the the me report as well so first one so if you see that what uh, our honorable minister was saying that uh, our zoo strength and opportunity are enormous and for a manager of a zoo if he really wants to work hard he can show results you know beginning the next year uh, in forestry you know results will come after 4 5 years but in the zoo if you do something you know results would come immediately so you know you get that satisfaction that whatever you are doing and this thing and mid course corrections you can do if you go wrong you know you have lot of this thing that's not the this thing so mid course correction we have a very large visitation 80 million people visiting our zoos that's really this thing uh, in any zoo we have 20 big zoos 25 30 lakhs people coming there a uh, real world of wildlife you know uh, the animals are there and the uh, and the uh, in the natural uh, exhibiting their natural traits and you can build a very creative education program uh, you must uh, best practices are uh, see in mysore see in uh, uh, azp one loop just look at the you know all information is available in the website you have a look at that and try to see you know you can do something more than that so so many education programs and creative ones you can have make your zoo a, a really knowledge center a learning institution and see that the people who come there all sections of society who come there they uh, their attitude and their behavior about conservation uh, is transformed and changed uh, and uh, if this is possible this is only when you have good uh, immersive and inclusive designs what we are doing is we have a design book uh, by CZA and everyone thinks that that is the last word on designing. No, that was uh, design. That is the old designs that were just for, for the sake of, you know, uh, giving you a reference material that was given to you. But now there are much, much better designs and we have to now come forward with some kind of another book, you know, with all more innovative things that we can do. So that design book that you have, people just simply follow that put that design, put a circle and then an animal house and that's all. So it has to be much more than that. So it has to be immersive and inclusive designs. Animal health care in the big zoos, they have all the equipment, all the automatic equipments which give you blood count, which gives you uh, your urine uh, information uh, and so many other things that are there. So when you go for that, you should only prioritize what is immediately required and then they'll go for the, this thing so some zoos are there they are keeping some equipment which they are not using so that's another thing use of technology you must now say that in the zoo there are seven eight technologies that you can easily get and easily uh, put it in use so those technology we'll talk about that also management of rescued animals we had seven centers where we have now only very few animals re remaining there are i think uh, five animals there uh, three uh, of four animals there three tiger and one lion and in three rescue centers and the rest of the rescue centers are now dilapidated uh, corrosion has set in i have visited two or three of them and i have found that you know you can't keep any animals over there even if you want to so you have to maintain them and put to better use we'll talk about that also a little later research programs in fact in the me we were i in fact i happened to see almost 30, uh, research plans of 39 zoos and i didn't find a one proper research plan it was all very ad hoc, whichever, uh, so we need to have a research plan and uh, that is very important. Collaboration and networking, inter-institutional inter cooperation is just very important. Uh, everything, whether it is conservation breeding, you have to have hand-holding with some scientists. Lacons is doing it for uh, the mouse deer, WII, uh, there are so many scientists, they should also do hand-holding for the species in which they are experts and they have so much knowledge. 
And uh, next is the conservation breeding. One plan approach has been already covered. Environmental sustainability through science-based resource management. Several zoos, best practices, if you see, I can list it out for you, that what is best in which zoo. And then you can uh, go on to the website, get the information from there, talk to the uh, zoo directors, and try to at least get that basic uh, 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 resource management or sust uh, uh, sustainable resource management initiatives that they have taken, try to emulate it in your zoo. Financial sustainability model also, we had a workshop long time back on financial sustainability and marketing. Have a look at that, plus the new ideas that have come up. Next. So holistic integrated planning is basically look at the whole spectrum of all the conservation activities that you do in the zoo from visitor management, animal management, animal care, education, transport, maintenance, scattering, research, all aspects. This has to be integrated and it's all connected to one another. So if you have a flaw in any of these, if your animals are not properly maintained and your zoo is very nice, your infrastructure is due, is good, but you have several animals which are single animals or several animals which are not in social group, so they will not display a natural behavior. So the kind of message that you pass on is, is, is going to be just, uh, uh, just optimum. Next. Now visitor services, uh, uh, and I have seen several uh, zoos with an entrance which is very, very shabby. And I'm, I, I have not seen them after that. And I am sure that they have again redesigned and reconstructed them. But if you have a very shabby entrance, it gives a very bad look to the zoo. People who come there, they first, it's, a, it's an iconic thing for the zoo. It's a branding of zoo that you need to do. So your uh, reception, your ticketing, you must try to find out how long it takes for one person to get a ticket and when there are more people coming in, then put more people for that. So this kind of a management that you should have. People should have a seamless entry into the zoo. Now you can have uh, uh, web-based ticketing also. Even web-based ticketing, you have to check the tickets, so that also takes time. So you must have some kind of a mechanism where you can, you know, the flow of visitors is seamless and very quick. And most important is the washrooms. I, whenever I go to the zoo, I always make it a point that I will go to the washroom and see how, how well they are maintaining it. And I, because washroom is such an important thing, otherwise, you know, you have a lot of people just uh, littering around and doing all kinds of things. So washrooms have to be kept this thing. And other transport signage and all that, I think it's been improved as you get money, you do that. Next is uh, visitor survey is to be done periodically. No zoo in the country is doing a visitor survey, has brought out a report. This was brought in the ME. I have got a format, a, a, a updated format on visitor survey. If you want it, I can circulate it through the CZA so that at least once a year or two seasons in a year, you must do a visitor survey so that you can know for yourself what the visitors are uh, uh, saying about you. So get a large section of people, some young, some old, some uh, uh, senior citizens, and then try to find out from them what is wrong, what they feel wrong. They have to walk too much or, or they, there are not washrooms, our uh, are, are facilities are provided at a distant away there are no signage you know you must tell them next washroom 100 meters 200 meters because all the time people when they come there they they need to you know they want to go and they, they don't know where the next washroom will be there so all these things you could make it so visitor survey is very important next the exhibits now we have an enclosure complexity scoring sheet we have prepared in wi more than seven eight years back and we did enclosure complexity scoring for several exhibits in the zoo. And we got a very, very low score. So I want you to follow that enclosure complexity scoring sheet that I'll also provide to you. Fill it up yourselves. At least it will take a little time because there are several parameters in that. But uh, your range officers, your zoo biologists, and even volunteers. You can get people from, say, in Madras, we used to get people from Loyola College. Uh, have a two-hour session with them, you know, how to fill up the enclosure complexity score and get people who are in MSc or who are doing BSc uh, 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 and in life sciences, they will understand it very, very easily. So this enclosure complexity scoring thing will tell you all about your enclosures, whether they are naturalistic, where there is problem with lighting, where there is problem with aeration and structural stability, all that is, will going to come into that, uh, into that form and uh, easy access to uh, enclosure for capture. That also is a question over there. Uh, if you have to put a cage, uh, can you transfer the am animal easily? Or uh, it's a very difficult thing, and you have to call 10 people, 5 people to just uh, wheel away the animal from the enclosure if you have to do it for some medical care. Next. Healthcare is 
first and foremost is just simply just do not go and buy equipment what you don't need. You have to prioritize your equipment list. CZA has given an equipment list which is there in the evaluation format and the recognition of zoo guidelines. Have a look at that. Talk to other um, veterinary personals uh, who are there in other zoos and say what you can do easily in your zoo. So get that first and have some kind of a database on the uh, veterinary uh, data of animals and, uh, and keep it properly. Most of the zoos even now, uh, even though CZA has said that you should keep your data in, in certain uh, prescribed formats, we find that uh, data is still not kept in those formats. It is kept in a running note sheet. If you have to retrieve it at some point of time, it's just very difficult and the old pages simply are not existing. If the animal came in 1992, and if you ask for a data from 92 to 2000, where is the data? No, sir, I came only, I joined in 2008. So I have got data from eight. What happened to the old data? So all that has to be maintained very meticulously. And uh, uh, next is, next, animal welfare. This is the most important thing. So for animal welfare is basically acquisition of founders. If you want to start anything, you should say, see that the, whether those uh, have a look at the stud book. Even when you fill up our acquisition form, give it to CZA for, for, uh, uh, for getting uh, or acquiring an animal from any other zoo, uh, best is, I don't think so, any director looks at the stud book. If you're getting from, say, Chhatvir Zoo or you're getting it from Alipur Zoo, some animal, and you know that for that animal you have a stud book, you must go to that stud book, have a look at what kind of animal is there, what is the lineage and other details, and based on that only what would be the best animal for your zoo, that you have to find out through the stud book data and data on pedigree, find out the, all this mean kinship value to the animal that you possess. And then the social grouping. In fact, in ME also, people said, yes, I have got three LTMs and I have got uh, uh, four uh, Nilgiri Langurs and there are three male and one female. So social grouping and sex ratio is not proper. And that's why some of them, you know, even having animals, you get less score is because of that only. Then uh, enclosure design and enrichment uh, is one thing you have to look at. The enrichment is basically in situ, ex situ. You have to look at in situ uh, with all details. What is the animal husbandry information that you get from in situ? Try to uh, uh, use that information for your animal husbandry in the zoo. And similarly, uh, uh, whatever information that can be used from your animal husbandry, if somebody is doing research, they'll definitely look at the animal husbandry in the zoo to get more information on that animal if that animal is not easily seen and is very shy. So, uh, so you have to decrease stress, enhance ability to cope with stresses. What are the stresses? How do you find out what are the stresses? Uh, if, you, if I ask how many zoos have done behavioral study for their animals and for how many exhibits, you may have done for just for few animals. But you have to do it at least for every animal. And it's not that you have to do a very detailed one. Focal or scan sampling for which you can get information on the behavioral repertoire of the animals. It's not necessary that you have, call a, you have to call a scientist or you have to get a... Train your animal keepers on basic parameters of animal welfare. How they are utilizing the, the paddock area uh, and the time they are spending, the social interaction. That is very easy. They know all the animals. So why not in the animal keeper's diary, you get all this information and somebody can input it. This is going to be a very uh, good uh, set of data that you can uh, use. So this uh, behavioral study will then reflect on the design of the enclosure. Are there any flaws in the design? Enrichment that are required. And then you try to find out what are the enrichments in C2. What is the habitat of the animal? What is the natural traits and behavior of that animal? Same natural traits and behavior, uh, 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 species spe specific behavior it has to follow in the paddock area. So you have to create that in the small environment. And if you have this enrichment, there won't be any, any aberration or stereotype behavior that is exhibited by animals. So, and for enrichment, do not use material which, you know, I have seen, you know, people putting some kind of a, uh, a bamboo, uh, tables and uh, bamboo ramp and things like that. When you have logs and other things, see wilderness. Your guide is wilderness. And then you have to uh, make your enclosures as near natural as possible. So you'll have to be very careful about that using eco-friendly material and then uh, have an enrichment plan. In fact, only two zoos had proper enrichment plan. One was the uh, Vishakapatnam Zoo. And the other one was Chhatbir. Chhatbir came uh, with the enrichment plan after a few days. 
when we told them you have to prepare and they could do it in two days or three days to write an enrichment plan. So enrichment plan, what it is, I'll be talking about it when we do the, when we will be discussing some questions in ME. Next. One health approach, next. Uh, this also is done, next. Networking and institutional cooperation is very, very important. I think uh, you, you must have a, a WhatsApp group of all the large zoos or medium zoos or this thing, a WhatsApp group, so that if, the, and a WhatsApp group of veterinarians also separately. If you have that WhatsApp group, whenever there is any issue, any problem, you could always refer to your, your friends who will guide you. There are uh, veterinarians uh, uh, who, are, who have been in the zoo for a long time. Mr. Shukla is there in Lucknow. And if there is any issue, any problem with any animal, uh, you could then uh, maybe this thing. If you bring a rescued animal to the zoo for three days, four days, five days, it will not take any feed. So you need not get worried. So how to uh, see that this animal uh, uh, it, uh, redu uh, it stress gets reduced and it uh, begins to take feed and begins to show and depict uh, natural behavior. There is a mechanism for that. There is, a, in the, there is a, some kind of a, a rule for that. For, and this you can get only from the experts. So you have to be very careful, you know, just you get really very, uh, uh, you panic and you feel uh, very this thing that uh, stress in the, in the, this thing that it has not eaten. The media may also come out. Somebody will give a message that four days se khana nahi khaya. So that itself, uh, people will say, kyo nahi khaya, khana khaya, theek se nahi khila rahe, achcha nahi khana de rahe. All kinds of this thing, issues are there. This thing. Another thing is, be in touch with IVRI, which is the National Referral Center, whenever you have any issues, because these people have been there visiting several zoos and a lot of expertise lies over there. And uh, Lacons is doing a wonderful job as far as, far as DNA profiling of animal is, uh, is concerned. And uh, we have, uh, as far as the master planning of uh, our education master plan, if you want to uh, look at the basic documents, you look at the document prepared by the CEE, Ahmedabad, uh, that will give you, you know what exactly you need uh, for preparing your education plan. Then uh, uh, WII, we do not have a zoo cell as, uh, as, as of now uh, because uh, th there are not enough uh, people to you know to cater to uh, uh, works uh, relating to ex situ conservation. But we do have some uh, programs like this National Stud Book that has been prepared. I don't know further they will be preparing this or not. So we need to get somebody. Uh, in the Wildlife Institute of India, who, who, who could be permanently there and who could uh, take care of this uh, and uh, probably provide technical support to the zoos. The research program, you cannot do an in-house research program. You may do one program or two programs, but you can't do it. Your in-house research, maybe whatever information you get from animal keepers is one thing, or somebody who is a researcher who comes for, say, MSc dissertation or someone. You have to now go to the universities and colleges and tell them this is the facility you have and if there is a possibility that they have some research, they want to take research projects, definitely you can ask them. If, even, if, even if they are doing in situ research, there could be a component of ex situ uh, built into that and so you could have uh, some information coming in from that research. Then uh, inter, intertwining with foreign zoos, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I have spoken to so many foreign zoos uh, they are very commercial. kya milega? That is the thing they ask, you know. And they said for the time we spent, they are very this thing, you know, that for the time we spent in helping another zoo in India, uh, they are losing out on some of the works that person could do in their own zoo. So that is why some of them would agree for few years, but it will not continue for uh, many, many years. Unless you have very good uh, uh, rapport with the zoo director there, and that rapport goes away when the zoo director tra is transferred or retires or something. So this intertwining with foreign zoos is a really difficult thing. Uh, next. Zoo education program, I have already uh, said that, you know, you need to look at uh, the, the two uh, uh, zoos and their leading practices. Try to see that the same things, at least, if not uh, less, at least same things you can follow. Uh, in fact, uh, Mysore Zoo, uh, Arigna Anna, other zoos are also doing. Chhatbi Zoo, they will say that they did all the animal days and all the celebrations. That is not there. It has to be a structured program. In Arigna Anna Zoological Park, every bus which comes to the gate of the zoo with school children, they will go and ask them, would you like to join our school program? 
if you are not able to, and now people do book for the zoo school program, but if they don't book and the biologists are free, they will get at least one or two programs. They will say only two hours with us. You spend two hours with us, and we it is basically a conducted tour for them. It's basically a work of a guide, but giving them some uh, good information. So that that is all we can do. But there are so many targeted groups, which are the targets, how to uh, uh, how to you know interact with them. So all that information could be so. Another is the zoo volunteers. You, in fact, in doing the ME, uh, we have uh, guidelines for zoo volunteer. There was hardly one or two zoos uh, who had a register where there was students or volunteers coming regularly to the zoo. You can't have a zoo volunteer who came just once. And so uh, you're, you're not going to get any score on that. You know, if you have a zoo volunteer, name is written, yes. How many times he came, you know? Because you have trained him everything, so get people who are living close to the zoo because people don't want to commute from far away. Next. So develop a research plan. First set priorities on what topics you want to do research. Get hold of all the universities. We have an advanced institute of wildlife conservation in uh, Tamil Nadu and we did one workshop. And that workshop we called all the universities, all the colleges, not only in the entire region, even from Kerala people came and people came from Karnataka also who had done work in, uh, in, uh, in Tamil Nadu. And then we asked them that would like to do X C2 research and most of them said yes. Some of them said they don't have funds, but he, he said we'll give you, we'll give all the facilities. We will even give the accommodation for the student who comes there and uh, we will uh, provide all the data that we have on the animals. So at least you will have to hold these meetings. You will have to send out letters to them and follow it up. It's not just one letter sent. Follow it up, call them, have a, a small workshop where we tell them, you know what, uh, we are developing this research plan, uh, what topics you would like to take. The Pondicherry University is there uh, in, in Tamil Nadu, and then we have Tanwas, and we have other, so many colleges wanting to come and, you know, do research. They just don't know about it. So in your website also, you must have a, a link where people would uh, be able to get information on the research work. Then uh, this is all about research. Uh, benefit of research on topics do operations. If it is visitor management, some research has been done or some data has been collected. It could be on anything. So uh, it could be on the ecology, biology, information about animals, which they feel. It could be on signages. Do a review of the signages of the zoo and tell them, you know, uh, uh, what the signages should be. If they know someone knows about signages, then he can do a small review on that as well. Next. Record keeping, I think everyone has spoken about it, uh, so I will just skip it. Next. Conservation breeding also has been all covered, but I just wanted to tell you that uh, more than eight years back, uh, in Wildlife Institute and Caesar took an initiative and we held two workshops, one in Bhuvneshwar and in one in Hyderabad, and we have prepared all the conservation breeding plans of 22 or 23 species out of 26. And most of, the, most of the zoo directors probably don't know that. If you don't know about it, please uh, uh, refer to the CZA. Uh, they will send you that plan. It is now 10 years old or 12 years old. You have to add much more information on it. And in that plan, next. So how do we go about it? 10 years, 12 years, we've been doing work on conservation breeding of species. First, there were 73 species, then uh, WIA has prioritized 26 species based on a criteria, and the criteria was number of animals in uh, wild, number of animals in cap captivity, Wildlife Protection Act, what is the status, and then uh, how many papers are there on this animal husbandry knowledge, uh, on all other uh, knowledge on ecology and biology of animals. Based on all this information in the global, globally, it is a, whether it's a threatened species or not, based on that, we did a scoring system. And so we have now scores. We have to review that again because some of the species that we put in there, say for the matter LTM or even Nilgi Langur. Now the population of LTM and Nilgi Langur in the last eight, nine, ten years in the wilderness has improved. Nilgi Tar, uh, when I was there, we had 107 in the Mukurti National Park. There are now I think 500 or 600. Uh, 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 this thing. So they have bred. So we don't, uh, we don't have to do it. It's a difficult animal as well. And so we need not uh, this thing. So these animals, which are already having a good population in the wilderness, they are not threatened in the wilderness. Uh, Hangul, we should do it because it is still threatened in the wilderness. 
Uh, then uh, next is updating these plans on scientific lines. Uh, then, then follow one plan approach and have a look at the exhibits that you have for these species. Most of the exhibits, the design and other thing, there are flaws in that. There are flaws in that. So you need to see the design of the enclosures used for the conservation breeding program. And before you do that, you need to first, when you prepare the conservation breeding plan, the first thing is that you have to determine how many founders are required and on scientific basis. How many you have to procure from the wild? How many is available in the country, in the, in the uh, coordinating and participating zoo? Once you get that information, then you have to plan it out based on those founders. And if you have to capture from the wild, do that. Unnecessarily breeding these animals ad hoc manner, just pairing and mating and with very few, with very few uh, breeders. In, in fact, in our LTM program, I think there has been just two or three females that have bred. The entire population is built on two females. One female, we have eight or nine uh, offsprings. Uh, another one, uh, we have uh, four or five. So, and the rest have been just simply maybe acquired or that we have got. That's why what uh, uh, Nassiman had shown, you know, that's very much correct. And once you start this program, then you have to build the life tables of the species, collect all the data on its growth, uh, generation length, and all other things that are there. Next. So assembling a founder population, what is the thumb rule of CZA says minimum 25 animals. The animals which you propose for your conservation breeding program, look at the social group of those animals because simply breeding animals where the, uh, the optimum sex ratio is not there and the social group is not there, that is also not advisable. You can't start uh, conservation breeding on any species uh, whose number in the wilderness is 10 to 11. They, they live in a group size of 10 to 11 and you have just one pair and you want to start conservation breeding with one pair. You have to acquire animals. So all that would come in your uh, conservation breeding plan. Then uh, this is all covered by other speakers. Next. This is the data analysis I was talking to you about. The stud book data, if you have, then you can uh, do an analysis of that and use this small population animal record keeping system. And with that, you can get this age pyramid, life tables, inbreeding, census, and, expo and then use this data next, export it to the next, uh, next, to this uh, uh, PMX 2000. And then from there, again, you can uh, do a demographic analysis, uh, do a population projections. And in fact, in the conservation breeding workshop that we had in Bhuvaneshwar and also in Adi, we had one expert, uh, Dr. Karthik, who is here with us. He did all the vortex analysis, the future survivorship, what is the future of the, uh, of the breeding that you're going to uh, uh, do in the conservation breeding program, and whether the population is going to collapse, crash at some point of time. So uh, I think it has been shown very clearly by uh, Narsimhan, so uh, we need not bother about that. So all that has to be there in your conservation breeding plan. If you don't have that, if your conservation breeding plan is not ready, then you can go, not go to the next step. And none of the zoos have a conservation, current conservation breeding plan, not even Darjeeling. Darjeeling have bits of information here and there, though they have, they have been ranked first because of other things, but conservation breeding still, the data that they are maintaining is in the best in the country. So uh, next. So you can do this genetic analysis. Next, we'll, we'll go to the next thing. Rescue and rehabilitation, as I was telling about, uh, you about that, there are seven centers and seven centers are unutilized. So what you need to do is find out how you can use these centers. Can you convert them into quarantine centers for your animals? Like Nahargarh wanted to do that, but they don't have money to, you know, repaint them, refurbish them. Uh, they've got money from the last time when I visited, they didn't have that. So if they have money, then they can definitely, and then they have to modify it as well. It's not that uh, th those rescue facility will become the thing. Modify a little bit and make them into your uh, quarantines for, uh, for animals. And a uh, lot of state governments are asking for new rescue centers. And the first thing we ask in CZA is, have you done some kind of an analysis as how many animal you are likely to get? Or the animals in the last four or five years that has been rescued and where they were kept. 
Do you have that data? If you don't have it, get it from the headquarters. So if you have only few animals coming in and you want to build a facility just for the sake that you have a facility, a big rescue center, but you don't have animals and you will never get animals for that matter. Uh, in, in Gujarat, I can understand every year they are getting several leopards. So uh, uh, they need more and more facility. But other states, they are not getting that, that number of animals which are basically uh, rescued and then uh, uh, rescued and kept in captivity. In fact, uh, the, the Wildlife Protection Act says that all animals which you rescue, uh, you have to release it in the wild if the animals are fit enough for release. If they are not fit enough for release, you will have to get a certificate from the veterinary doctor. And based on that, the chief wildlife warden will then say that this animal uh, is not fit for release and is brought into captivity and mark a copy all to, to the CZA. Next. Master planning. Uh, in fact, uh, this is one area which requires drastic improvement. And if the zoo director wants it, it can be done. And if you want to just, you know, don't want to do it, or you want to just overlook it, then it will remain in that form from year to year. To master plan, the most important thing is have a review of your layout, any new enclosures you want to put, any arrangement of animals that you have you want to change for some reason or the other because you are finding some difficulty. So bring that all out, do a review with all your staff that you have in the zoo. And then finally, if you want to revise it, it's not very difficult. You just give the reasons why you want to revise it, send it to the CZ and CZ it doesn't take much time. You know, we know very well that we had already approved one. These are the changes that you want now and th there won't be any issue with that. So you have to do all this and master planning, no master plan, they have done any predictions. How many washrooms you should have, there is a formula for that. If you want, I can give it to you. If anybody is writing the master plan, there is a formula. Depending on the footfall, how many washrooms you require, how many ticketing counters you require, how, how, what catering you require, aggregation of facilities, which should be there, you know, so pe people can uh, definitely access those facilities. All that is there. The circulation, where there are traffic jams, in Mysore Zoo, especially, you know, especially starting from that bird area, any day you find that there are more than at least 800, 900 people in that small 100 meters, this thing. At any time, uh, there could be some panic or something, and there could be uh, a lot of problems for there. there. So you have to be very careful uh, what is the visitor flow in, in the entire area. D at different point of time, your animal keeper standing on the, this thing can also write. That at four, this thing, I just came out and I counted that on this main road and this patch, there were so many people, just roughly. So that will give you an idea throughout the day how, how visitors are moving into your area. So you need to do that. Next. So resource sustainability, there are easy issues. Mysore has done a lot of work on that. And Indoor Zoo is another which are uh, in the forefront, uh, having... Uh, Biogas plant, biocomposting, waste disposal is proper. Then uh, having those all the plastic being screened, that is there in all the zoos. And other things that they can do is use of BOVs, you know, for uh, energy efficiency and also low carbon footprint and also uh, having cycles uh, in, your, in your zoo. So these are certain things that you do. Then water harvesting that has been done in Arigna Anna Zoological Park because uh, they have problems. Uh, they have uh, problems of uh, getting water, uh, and that's why they need to recharge the aquifers. Next, use of technology. In fact, from information cuisine to digital signage, specialized technology and mobile apps, social media platforms, interactive website, virtual zoo experience, online interaction. You, if you have a web page, you can have online interaction, online help. Online chat, you can even think of that. Digital technology for pre-visit orientation of visitors. Only Hyderabad Zoo and uh, Nandan Kanan Zoo and maybe one or two zoos have this pre-visit orientation. Before the zoo, before the people enter the zoo, they should pass through your, maybe your interpretation center. Because if you see, we had an interpretation in Chennai and the footfall in the interpretation center was just in a month in a month, 200 people, 100 people, that was all. When there are live animals there, good exhibits over there, why should go? people should go and see your interpretation center and read that? At home in the National Geographic channel and so many channels, they get all information that they want. So similar kind of information, if, if they're waiting for someone, they will go there. 
so what, what you need to do is send these people through the interpretation center with a small three minutes or four minutes on zoo ethics you can and and then this pre-visit orientation has to be done what they should not do in the zoo you must tell them very clearly and also keep in mind that uh, we have cctvs uh, and if you are uh, if you are caught then this would be the fine so all that you could uh, tell them then uh, visitor facilitation including entry having all the locker uh, lockers wheelchairs perambulators baby feeding rooms all this information uh, has to be given to them uh, when they are entering there could be a baby feeding room but that is one kilometer away so you must tell them that next the washroom would be are located here the baby feeding room is here so they can have access to it and there are several digital softwares which can be uh, used uh, for our office operations in the zoo uh, because uh, uh, it basically data only is not uh, it doesn't go up anywhere it remains with the zoo director so uh, and you can do a lot of monitoring using those uh, digital softwares and management information systems uh, and then you can have animated animal conservation shows uh, in fact uh, ppp model is the best what chadbi zoo has done other zoo should do the same thing don't spend money on that even arigna anna has done that they have got two two of these uh, pre this animated animal conservation shows that they are doing and then further you could think of using a wristband with RFID technology to monitor how the visitors are going and where they are going and even uh, entry to for some special encroachers can be given through that RFID technology band that they will have on the several kinds of audiovisual devices. I saw in Nandan Kanan that uh, uh, they have uh, 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 a few, I don't know, a smartphone uh, application is you either type out the number of the enclosure and then you can get all the information photographs about that animal in a very short span of time so you can do that so that is very easy to do and not a this thing uh, next so zoo entrance frontage is very important because for financial sustainability you have to market your zoo and the best thing that you can do anybody who sees it from outside or whenever this zoo is shown in the television uh, uh, to the people you know uh, at, at, at local attraction tea, tourist spots in the city then they definitely will have a this thing that they should visit this zoo. aesthetic appeal visual branding exciting immersive entry portal highlights conservation theme so all that could come in with the zoo entrance then having this 4D shows and other things for which you can charge money from them. Car parking, you can charge money from, for, from them. It's not that uh, thing. You can have walking tools for bird watchers. So have a trail. In fact, most of the zoos have got some pond or some area. Develop, have a vegetation type, Eastern Ghats vegetation or Western Ghats vegetation. And then have a trail there running through the trail and have a guide to inform them or have interpretive signages to show people that uh, this thing. Next. Food, beverages, branding, marketing, media campaigns. In fact, no, except for Mysore, I don't think so. Any zoo is doing any media campaign uh, or developing some promotional content and uh, and uh, giving it to a uh, uh, lot of people, you know, and especially to uh, to to the tourism uh, and uh, uh, to the tourism boards over there, or uh, they, they are doing it. Souvenir shops, food facilities. Souvenir shop. If you keep it away from the exit gate of the zoo, nobody will go. If it is close to the exit gate, then only people will enter the, this thing. So just because it is not strategically lo located, it is 500 meters and people are tired. So they will not go. So some zoos, you have to go through the souvenir shop to exit. So that is uh, very important if you want to sell souvenirs. Uh, and then next is uh, adopt an animal program that already we have talked about. And uh, this PPP mode, uh, in fact, uh, 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 Chhatbi Zoo, Mysore Zoo and also Arignar Anna, the people who have done this work for them, they must share their numbers and uh, maybe their website uh, so that other zoos can at least read that material and then they will try to find out in their city is there anyone who could uh, then uh, this thing and also tell them how much it, it costs because you don't know 
how much money is required so you can also do that next evaluation of the zoos uh, we will be listening normally the CZA conducts evaluation based on the recognition of zoo rules that is a general kind of a evaluation it is not a very deep evaluation and uh, uh, but the evaluation that we have in the MEE, it goes really very deep into every aspects, and that's, that's why uh, from the planning aspects to the actual implementation. So it is a discrete, holistic, and independent exercise, and these are the benefits. Now we can put up that. Huh? Next. ME, the format. I think I haven't taken much time. No? 20 minutes only. No? In fact, uh, at least 70, 80 percent of our colleagues here, uh, they have seen this format and during evaluation also it has been discussed in great length. But why I am going through this again and running through this again is because uh, there has been zoos, in fact, some zoos uh, who have got only 30 percent marks. That means there is nothing over there and some who have got 60 to 70 percent marks, but they are still this thing. Either they are weak in documenting so or, or they are weak in actual implementation in the field. So implementation by and large for most of the zoos, it is all okay. Work that they are doing in the field, everything is there, but then if you, they don't have documents, there are so many things. It, it's a, uh, beyond uh, the zoo rules, this goes. Even climate change, there is a question. So, and, and for that, it is very clear. If you see the explanatory note and reference documents, you will get a clear idea that what we want. Now, if the mission vision has not been framed correctly, what should be your mission? What should be your vision? Do a review for yourself. When we did, did the zoo vision plan, it took us two days and three days to find, to finalize the, what is the vision? Three lines. To write those three lines, it took us three days. And uh, we sat for more than, I think, three, four hours just discussing about that. Transformation, leading cutting edge technology, all that. It took us three days to finalize that. And in a zoo, you must not uh, sit together. Have a look at the mission, vision plans of other zoos, which are better zoos, who have done their documenting properly. See what exactly, then try to see that what is your mission, vision, what it should be. And the CZA guidelines also there is a there is a uh, reference to the vision mission and written very clearly how you have to frame the vision and mission. So if you are not reading the CZA guidelines and if you are not referring to other good documents, best pra be best phrased vision and mission of the zoos, then you can frame your own one depending on what kind of zoo you want to be a specialized zoo. You want to keep regional animals. You want to keep animals uh, from all over the country, not in the, in the region. So you could do that next. These are statutory and guidelines, apart from the FCA clearance, which is not required now. Approved master plan, health advisory committee. Most zoos don't have a health advisory committee. At least 80% of them don't, don't have a health advisory committee. Health advisory committee, and if they had a health advisory committee, it has not been reconstituted. The term has expired, so it has not been reconstituted. You have to be uh, clear about that next. Most zoos have not submitted annual reports. Most zoos have not submitted their quarterly reports. So all that matters, you know. The next is uh, landscape and environment. Landscape plan should be there in your master plan. Most of the zoos have a horticulture plan, two paras, just two paras, and that is just nothing. That's not a landscape plan. So you should think what a landscape plan should be. First is the existing vegetation that is there the blank areas which you want to improve further, the immersion effect that you want to bring in that zoo. So all those details should come into a landscape plan. Maybe at some point of time, uh, we, we, I can sit down or maybe with the CZA, uh, have a look at the format for uh, writing the master plan. And based on that, uh, maybe uh, give you some more information, uh, work out the contents and structure of the landscape plan so that some zoos who, have, who still don't have an idea how to write a landscape plan, they can do a landscape plan. Next. Periodically updated. 
you had a plan for say how many years 10 years and eight years have lapsed and you have not even talked about any updation that means it has been stagnating and definitely there have been some changes so you must write to CZA even if you have written to CZA that you want to change that is good enough at least you have reviewed it normally you should review it after five years after five years review your plan if you have not done it then this is uh, you're going to have problems in this uh, indicator next This is relevant plan for conservation education. Look at the plan of the CEE, Central Environmental Education, Ahmedabad. Plus, think about it that you have a plan, structure it very carefully, target group, starting from the target group, and then holding programs for them, customized programs for them. Next. Next. There's a, has the zoo formulated disaster management strategy? Most master plan, they have written theory. Kahin se theory leya hai. Wo theory likh di ki kya disaster hota hai, kya hota hai, us pe explain kar diya. Zoo pe aai nahi. Jab zoo ka number aaya to wahan khatam ho gaya was. That is the last line. So you have to now then say in your zoo, in your zoo, what are the vulnerable areas where people could reach the boundaries of the zoo, how many people are required, how those people are rotated, what is the supervision and control that you have as far as the security plan and uh, disaster management plan is concerned. Have you done drills? That is most important. Have you done drills? Most zoo said, yes, we have done it. I said, do you have a letter from the director that a meeting for this drill will be done and you have to assemble? No letter. Have you done our minutes? Minutes, hai? minutes, we nahi hai. So, fir isme kya hoga? Kuch nahi hoga. So, that's why you are not being able to score on this. Next. Conservation breeding program also. It has to be as per the conservation breeding plan. You should have skilled manpower of exhibit proper location, layout all approved by CZA. Enrichments, a founder stock. So if you, if you don't have a, a, a conservation breeding plan, then you won't be writing anything about founder stock, demographic and population management, behavioral management, nutrition, healthcare, record keeping. All that should be there. And there is a format for this conservation breeding plan. Please have a look at it. And whatever is written in that plan is not the last word. You can add more to it because this was devised more than 15 years back. Next. Resources is okay, uh, that all zoos would be having. Additional resources also, we have talked about it, CSR and other things. Capacity building also is another thing. Capacity building also, you should have some kind of a plan for that. How many keepers training that you're going to hold? What is going to be the syllabus? At least generally writing what is going to be the syllabus, resource persons list. What would be the duration? whether all animal keepers would be covered in the first one, second one would be, or para, uh, para veterinary staff that are there, third for the re rescue team that you have in the zoo. So all that has to be structured. All functions that are there in the zoo, you must have a capacity building plan written very clearly. Just saying that training is good and we'll conduct three training, that's not enough. Next. So manpower, most of the zoos, uh, uh, there's just a veterinary doctor and nobody else to help him. Uh, and uh, whenever he requires, he calls somebody, you know, who is untrained. So that is also happening. So why can't you train somebody? I, I can understand it's a small zoo and you don't have so many medical emergencies or uh, uh, you have less number of animals, so that much is not required. But at least train those people, the per person who, who are there. So all this has, uh, has to be there. Next. So, logistic and material support also for zoo animal medicine. Next. That is basically the equipment that is required. Enforcement system to prevent nuisance and vandalism. This is basically the security staff that you have. And information on the vandalism that takes place. What are the different kind of vandalism that's likely to occur? What are the places where this could happen? and what kind of CCTV or other surveillance or security personnel you are deploying for that. Next. 
so enforcement plan is required next animal collection sustainably managed who does not house animals in natural social and demographic structure you have just a pair of them so you will you will you will, your thing will go down to fair or even require substantial improvement so what has been the growth of the population of different animals so probably a small this thing has to be made if there are so many animals we will be looking basically at the inventory and seeing from the inventory that how many births how many deaths and what has happened for each animal and we'll keep ticking ticking fair 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 and finally one or two may be very good so you, you are in fair so you have to be very careful i think this is a very difficult thing most zoos uh, if they have some animals which are not in a social group they don't have a good uh, demographic uh, population uh, so they will have to acquire animals and acquisition is not easy so they will remain with those animals but then at least they should make an effort next this is sustainable uh, management of resources without detriment to environment segregation of waste so segregation of waste you should show at least most of the zoo has got just one dustbin except i think nandan kanan i saw that today there were three so they have just one dustbin so you don't segregate your uh, this thing uh, there is no drainage every enclosure the water through a drain goes to a soak pit that also is not a pakka soak pit not covered they don't have a central system for treating all the waste and it could be simply a oxidation pond for that matter if you can't do that then there are this thing at least you must have enough water to flush out all the all the fecal material that are there because all the fecal and all the bones you are removing separately so at least you should have that or you should have a sewage treatment plant a very small plant which is there in indore probably you can set up don't go for a very big one uh, the one that they have in indore there was a sewage treatment plant in uh, in trivandrum zoo but there is no, it's not working not functional overflowing chatbi sewage also they don't have next there are several zoos who don't have but this is where uh, i could immediately remember next so this is about health uh, this is about stakeholders participation so if there is stakeholder participation then you should have issued a letter called the stakeholders issued a minutes and if you have not done that simply having a stakeholders list and for some what purpose the volunteers are also your st stakeholders people who are in the transport thing who, are, who you have a uh, you have leased it out to somebody that also you have to call them you have to issue some advices to them some guidelines to them and hold meetings with them uh, uh, regularly so all that stakeholders uh, this thing then you have people uh, who uh, are from educational institutions who want to you know just come there uh, and uh, be with you for a day or uh, they want to attend a program so all that people could be called feedback also is is required in this school college veterinary this thing next this is about uh, health care preventive medicine protocol quarantine quarantine is there but it is covered with weeds last animal they don't have a register showing what was the last animal that was quarantined bole kaha hai doctor ke paas hai doctor kaha hai so quarantine is there not used or it is dysfunctional so all that is there pathogen surveillance what kind of surveillance you are doing there should be some kind of a a, a calendar for that infectious disease screening you you must call the veterinary university and the students from there uh, who are there and uh, do some kind of a primate disease screening tell them very clearly we are having these issue please take these samples review of diets diets was fixed 10 years back after that not reviewed even once so review of diets is also important husbandry techniques vermin control medical record keeping all that will come in this next uh, zoo animal behavior expression of natural behavior pattern and minimize fear and distress so all that what you need to do is what do you have a husbandry practice manual for species uh, 
where, whether you are uh, having checks on uh, enclosure quality, where you are doing some observation on behavioral aspects of animal and stress level, vegetation screening, visitors proximity, all that will be this thing. So all these things one by one we'll be ticking and there are 50% ticked, that means you will get uh, 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 fair, more than 50% will go to good. Next. Zoo commissioner stock for animal feed and supplies. Uh, we have always said that all the feed should not be kept on the floor. There are CZA guidelines on that. Several zoos are keeping everything on the floor. Even all the sacks, everything are on the floor. The vegetables are on the floor. There is no drainage. There is no system of washing and this thing. They, they will have one uh, big uh, washing utensils which they will take out and do that. So th that's a very simple thing. Just think about the kitchen, that modular kitchen that you have at your home. A similar thing that you have to follow here in a larger scale. Next. Species specific enrichment. Now enrichment is just not writing the theory part. Enrichment means that you should have a enclosure enrichment plan and rotation. Summer and winter, whatever you like to do, and it should not be very sketchy. So once you have an enclosure enrichment plan, then this plan and the work that you have done here, we are going to see it in the field as well. Simply having this plan and not executing in the field is of no use actually. Next. Innovative technologies that you are using. I, we have listed out all the technologies which are there from sprinkler, water blasters, uh, then uh, research tools available, uh, then touch screens, keeper stock, signages, all that has to be seen, you know. So once we see all this, you know, it's a big, very big list. And based on this, only assessment will be done. Next. Rescue facility, I've already spoken about that. What should be? Research and collaboration, our research plan. Uh, uh, have, have a look at our research plan of some institute organization. And then based on that, you can also think of, you know, borrow something from there, learn something from there, and prepare your own research plan and get institutions and organizations to, you know, to, uh, to, to collaborate with you. Next. Quick. This is hygiene, basically. The cleanliness that you find in the in your uh, especially night shelters and in your paddock area which can be visible very clearly and you have to take out animal keepers handlers hygiene gloves nobody is using uses of suitable disinfectants not disinfected for several months though they have a list and theory everything is there but they don't have stock you look at the store register inventory of stock of disinfectants there is nothing there so if they were, it was not there then how could we have disinfected? Then uh, post-mortem rooms, carcass, all that, feed waste, portable water, food bath, tire bath, bush clearance, disinfection of water containers, feeding platforms, suitable fly control, all that should go into this, you know. So these are all the things, you know, which we would be seeing. Next. Data based on animal population dynamics. So when we talk about this database, you will have to look at what are the specimen records that you need to keep, veterinary records that you need to keep, treatment sheet, treatment card, stud book details, stud book of animal details. If you have few animals like LTM, then the LTM stud book is there. From the stud book, you can at least incorporate all the data and information into that stud book. It's very simple. Nothing much has to be done. Next. Animal keepers, ethical standards and norms. So all relevant current legislation, including animal collection plan, choice of species, acquisition of wild caught rescued animal, whether you have followed procedure or not. These are all ethical standards. Restraint or isolation for collection of fecal samples, how many you have done. Animal for reintroduction, inbreeding, genetic management, linking in C2, XC2, compatible mixed species exist, pinioning of birds, public contacts with animals. Touch, pool, snake encounters, children, zoo, keepers, contact with animals, unethical breeding of animals, display of sick animals, quarantine. Question paper is very big. So, but if you have a little bit of a note, you will manage to 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 man
two animal keepers and their knowledge. This is where we have uh, this thing on information on that. Animal keepers diary that we are going to look at to find out what exactly they are doing. Their training, we are going to ask them, or we are going to ask you, you know, how many animal keepers are trained for how many days, what was the syllabus. So you need to keep all those records with you. Next. Do veterinary supporting staff all the work that they are doing on veterinary healthcare? You will have to see all this that is required prophylactic measures, hygiene of staff, how many animals quarantined, all that information would come into this. Next, respond to emergencies, disaster. So, I have already talked to you about the uh, disaster management plan. That was the plan part. This is the execution part. Secure, uh, have you done a, a, a security audit? Next. What is a security audit? Just calling all the people, rangers, others involved with the enforcement and security. Talking to them, what are the issues? Did they, was there any vandalism? What, they, what you did if there was, how could you prevent it? All this is once in a while you have to do that and maintain a record of that in a register. Next. Physically and behaviorally genetic animals. That's another very difficult one. Just one before. Does the zoo maintain healthy, physically, behaviorally, and genetically this thing animals? So maintain healthy animals. So you'll have to look at this. Social grouping will give you if they are healthy animals, sex ratio, stereotypes, then obesity, over grooming, self mutilation, paddock area utilization, all that. Is go into this next. This is about conservation breeding. We have had a uh, lot of inputs on this, so you know it very clearly what is has to be done. Next. This is veterinary resource development is basically educate opportunity for training of veterinary personnel. Next. Zoo education and outreach, what has been, whether it's been able to enhance visitor learning experience, very difficult question, very difficult to assess. So we'll have to find out number of educational programs, keepers talks, guided to that has been done, interactive displays and interpretation center, literature provided at the zoo entrance, distribution of resource material, which will go into whether you've been able to, you know, uh, uh, enhance the visitor learning experience of people who are coming there. Next. Research and have you used that research for anything that you have done in the zoo? Next. Climate change and prevent carbon loss. You can add on something more to it. Planting of trees, sustainable use of energy, water supply, waste management, eco-friendly travel, transport, procurement by sourcing local products, other innovative mechanism to reduce carbon footprints and the documentation. So this is a, a, a question which is there in, in PAs and also wildlife sanctuaries and national park. Next. These are about all innovative techniques that you would be following in the zoo. This is outcomes basically. And what has been the result of that? You could save energy, this thing. You could save what your water bill came down. Your energy bill came down. So all that would come into this using of these techniques. You've been able to achieve something. Next. I think that's the last one. So I am sure if there are any questions, you know, I would quickly just one or two. Sir, I have some observations, sir. And not exactly what you have told is uh, it may be right on the book. This kind of narration we used to heard and used to see for FCA Act during the late period of 80 and early period of uh, 90s. So at that time also used to boast ki, uh, we have made these rules, we have made so many formats and we have made so many compulsions and they were DFOs at other locations and unless uh, until you didn't follow this, your uh, forest land will not be diverted. So by going through this, uh, all these uh, evaluation sheet, 
आई डोंट थिंक इज इट प्रैक्टिकली पॉसिबल ऐसा ना हो दोबारा एक जैसे एफ सी ए के ऊपर एफ आर आई जस्ट 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 आई जस्ट कम्प्लीट सर जैसे टू ओवर कम द एफ सी ए एफ आर आई वॉज पास इन द टू थाउजेंड सिक्स ड्यूरिंग एट द टाइम ऑल्सो एट द फील्ड लेवल वी यूज टू रिक्वेस्ट द डेली पीपल सर डोंट मेक सो स्ट्रिंजेंट लॉस फॉर द एफ सी ए बट स्टिल वी हैज टू हैव ए हंड्रेड टू हंड्रेड पेज डॉक्यूमेंटेशन जस्ट टू डाइवर्ट वन हेक्टर लैंड सो सिमिलरली इफ यू गो टू दू हिस्ट्री जू वॉज द नेवर एक सेंट्रल आइडिया फॉर द फॉरेस्ट डिपार्टमेंट इट वॉज ओनली एन एजुकेशन टूल फॉर द अर्बन बॉडीज इट वॉज एन एंटरटेनमेंट टूल फॉर द अर्बन बॉडीज फॉरेस्ट डिपार्टमेंट नेवर थॉट दैट जू शुड बी देर Except the iconic Jews. Even if you go to Mysore Zoo, it was established by Raja. It was not established by Forest Department. If you come to Baroda, it was established by Sayaji King, not by the Forest Department. So now we have started. Suddenly we are claiming we established from authority and we started claiming we want this kind of rules. We want this kind of so. Aisa na ho, aisa na ho ki kal. Ha sir, it is too much. Aisa na ho to overcome the FCA. FR has now passed. So I said, now okay, tomorrow and even if you go to the market, the exotic bird bazaar is big. Nobody bothered for those those birds, and they are already becoming a my entertainment and aesthetic value in my drawing room. So government may not think it, but suddenly, tomorrow, he said, "Let's go. Let's 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 go. Let stakeholder so it is a up you have included all kind of stakeholder kisko padi hai ki wo mere jho mein aake mere sath participate karke what they are going to achieve sir sir just just sir second drainage ka sir when the nagar palikas are struggling to dispose of their waste how can you expect us to fit into a cpt Huh? How much it requires, sir? How much amount it is required? And third, you have now said that genetically well-behaved and well behaved and naturally well behaved animal. So how can I, as a, as an officer, how can I fulfill your requirement that by this is genetically well behaved animal? Sir, stud book, sir. If you go to horse farm, you just see the stud book. It is highly impossible, sir. Start book to maintain for a Jew officer. Up, up, up. You, you, you go to any horse farming. It is very tough, sir. And you technically it requires, sir. Uh, sir, this is same as the working plan. for the many of the divisions because the dfos they never read only the officer who makes a working plan he only goes through the working plan so same is with the stud book many people even in our department they don't know that there are stud book available for many of the species so that is the issue sir So yeah. Sir, वैसे भी the role of CZD is to assist the zoo in scientific management. If we are not doing that, then it doesn't serve the purpose. Uh, sir, maybe I, I just want to add a few things. uh this was done for the first time this management effectiveness evaluation if you see this we have been doing for the tiger reserves this was done last year that was the fifth cycle that is started in 2006 after the panna and sariska debacle when the sts special task force was uh, instituted and that also recommended the way of scientific management in the tiger reserves so this is one way of evaluating like where we are heading as such if you don't have any parameter if you see there are six elements 
I don't think that everybody will score 100. Like yesterday, the Honorable Minister just pointed out a few ranked at 30 and few scored above 80. So it doesn't mean that every, all the elements, there are six elements and 40 indicators. And out of 400, you have to, so what we can do is, these are, we are looking at or striving for, these are the indicators and we ourselves can do a sort of self-assessment just to see like where do we stand. It doesn't mean that these, I mean, these are absolute. And this also may be uh, improved in the coming years. This was the first time it has been done. And probably this is the global first. In none of the zoo in, ever, in any part of the world, this sort of assessment has been done. And uh, it has got a very scientific uh, basis and with very uh, meticulously and with a, a group of experts, the entire this uh, method of assessment or evaluation was devised. So my request is like, you all just go through the document would be shared and there are you that you will find the, all the elements like a starting from context planning input process output and outcome there are 40 L, uh, different indicators and uh, all these six elements depending on their importance they have been given different weightage you just do a sort of self as assessment on the basis of that and look into where are the gaps. It doesn't mean that some of the zoo who have ranked down, I was really surprised. I asked, uh, I mean, uh, in Shatabir Jew, I found it is ranking quite low, but I saw that they are doing good work. But means that probably the documentation part may be missing or at the time of evaluation, you cannot substantiate what the work you are doing with the documents. So that is important when the evaluation is done. Same happens. I come from Madhya Pradesh. I have seen that Panna has done wonders in tiger management, but the rank, they rank very low just because the documentation part is very, very poor. So that is also very important. Not only you are doing very good work, but every document has to be there and in place in a proper way. I think, I think right. to... uh, so we can you take this up during the break because we're just running a little short on time. Uh, we now move on to the experience sharing by Zoo. So we, I now invite Mr. Anil Kumar, who is the officer in charge of uh, Zoological Garden Tiruvananthapuram, to present uh, on the conservation breeding programs in the zoo. Good afternoon to everyone. So I'll just finish it off as asked by them. I'll just finish it off in another five minutes. So as you all know, see this Tirubandaram Zoo is one of the uh, oldest zoos in the country. It was started in 1857. And it is uh, actually under uh, museum and zoo department coming under cultural affairs. Because we have, along with the zoos, we have museums in our compound. See, when people can see uh, the zoo, aquarium, then we have a very big botanical garden. Along with that, we have a beautiful natural history museum, art museum, and we have this art gallery. So regarding conservation breeding pro program, See, we are a part of uh, conservation breeding of this uh, lion tail macaque. We are part of, uh, we are the participating zoo along with uh, Mysore and Wandalur Zoo. This is our enclosure for LTM. And this is the, uh, it's animal house. And see, we have done uh, required enrichments there. You can see our enclosure. It is a motored one, open enclosure. So this is the conservation breeding center proposed by uh, Central Zoo Authority. And this is the animal house. These are the details of birth of LTM since uh, 2003. And this is the present population of uh, lion tail macaque. And the main constraints we are, uh, because it is in the heart of the city, there is a lack of space. Uh, we don't have lack of, uh, there's a lack of breeding pairs. And for uh, conservation breeding, you see, we have given a proposal to seize a day, and we need some financial aid from Central Zoo Authority in that respect. 
and see actually there is a coordinating zoo and we two participating zoos are there and uh, i don't think there is a coordination between all these three zoos so we need uh, the assistance from uh, technical assistance from this wandalur zoo uh, so that we also can be a part of the thing i don't uh, i think we three zoos should go hand in hand share our ideas sit together and we should make a this one conservation breeding plan i think each zoo rather than making individual conservation breeding plan it is better we three sit together share uh, see we can share our uh, species we can get uh, some species from wild in such a way that see we should uh, go th th these three zoos should go hand in hand and we sh then only we can make it a success uh, then only it will become a success story thank you Thank you, sir, for giving an overview of your uh, of the conservation breeding program at your zoo. I now invite Dr. Manoj Nair, director Nandan Kanan Zoological Park, to share his experience in the zoo. Uh, very good afternoon. I'll also not take much time at all because you know you've come to Nandan Kanan, you've seen the zoo. And there will be a couple of very short movies also that's going to get released. Movies as in small clips that are going to get released. So, uh, Narasimha, can I have the PPT, please? Yeah. Okay. Just next one. I think you can just skip it. Uh, this was, I think, a lot of zoos have spoken about their vision plan and uh, vision plan as per CCD and how we plan to achieve it. We have also done an exercise, but because of a paucity of time, I shall not uh, dwell too much upon it because you've already seen the zoo and what we have done. Uh, can I have the next slide? Okay, so these are some uh, general issues which I have felt as somebody who has been associated with uh, extra conservation and zoos for a, a very long time. Uh, these are some thoughts that I'm just just uh, throwing out. It's like thinking out aloud so that, you know, we may in, in, in times to come uh, ponder upon it and, uh, and think how we can uh, sort these things out. Animal exchanges are actually... Uh, 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 quite a bit of a uh, concern in many places. So I think we should try and uh, uh, think about ways where we can actually look at it in a much more comprehensive manner and sort out uh, that uh, these issues. A lot of places, I mean, purchase is technically not allowed as all, as any of us, as all of us know. But there are other ways in which Sue circumvent this problem by other ways. So there is nothing which prevents us from taking a very close look at it and taking a policy. There are a lot of non-native species which we can try and uh, uh, bring in. And we have many, we have enough funds also for that because some of the charismatic species are also very important. Enclosure specifications, when we try to empanel, uh, uh, empanel some agencies, it will be very helpful for the zoos if they're already empaneled or accepted by Central Zoo Authority, or no, at least a panel. It will be really helpful for us, particularly from states and getting sanctions and so on. And there are a lot of uh, potential adoption of new uh, uh, practices that can be uh, followed. Because, you know, if you go to many zoos abroad, there are very, very innovative uh, uh, things that are happening, including various kinds of animal and bird shows. And I'm not saying that this should be done. Because, you know, we have uh, a plethora of laws and we are not short on laws at all in our country. So the Animal Rights Board might have a completely different idea. But what I'm thinking is that we need to think about these things. Uh, business models, there are a lot of models that have already been discussed. So I'll, I shall not go uh, too much into it. Uh, issue of this rescued animal, seized animals is, a, is, is really a, a big issue. Particularly, there is a recent spurt for those of you who are interested in wildlife trade, you would realize that in the last about two years, a huge part of rescued animals. So this is something, sir, we, we can also take a call as to what to do about this. Even species identification are becoming difficult because a lot of hybridized animals are coming into the country from various places. Uh, sir, it will be nice if we can have a compendium of good practices. Not that we are not having. CSD has got one of the best set of publications that any, any agency has, uh, has done. But some of the recent practices, if it can be compiled so that it can act as a very good source book for other zoos as well. Indian Zoo Director's yearbook is something, it's a long-standing institution and Nandan Kanan has had a very major role to play in that. I think we should also, last year it was released of course, but uh, after a very long gap. I think this also can be done in a, uh, we, we can think about it so that it, it's a, and uh, young zoo directors and everybody should be actively encouraged to publish in that. With a little bit of editorial help, help I think it, it, is, it is very much achievable. Uh, 
I have a feeling that we should have a close look at the a conservation breeding program as it is and revisit the entire list actually. For instance, there are a lot of technical issues uh, that are involved. I shall not go too much into the detail. And uh, uh, some, I think Ajit or somebody was mentioning about the issue of pendency of approvals. I'm very sure that uh, Central Zoo Authority tries its very best to look at plans and even they're so accommodating in the sense that even master plan in toto is not required. You approve the uh, layout plan and even then it's fine. But uh, other things also uh, like uh, issues, uh, we can actually directly get in touch with you and to the extent possible, sir, it can be facilitated. Just a submission from my side. And I think, sir, the earlier there used to be a, a, a concrete mechanism of exposure visits, which used to happen specifically to best zoos abroad. Now that we have twinned the zoos, zoos it should not be a problem. But I think Chester Zoo, a lot of uh, with Jersey Zoo also, sir, Darrell Wildlife Preservation Trust used to have short courses of several weeks. Earlier it was a six month course, later it was short courses. I think this can also be reinstated again so that youngsters and not only just zoo directors or uh, deputy directors, even vets and curators can go and attend this problem. As they say, seeing is believing. So these are just few points which I thought uh, I should uh, emphasize. And uh, as you know, uh, the host zoo or the host director and deputy director never gets to participate in the <laughs> sessions, but it's not, it's a, it's a constraint that is always there. So I'm very sorry that I've, I've not been able to interact with many of you personally, but I all my entire uh, gratitude to each one of you from other zoos uh, that uh, you have come here and attended the program and to see today of course uh, sterling support and guidance by every uh, single member we will have a formal vote of thanks of course but i just thought that i should mention uh, this at this point of time and our team has been just absolutely superb uh, and i should i should really thank each one of them next uh, next please and uh, seeing nandankan is a very old zoo uh, it, it is a very layered zoo. It's a very, uh, very uh, historic zoo in, in, in many senses, in more ways than one. And, you know, I, I, I always feel that, you know, we stand on the shoulder of giants, actually. We've always done that. And I take this opportunity to, to place on record our deep gratitude and, uh, you know, heartfelt thanks to specifically to two people, Dr. Ellen Acharya. I don't know how many of you are, how, how many of you have heard about him. I mean, his publications run to actually a couple of volumes. And so is Dr. And so is S.K. Patnaik, sir. He has been a guiding light uh, for not only many of you, but specifically to Nandan Kanan. And it's it's a great privilege that we have him here. Sir, a standing ovation to Patnaik, sir. So it is really a honor, sir, that we have you here. And I thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And also, I, I place on record uh, our gratitude to all previous zoo directors, deputy directors, and all our staff of Nanakaran, right up to the animal, anim animal keepers and the staff. I don't think I'll go further uh, uh, about uh, further on about Nanakaran. Please do visit us again anytime in more, uh, what you call it, uh, in a relaxed manner. Please come with your families. We'll be more than happy to host you. Uh, with these words, I, I uh, again, with uh, my heartfelt uh, thanks, offer you everybody uh, our deepest regards, and I hope you all go, go back safely uh, to your respective places. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Manoj. And we have one last presentation for this technical session. So may I invite uh, Mr. Sunil Pawar, the director of Manir Ghatta Biological Park, to share his experience on the zoo. And I, in the meantime, would also like to tell you that on behalf of the Central Zoo Authority and the Nandan Kanan Zoological Park, a small memento of gratitude is going to be circulated while this is going to happen. Good evening to all the seniors and friends. Uh, I will just skip the parts because um, most of the things are similar to what other Jews are doing in terms of education programs. But one uh, new thing which we have started, I want to bring to your notice and the other is, please, can you move that? The, please, next. Keep on. One thing is that uh, Banagatta is a fairly large Jew and that explains why uh, we are able to get actually good CSR funding. and. Of course, uh, I mean, in terms of Ajit has a lot to offer uh, in that direction. He has a very good experience in Mysurju. He has tapped CSR funding. And in uh, in uh, Banagatta Biological Park also, around 1.5 crores last year. And then uh, this is in cash. And then apart from that, around 3 to 4 crore rupees worth of work we were able to get inside. Mainly 
in terms of uh, desilting the ponds and uh, providing rain harvesting structures. So these were then, and then one of the component which helps there is, I mean, actively meeting people, going scouting for funds, and the second is that making it possible, uh, making it uh, a very small components also we should accept. For example, we have a one day feeding program. So we accept even for one day. So if someone wants to feed a langur for one day, we have some, uh, we take some amount and take it. And that itself has generated around 18 to 20 lakh rupees. So this is one part of it. Next. Second is about the blind students. I have seen uh, uh, Chennai is doing uh, tremendous work and uh, Wajid Ali Shah, they have also got Braille uh, either early. We also try to do some uh, similar programs for that. So they, uh, please uh, come to the last two, three slides. So once while on the rounds, we keep on hearing people talking about whether we feed the animals properly or not. So this is one question which a general public who comes there, they always have in their mind. So we thought, let us show to people what we are feeding. And then we have made a animal feed display unit. So we have a, please move, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the feed chart is there, next. Then also you see there, so we have for each animal what we are feeding, we have put in resins, we have in-house uh, uh, created these kind of resins and we put there. Apart from that, daily, whatever is happening, the food inspection as well as cooking, videos are recorded and shown there. So this, this really helps. Actually, people, we know we are giving best quality food. We know that. So why not showcase to it, uh, people? And they see it and really they feel happy. And it itself has become like a display. So this is one thing which we can, uh, I mean, uh, attempt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Sunil. And uh, now we open the forum for discussion. So in case there are any questions for any of the speakers today, so please. Uh, just one, uh, one small uh, information for all of you. Uh, in the Kevadia conference, probably it was uh, deliberated like uh, uh, the zoo can also associate uh, uh, with uh, in uh, probably an AB scheme, the Nagarvan uh, Yojana, uh, wherein the zoo itself we can, because just because you maintain almost more than 30% of the area is green area. So the Nagarvan Yojana is scheme that can be added up to uh, uh, your uh, mass, uh, the schemes of uh, making green in the uh, zoo area. So the uh, activities which can be taken up are in the terms of like biodiversity park or nakshatra park or butterfly garden. Just because the area is enclosed, so you may not be uh, spending on the fencing as such, but that amount can be used in greening up the area or the, uh, the uh, vacant area. And the, uh, earlier the provision was that probably you have to take up more than 10 hectares of area, but now the it has been reduced to one hectare. So in, uh, you can take up any area above one hectare uh, in the Nagarvan Yojana. And uh, presently probably the norms are four lakh rupees per hectare. So for that, I'll request all of you to send the proposal through your state uh, forest department. And uh, uh, you may send the proposal directly to us. We'll make, uh, get it compiled and we'll send it to NAEB division. So I'll request all of you uh, to take up this activity uh, uh, in uh, most of the zoo if it is possible. Sir, I have uh, two, three submissions. Uh, one is regarding consortium. I wanted to give an example of uh, Karnataka. Uh, what we are doing in Karnataka is, you know, uh, major zoos like uh, Bannergata and Mysore, wherever, uh, whenever our uh, revenues uh, more than what we require for that year, we try to, yeah, it's, we try to support other upcoming zoos of Karnataka. You know, this is the brainchild of our member secretary, Sri Ravi BP, sir. In fact, last year during COVID time, uh, Bannergata gave around 10 crore to other zoos of Karnataka and we gave around uh, 5 crore to other zoos of Karnataka. Uh, so in that way, we can you know, grow together. This is one thing. Uh, we also provide other technical input and animal required for other zoos. That is how we are uh, following up. 
Second thing is uh, uh, this ME uh, exercise as such. It's a good thing that you know uh, we are uh, focused and we are uh, progressing in a particular direction, which is desired one. But regarding content, you know, content is a part of evaluation. So it is not necessary that we should be having each and every you know aspect of national zoo policy into our content. Every Jew should have its own, you know, uh, specific uh, content in its mission statement. And when it is already approved by the CJ day, it should not be again made a part of evaluation. So otherwise, what happens? Again, it is a very, very subjective for an evaluator. Today, I go, I find it. This is not correct. Tomorrow, someone else would come and say it is not correct. It should be like this. So it means what happens? Zoo director would end his tenure in writing master plan only. That shouldn't happen. So this is my submission. Uh, thank you. The vision, mission uh, of the zoo, you know, and the objectives. If you see the guidelines, it's very clearly. It's not going to be the same. If you are a Himalayan zoo, it will be going to be different. If you are down there, it's going to be different. And guidelines are there just like in working plan or TCP and all that. There are guidelines if you see that book. So it's not that we are saying that you can have your own objectives. Okay, fine. If there is something new you want to put in that, there is, there is no this thing that you have to stick to it. But that is only a guidelines for guidance. For those who uh, really don't know how to frame the vision, what should go? What is the difference between vision, vision and objective? That is one thing that you should think about it. What you should write in the vision. What should be there in the mission mission? You have to come to the mission and execution mode and what are the objectives and through strategies. These objectives have to be achieved and those strategies will be there in your master plan. So it's, it's quite simple as that all the objectives finally has to be achieved. So those are the things that we are going to see in your outcomes. Whatever objectives you feel the, the, the question in the outcomes are that basically what has been achieved. Output is what physically you have done. Physically, you may have done, but you may not have achieved the thing for some reason or the other. So I think it's very clear and uh, the ME is, uh, in fact, it's been thought out. We have had a lot of consultations and it's not that it's not achievable. Only you have to rise in your standard. Those who have got 45, 50, they should next year or uh, next evaluation, they should aim for 65. And at least documentation part you can complete. Have the strategy documentation, you can get 50, 40 percent marks immediately. The rest is all execution. If you are not doing rescue, you don't have a rescue facility, you don't have a conservation breeding plan. All zoos need not have. Those who have been given the uh, responsibility and assigned uh, as a coordinating zoo for a species, it's only those zoos coordinating and participating. Rest of them, if they are not doing this thing, the, the marks of conservation breeding and rescue will not be added. We have excluded the marks for what you are not doing, which is not there in your master plan, you are not going to be evaluated on that. And I, I'm sure uh, whatever is written there, there's nothing out of the, it's not out of the book syllabus. It's all there in your guidelines. Have a look at the scientific management of the zoos and it talks about all these things only. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's all the questions we will be able to take for now. Uh, when we just, are we having a video? Okay, and we'll also have a short video on the Greens Rescue and Rehabilitation Center. So that will play while the dice is being set for the valedictory fund. We have a uh, stand of such facilities. Can you play the sound also? Sound and light. Uh, 
जब शहर की दीवारें जंगल काटने लगती हैं, तो कभी इंसान जानवर का शिकार बनता है और कभी जानवर इंसान का थोड़ा समय पहले हमारा घर पर दिखा हमलो कह रहा था इना भाई माँ जी मैं डरी डरी जीवी हूँ निंदर नहीं हमने चिंता था हमारा छोकरा नहीं हमारा पशु पालन जब कभी भी फीडिंग की स्केरसिटी होती है उनके नेचुरल हैबिटेट में तो वो ह्यूमन हैबिटेशन की तरफ आ जाते हैं और उस केस में जो कॉन्फ्लिक्ट है वो देखने को मिलता है ऐसे ही उनके जब ब्रीडिंग सीजन होते हैं पर्टिकुलरली जो विंटर का सीजन होता है अपने यहाँ तो उसमें भी वो रोम करते हैं फॉर द सर्च ऑफ देयर मेट इस दौरान भी एज एन वैन जो हैबिटेट फ्रेगमेंटेड पॉकेट्स में जहाँ भी ह्यूमन हैबिटेशन है वो आ जाते हैं और वो कॉन्फ्लिक्ट में इन्वॉल्व हो जाते हैं ह्यूमंस और वाइल्ड के बढ़ते कॉन्फ्लिक्ट पूरे देश के लिए एक चिंता का विषय है ये ना सिर्फ इंसानों के लिए बल्कि जानवरों के लिए भी जानलेवा है कई जानवर घायल हो जाते हैं इलेक्ट्रिक शॉक्स या रोड एक्सीडेंट्स का शिकार हो जाते हैं और कई नवजात तेंदुए तो अपनी मां से अलग भी हो जाते हैं इस परिस्थिति को काबू में लाने के लिए सरकार के लिए इन तेंदुओं को रोकना बहुत जरूरी हो जाता है और इसका प्रयास सरकार कर भी रही है लेकिन हर महीने इन जानवरों की संख्या बढ़ने की वजह से सरकारी रेस्क्यू सेंटर्स में जगह और सुविधाएं दोनों की कमी हो जाती है ग्रीन जूलॉजिकल रेस्क्यू एंड रिहेबिलिटेशन सेंटर एक पहल है सरकार का हाथ बटाने की और इन जानवरों को रेस्क्यू करके उन्हें एक सुरक्षित घर देने की इस सेंटर को हमने आदरणीय प्राइम मिनिस्टर श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी के वाइल्ड लाइफ के प्रति उनका जो कमिटमेंट है उसको ध्यान में रखते हुए बनाया है काठियावाड़ के अनमोल रत्न जामनगर में बसा जी जेड आर आर सी अपने जैसा दुनिया का पहला रेस्क्यू सेंटर है हमारे सामने एक चुनौती थी कि हम रेस्क्यू जानवरों के लिए एक विश्व स्तरीय सेंटर बनाए हमने दुनिया के बेहतरीन रेस्क्यू सेंटर्स की रिसर्च की और इस फैसिलिटी को सिर्फ पांच महीने में खड़ा किया हमारा एक ही लक्ष्य है कि हम एक ऐसा रेस्क्यू सेंटर बनाए जिसपे देश को गर्व हो और जिससे पूरे दुनिया में हमारा परचम लहराए पूरे देश से इन लेपर्ड्स को रेस्क्यू करके वर्ल्ड क्लास एम्बुलेंस में डॉक्टर्स की स्पेशल टीम की निगरानी और देखरेख में यहां लाया जाता है
अभी तक साठ लेपर्ड्स को इस फैसिलिटी में लाया गया है हमारी सारी एनिमल वेलफेयर एक्टिविटीज वर्ल्ड की सबसे बड़ी संस्था वाजा वर्ल्ड एसोसिएशन ऑफ जूस के कंप्लाइंस में है जी जेड आर आर सी में लेपर्ड्स के बाड़ों को उनके नेचुरल हैबिटेट को ध्यान में रखते हुए बनाया गया है इनकी नाइट सेल्स को नियमित रूप से साफ किया जाता है और टेम्परेचर कंट्रोल किया जाता है एक्सपीरियंस बायोलॉजिस्ट की मदद से इनके बिहेवियर को स्टडी किया जाता है हम रोज जानवरों का निरीक्षण करते हैं उनमें कोई असामान्य प्रवृत्ति तो नहीं है इसके बारे में हम लोग स्टडी करते हैं और उनका वाइल्ड इंस्टिंग उभारने के लिए हम लोग कोशिश कर रहे हैं सौ से अधिक सीसीटीवी कैमरा से 24 घंटे जानवरों के स्वास्थ्य और दिनचर्या की निगरानी भी रखी जाती है इस फैसिलिटी में दुनिया का सबसे बेहतरीन एनिमल हॉस्पिटल है जहां रेस्क्यू किए हुए जानवरों का चेकअप किया जाता है हमारी टीम में इंडिया के सर्वश्रेष्ठ वेटनरी डॉक्टर जिनके पास कार्नी के साथ काम करने का एक लंबा अनुभव है हम सारे डॉक्टर्स 24 फोर बाई सेवन फैसिलिटी में अवेलेबल रहते हैं टू प्रोवाइड द वर्ल्ड क्लास ट्रीटमेंट टू दर्ड इन एवर रिक्वायर्ड हमारे हॉस्पिटल में दुनिया की सबसे एडवांस इक्विपमेंट्स है जैसे कि एंडोस्कोपिक मशीन और पोर्टेबल एक्सरे पोर्टेबल एक्सरे को हम ऑन साइट एनिमल के पास लेके उनका एक्सरे ले सकते हैं बिना उनको डिस्टर्ब किए और तो और हमारे पास ऑन साइट लेबोरेटरी भी है हमने इस सेंटर को ये ध्यान में रख के बनाया है कि जब हम यहाँ रेस्क्यूड एनिमल्स लाते हैं तो हम सिर्फ उसको एक अच्छा एनवायरमेंट के अलावा मानसिक विकास के लिए तरह तरह के एनरिचमेंट भी देते हैं जैसे अपना खाना खुद तलाश करने देना दूसरे जानवरों की खुशबू उनके बाड़े में छोड़ना दूसरे जानवरों के ढांचे में उन्हें मीट देना और इनके न्यूट्रिशन का खास ख्याल रखते हुए इनकी डाइट तैयार की जाती है जी जेड आर आर सी की सबसे अहम कड़ी है हमारे केयर टेकर्स जो इन जानवरों की अपने परिवार की तरह ही देखभाल करते हैं हमारा फोकस जितना एनिमल्स पर है उतना ही कैरेटिकल्स पे भी है इंडिया में जुआलॉजी की फील्ड और एजुकेशन को आगे बढ़ाने के लिए हम बेस्ट ट्रेनिंग सुविधा यहाँ प्रदान करते हैं इस पूरी प्रक्रिया में सेंट्रल जू अथॉरिटी गुजरात स्टेट वाइल्ड लाइफ डिपार्टमेंट का काफी सहयोग रहा है ये हमारी जिम्मेदारी है कि हम एक दूसरे का ख्याल रखें और इस पृथ्वी को एक ऐसी जगह बनाएं जहां इंसान और जानवर दोनों खुशी से रह सके ये सिर्फ एक शुरुआत है लेकिन एक सही शुरुआत अपने आप में एक जीत है आगे बढ़ते जाना है ये सिर्फ देश की नहीं बल्कि दुनिया की सबसे बड़ी फैसिलिटी बनानी है
uh, till the valedictory session starts, I would just like to remind all the zoo directors who are present here, CZD had circulated four important things in the past couple of days. First one is the suggestion boxes to be installed at every zoo. So we would like to have mails from all the zoo who have already initiated it and those who will be doing it shortly over a period of time. So we just want response from all the zoos. So kindly please uh, comply with this. First is the suggestion box. Second is we had circulated a zoo survey. That zoo survey format has been him, uh, personally approved by the Honorable Minister. He took uh, great care to go through each and every field of it. And he, it is part of his actionable points, which was deliberated in the CZA 39th meeting. And he is regularly taking feedback on the ATR every 15 days. So we want that uh, response from the zoo. Please fill up that form and send it to us at the earliest possible. It is about the zoo information, like what are the facilities you have in terms of electricity, water, uh, visitor facilities, when was the zoo established, how many visitors are coming to the zoo. So all this information is there. We have circulated the format already. Even if someone is not having it, you can just get back to our team. They will give you the link for that format. So second is this information. Third was we had circulated a feedback form. This again was as per the Honorable Minister instructions. Uh, we want to like to know like what are the vis uh, visitor feedback. It is online also. We had given it's an online link also. So please uh, get that fill from the visitors and send us a compliance uh, if possible fortnightly. So then we can have a database created and whenever uh, we have to, sir has to attend the meeting, we can just put it forward towards the minister that these are the suggestions just come up for these zoos. So uh, these are some of the things we would request you to please uh, fill it up and send it back to us. Don't forget it after going from the conference. Otherwise, we'll again send reminder mails from CZD. So we look for active participation for this four things especially, please. Thank you.
Namaskar, and, and on behalf of the Central Zoo Authority and the Nandan Kanan Zoological Park, I welcome Honorable Minister of Forest Environment and Climate Change, Government of Orissa, Shri Pradeep Kumar Amadji. I also welcome Shri, uh, Shri Devi Dad Viswalji, who is the Principal Chief Conservator of Forest and Head of Forest Force, Forest Environment and Climate Change, Government of Orissa. I welcome Shri Sushil Kumar Popliji, who is the Principal Chief Conservator of Forests and Chief Wildlife Warden, Forest, Environment and Climate Change Government of Orissa. I also welcome the other esteemed dignitaries who are present here with us today and to all our participants once again to the valedictory session of the two-day national conference for zoo directors. I'm sure the sessions over the, two, uh, over the past two days have led to fruitful discussion and knowledge, knowledge sharing among everyone here, which will strengthen our Indian zoos and the XC2 Conservation Network. And uh, before we begin, I would also like to, uh, I would now request Dr. Sanjay Kumar Shukla, Member Secretary, Central Zoo Authority, to formally welcome Honorable Minister, Forest, Environment and Climate Change, Government of Orissa, Shri Pradeep Kumar Amadji. I would now request Ms. Mrs. Akansha Mahajan, Deputy Inspector General of Forest Central Zoo Authority, to formally welcome Sri Devi Datta Deviswalji, who is the Principal Chief Conservator of Forests and Head of Forest Force, Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of Orissa. I would now request Dr. Manoj Nair, Director Nandan Kanan Zoological Park, to formally welcome Sri Sushil Kumar Popliji, Principal Chief Conservator of Forests and Chief Wildlife Warden, Forest Environment and Climate Change, Government of Orissa. I would now request Honorable Minister, Forest Environment and Climate Change, Government of Orissa, and other esteemed dignitaries on the dais to release a video on the Nandan Kanan Zoological Park. Thank <laughs> you. 
I would also now request Honorable Minister of Forest Environment and Climate Change, Government of Orissa, and other esteemed dignitaries on the dais to release a video on the species recovery program of Gharial in the River Mahanadi. Thank you, sirs. I now invite Sri Sushil Kumar Popliji, Principal Chief Conservator of Forests and Chief Adler Wharton, Forest Environment and Climate Change Government of Orissa, to kindly say a few words. Thank you. <coughs> Respected Shri Pradeep Kumar Amaji, our Honorable Minister, Forest Environment and Climate Change. Shri Devidat Biswal, PCCF and <coughs> Head of Forest Force, Odisha. Shri Sanjay Shukla, Member Secretaries, Central Zoo Authority of Central Zoo Authority, Government of India. Shri Manoj Nair, our Dynamic Director, 
Nandan Kanan, and also the Chief Wildlife, Chief Conservator of Forest Wildlife in the Office of Chief Wildlife Warden. Our esteemed senior Sir Shri S.K. Patnaik, he has been the pioneer, and as uh, Manoj had made a mention in the presentation, he's one of the founder fathers, or I could, uh, more appropriate would be, he's the beast pitama of zoo administration in the country. I, I think most of us who are associated with the wildlife conservation know very well about him. Other dignitaries of the dais, our participants from across the country, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost an evening, a very good evening to all of you. You all would agree with me that even today, having put in many years of service, the military session, for obvious and justified reasons, continues to be the most awaited event of any conference. I think you all will agree with me for the obvious reason, and there is perhaps no exception here also. I think you all will agree with me. Most of the time, most of you who have come from outside the, most of you have in fact come from outside the state. You would also like to go to see our lovely city Bhubaneswar, as earlier mentioned in the inaugural session by most of our speakers, a city of temple, Odisha, our state of Lord Jagannath, one of the dhams of Hindus. Char dham bolte hain, iska hamara dham, Jagannath Mahaprabhu. That's the thing. However, before we embark, embark and allow you to go and visit Bhuvneshwar, lovely city, it is desirable to have a validity session. That's how we are here today in this last session of the conference. The deliberations have, though I, I, didn't, I couldn't participate for many reasons, mostly the official commitments. Today, as you all know, we had a, we have our National Forest Martyrs Day also. Since morning, we are busy, our Honorable Minister, and we all are busy in that. Director and Joy, Deputy Director, I think, Again, this uh, phone will probably our Union Minister of State had got, been to Nandan Kanan, and last evening also I was also accompanying them. That's how we probably were conspicuously absent because of these reasons. However, when I went through the schedule and also got the input from our officials, the deliberations have revolved around many varied topics, starting from advances made in ex situ management to linking of such measures with the in situ conservations. And all present here would perhaps agree with me that ex situ conservation, including breeding programs, as just we saw it, undertaken in various parts of the country have by and large ensured species conservation. And there is no denying of fact that the zoos have played the important role in this. Compliments to all the zoo directors present with their predecessors and all. The zoos have really played an important role in that. For information of the house, we in Odisha have made a humble beginning, as just you saw the video, regarding the integration of in situ and ex situ conservation measures, particularly in regard to the gharials. We have, as you just saw, we have a project titled Species Recovery of Gharial in River Mahanadi. We release, as you have seen, I'll not just go through that, I'll just come to the end of this. We have now, for the first time in many decades, many years, have found breeding happening in the wild particularly of the Ghadial. It's really a matter of celebration by all the zoo directors and the in situ uh, in the ex, and the ex situ conservation advocates. We have successfully gone in for, though it's just a humble beginning, but nevertheless, we have made a beginning and we hope in the coming years, it will not happen in few months, in the coming years, we'll be able to have a viable population of the Ghadials in our, their natural habitat, that is Mahanadi Gods, to name one such habitat in the state of Odisha. Another vision, I think when I entered, I think uh, 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 Mr. Sanjay Shukla was, no, no, Sanjay Shukla was not talking, I think uh, Mr. Yadav was talking about our ex-PCCF uh, from Tamil Nadu. 10 years vision plan 2021, 23, uh, 2021, 2031 for Indian zoos and central zoo authority. As we all are very well aware, zoos not only contribute towards conservation of the varied wildlife species, including being the including being the home for many of the endangered species in the wild. These zoos are even required for creating an education and awareness among the people, policy makers, and also is considered from our childhood days. We used to have very limited species. It has grown many folds today. It is, create, it is considered as one of the very important recreation facility for most of we, the Indians. Hence, we need to have the zoos with the highest standards. I have not gone through the action plan. I have talked about this. We must have deliberated about this. And hence, I'm uh, 
Sure, once we go back, we'll work on our this vision plan, try to implement the provisions made therein, try to get it modified in case we want site-specific changes are to be done. We are, as I have told, the zoo. I think uh, you must have observed in uh, during your visit to Nandan Kanan. Nandan Kanan Zoo is par excellence. Doesn't it? Not that I'm from. Uh, I'm holding a department wherein zoo comes with us. It is par excellence. This is further certified by the observation of the honourable union minister who visited last uh, last evening to Nandan Kanan Zoo. He has commented in the visitors book. I'll just quote the English version he has given in Hindi. The Honorable Minister, Union Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change during his visit to the zoo last evening has praised the efforts of the zoo personnel in the management and upkeep of the zoo. That it goes to our all officials associated with that. Then uh, just a few more things and then I conclude with last time I a vote of thanks because because of the possibility of time. So I can very well have a right to take little extra time today. Anyway, vision document, as I have told you, the other thing when I entered, uh, Shukla was talking about me to me zoo, that is management effectiveness evaluation of zoos. If I'm correct, you were talking, you were talking about that. I think this is the first, uh, first of its kind in the country. They have designed many indicators and the parameters to evaluate. First thing is done. I think many of us may feel good. Many of us may feel bad. It is under evaluated, not properly evaluated. Let's not take that, that in that spirit. Let's take yeah, some sincere effort has been made by Central Zoo Authority and we can take it forward by going in for site specific or if we feel there is a need to go for changes, we can suggest and I think Central Zoo Authority will be very happy to accept those changes which can be made into the that evaluation criteria. I think that would be of this workshop or the conference best take home for all of us. We'll go back, analyze where do we stand, and we'll, I'm sure we'll take steps to see to it, we improve and come to the level of other zoos which have been categorized as very good. So I think we, that will be the biggest take home for all of us, because basically, though we are, we are technical, administrative technical, but side by side, we are the administrator also answerable to the government and answerable to the people why we have not performed well in the criteria prescribed by the government of India. Irrespective of whether I'm, I am a large zoo or I'm a small zoo, we need to work on that. And I thank uh, Central Zoo Authority for devising certain criteria, uniform criteria. And I think 15, 15 experts had evaluated visiting the zoos. I think 39 or 40 zoos were visited. So that's a good work and that's a good take home for us. At least I feel my officers in Odisha will definitely see to the parameters wherein we have performed comparatively lesser than the other uh, better performing zoos will definitely see to it key those are addressed and the next evaluation when it carries out we are there to address that and uh, i'm sure outcome of the conference definitely would lead to our more zeal and enthusiasm in improving the zoo management i request uh, mr shukla to see to it key we get the minutes and the decisions of the proceedings of this workshop as soon as possible so that we can take a call on implementing that then the last is, before I conclude, I place on record that it has been the matter, I'll just read out this, because this needs to be very appropriate. It won't be good, I'll read out. Before I conclude, I place on record that it has been a matter of pride for us in the state of Odisha that the Central Zoo Authority entrusted with the responsibility of organizing this conference. We sincerely thank them. I now quickly wind up my address thanking all the resource persons, zoo directors and other participants for making the conference fulfill its ob objective. I'm quite sure the team Nandan Kanan has taken all measures to see to it your stay, your fooding, lodging, visit, site visits has been comfortable. I think they deserve a round of applause from all of us. Thank you. Even our due acknowledgements are to the Hotel Mayfair for providing us all the logistics, of course, this is at cost, but they also deserve a recognition and appreciation from all of them. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, sir, for your for the words of wisdom and for you know inspiring us. I now invite Sri Devi Datta Biswalji, the Principal Chief Conservator of Forests, Head of and Head of Forest Force, Forest Environment and Climate Change Government to Farisa to say a few words. Thank you. Honorable Minister for Forest Environment and Climate Change, Government of Odisha, Sri Pradeep Kumar Ramaji, respected 
PCC Wildlife and CWLW Odisha, Sri S.K. Pupi sir, Sanjay Sukla, Manoj, senior officers, the directors of Jew directors who come from all of the country, senior retired officers, Tyagi sir, uh, Saros Patnaik sir, as rightly said by Pupi sir. Uh, Saros sir is like Vishnu Pitama. In fact, I, we remember sir, whenever when we came back from academy, he was the person who in, uh, who uh, we got attached to Nandan Sananju and he was our mentor. So it's like sir, you can see your next generation holding stays now. Uh, very good evening, uh, good, evening uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, at the outset, uh, allow please allow me to join with all of us, all of you to pay our sincere homage to the uh, brave souls of the forest department who have laid down their lives in the line of duty on this very, very solemn occasion of the Martyrs Day. And uh, let us uh, do things to make them proud and not do things which will let them down and, uh, and, 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 uh, and go their sacrifice, supreme sacrifice in vain. Coming back to this uh, workshop, uh, uh, let me first admit that when Sanjay came to, uh, you know, invite me, uh, I said yes at once. And in fact, I'm delighted to be here for two reasons. One is that this gives me an opportunity to meet with some of my officers who I'm, whom I had trained during my six year tenure as the IGNFA, you can see Mr. Ji. Mr. Ji is not to be seen. Is he here or left? Uh, Sugur, Raja Mohan. Uh, then Padam Priya, uh, Akansha, and uh, our own neighbors and view owners pride, owners Nair. So I'm very proud today that uh, the officers whom we trained, now uh, they have come of age holding very, very responsible positions. And not only that, are very good at that. Uh, all of them are outstanding officers. And uh, if you feel that the Jews in India are doing well, I can pat myself on the back and take a little bit of credit. And if they're not, then you can, you know whom to blame. Yeah. Then <clears throat> secondly, why I'm delighted to be here, why I'm happy to be here is that I actually look forward to such occasions. Now forestry has become a lot of core forestry plus the frills. This is core forestry. When you talk about frills, okay, it's fine. The side dishes look well as far as the optics is concerned, but the core, the main dish actually is the filling. So this is the core competence. This is the core forestry, one of the core subjects which we must always dwell and debate and learn. And these two days at Bhubaneswar, I'm sure must have been well spent by all of you. As Popli sir had said on the first day, it gives a score for peer learning. You must have learned from each other. There would have been a lot of dissemination information. In fact, I was going through the schedule where I saw uh, the plan being very meticulously planned. And then we go back, learn from uh, others, take some knowledge from here, do a course correction, and see whether we can make a contribution to take our Jews to the next level. I'll also like to congratulate Sanjay and uh, the CJ Day for bringing out this Jew, uh, uh, me, me Jew, uh, this thing where you have evaluated all the Jews. Not that I'm a very, very big advocate of this rat race of you know, ranking, but then don't take it like that. Once we rank, we know where we are, not from the point of view that we, down, uh, we want to show down somebody. Uh, in fact, before I, I, I remember a very interesting anecdote I thought I will share with you. People who are at the bottom of the ranking don't draw long faces because this is uh, an anecdote with, which I share with you. There is a senior, Pupli Sarno, probably Manas Khan, I will not name him, but you can take a guess. Very senior IS officer said that when he was in class three, he flunked in mass, he got zero. So he was very scared to go to his father. Incidentally, his father was a forest officer. So very reluctantly and seriously, he went to the father, so the report card. His father, and he started crying. His father said, come on, son, son, don't worry. You can only go up from here. You cannot go down below this. You can only go up from here. You know, 
So that is what, when you are at the bottom of the ladder, you always think that you can go up from there and how to improve yourself. And don't think that, you know, these things. But only thing I want to uh, tell you is that when we are ranking, there are also a few constraints, which is very, very inherent to your Jew. For example, let's say the space constraint and something which you cannot help. But within that constraint, if we target at not per se or so much to improve your rank, but improve the ratings. Suppose I am 30, tomorrow I should target for 35 or 40. 40 may be the last, doesn't matter. We compete with ourselves and make, take us to the next level. In fact, I would also like to thank Sanjay for, you know, I know this has been organized under the dual aspects of uh, CJ Day and Nandan Kanan. I know how hard you are working. And I must congratulate Sanjay for keeping his cool when he's under the pump. So he's always smiling. And I saw coming here two days before, looking at all the nitty gritties. And uh, Sanjit and Manoj Nair have sleepless nights. Today you can sleep well. <laughs> but anyway, the job very, very well done. Talking of Nandan Kanan Jew, uh, this Jew is very close to my heart because uh, this is the city where I, I was, I almost grew up here. So I've been watching Nandan Kanan Jew for a long time. I think if I remember correctly from the 19, early 1970s. This has come up a long, come a long way. And uh, the dedication, sincerity of the Jew staff is to be praised. But even then, when we talk about, even, even let us say the Jew has start, topped the list, also should have some scope of introspection saying whether we can take it to the next level. We can, not only, not only Jews are as, uh, Pope Lisa said, it's a source of, uh, you know, um, entertainment for visitors. Uh, it's also a seat for learning. It's a seat for uh, research, a seat for um, other, any uh, um, exit to conservation and all that. But, we can, is there a scope or we have stagnated? Can we make it uh, just something comes widely to my mind? Can, can we take it to a level something like a Jurong Bird Park or something where the people will get much better experience? What do I mean to say is, as I said, that the bottom and the ladder should not feel bad. In the top of the ladder also, they shouldn't feel complacent. There is always scope to improve and how we can improve and take it to the next level, wherever we are. That should be. That should be our motto. So, uh, I don't say much. I thought that I'll speak as temper. Then, uh, I'm not, Manoj, you have given me written this thing. A lot have been done about Nandan Kanan, but I, I'm not going to repeat that because all of them have seen that. And uh, I'm sure Nandan Kanan Jew is in very safe hands. So, here again, I wish that the learnings which we have uh, learned from here, we carry to our um, respective fields. Uh, do keep in touch amongst yourselves and keep interacting. And uh, let us uh, take our Jews to the next level and uh, the country's Jew to a next level. Whenever somebody says that our Jews are inferior to the, let's say, the Jews in Europe or Singapore, a day would come when they will say that we are equally good, if not better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable uh, suggestions and inputs. I now invite Honorable Minister, Forest, Environment and Climate Change, Government of Orissa, Shri Pradeep Kumar Amaji, to deliver the keynote address. Namaskar, dignitaries in the dais, Sri Biswal PCCF Hof, Sri Popli PCCF Wildlife, Member Secretary Sri Sarma, and Director Nandan Kanan Sri Nair, and all other dignitaries in front of the dais, participants, and all, all other friends. I'm very glad to be here 
at the validatory function of the National Conference for Jew Directors 2022, being organized by the Central Jew Authority in association with the Nandan Kanan Geological Park. In fact, after I attended the inaugural session yesterday, I was inquiring about the progress of the conference with the concerned officers today and was informed that the sessions went very well as planned. I'm also delighted to know that a visit to Nandan Kanan Jew was also organized and that it was a very enjoyable, enjoyable and fruitful experience with many, many practical take-home lessons. It is also a matter of happiness that Honorable Minister for Environment, Forest and Climate Change, as well as the Minister for State, both visited the Jew and expressed their appreciation at the excellent manner in which the Jew is being managed, especially the naturalistic and large enclosures, state of the art, health care facilities, ded dedication of the staff and great strides made in conservation buildings. I am informed that the sessions in, in the conference spanned various themes such as the 10-year vision plan for Indian Jews. It is heartening to know that many Jew directors presented their experiences and the way of their Jews are going ahead with the planning process. Other very important topics were also discussed at length, such as intervention required for exuit management of species of high conservation priority, linking insuit and exuit conservation and holistic planning of exuit conservation in Juj. I am particularly impressed and happy that an exclusive session on the emerging concept of wildlife diseases and one health was held. The topic assumes special significance in the context of the COVID pandemic and I urged all the present here to give emphasis on this crucial accept aspect. As I mentioned yesterday, upgradation and beautification of Nandan Kanan is one among the earmarked projects under the 5T initiatives of our Honorable Chief Minister, Sri Navin Patnaik. As all of you know, our Honorable Chief Minister is a great lover of nature and wildlife and always takes personal interest and guides us in activities regarding conservation of wildlife and improvement of Nandan Kanan. I hope that Nandan Kanan Jew officials will also gain valuable insights from this conference and apply it in the process of their ongoing master plan preparation. I will also take this opportunity to request the Central Jew Authority to provide their valuable gu guidance and support to Nandan Kanan in this regard, especially with regard to improve and enhance collection plan as well as facilitating exchange of Jews animals. I congratulate the dedicated team of the officials of Nandan Kanan for organizing the con this conference successfully at very short notice. I especially thank the Central Jew Authority for having given Odisha the opportunity to host this conference. I am sure that all the participants have benefited immensely from these two days of learning and mutual experience sharing. I trust that you have found your stay in our beautiful capital city pleasant and comfortable. Once again, I 
thank you all and offer my best wishes in your professional and personal life. Thank you all. Bande Utkolajan. Thank you so much, sir. I now invite Dr. Sanjay Kumar Shukla, Member Secretary, Central Zoo Authority, to deliver the vote of thanks. All the dignitaries on the dais, all the senior officers sitting in this concluding session of the two-day long conference, and all dear participants. It was 29th night when we got the message that we have to uh, organize this two-day conference. So that was a very short, or very short notice because we had sent the file to Honorable Minister's office and we were expecting it to be held in the third or fourth week of September. But informally, we got a news, uh, we got a message that it has to be organized on 9th and 10th. So I immediately dropped the message in the night itself. I still remember it, it was 9, I dropped a message to Manoj. And probably he was also busy, so he thought that we are inviting him in a workshop that is to be uh, held somewhere else. So he uh, said sort of that he is busy with the uh, elephant issue and he'll be attending. So I also just shared a thumb, I just sent a thumbs up. I also did not read the, read the, read the message properly that time. Again, in the morning when we talked to discuss in detail about the workshop, then we find that we did not have enough time. So thanks to Manoj. Sujit and the entire team of Nandan Kanan. I mean, they worked day in, day out to make this happen. And so meticulously, they planned everything and it went off smoothly because we were very much worried because this was being organized on a such a short notice. And it was, there were many administrative issues. It kept on changing every moment. And I, it was really uh, 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 good that it all went uh, very smooth. Now, it was uh, for the participants, we were not sure like how many would be coming because we were uh, uh, inviting them on a very, very short notice. Uh, when we met last in Kevadia, so that time the participation was close to 100. And that time, there were two uh, sort of, uh, we had invited directors and veterinarians both. And we have some parallel events also along with the uh, zoo directors conference, zoo directors and veterinarians conference. So this time we were not sure what would be the uh, participation. And every the minister office was checking up like how many would turn up. So we were also like worried that just because the honorable minister, both the ministers are coming here and the participation is not good. So it won't be, uh, I mean, uh, uh, good uh, on our part that we are holding this conference with not a good attendance. I'm really happy that you all traveled from all parts of the country across all zoos I'm really thankful to all of you that you made this success by just your participation and not only being present here, it was your active participation and the brilliant presentations made by some of the uh, zoo directors. I know that everybody could not get a chance just because of the paucity of time. Because of the minister schedule, we have to uh, uh, keep it a sort of a one and a half day event because the first day we could uh, inaugurate the session post lunch only. So we did not have enough time, otherwise we wanted to have more session for uh, the participants, sort of have some uh, group discussions and then panel discussion because uh, uh, here we, I think that we did not get uh, enough opportunity to interact. Definitely we had some of the very good resource persons like uh, uh, PC Tyagi sir, uh, uh, Dr. Uma is here, Dr. Sindhura, Dr. Anoop, Karthi, Dr. Karthikeyan. So we have some very good plenary thematic sessions and some of the uh, zoo directors really made very nice presentations. So it was a good learning for all of us here who uh, were present and uh, it also gave an opportunity to exchange your uh, uh, good ideas and uh, uh, sort of uh, the issues which uh, you could have shared for knowledge sharing also. So that was sort of good opportunity. So now, uh, a sort of formal thing also, and I'll do that. So this event has been a very fruitful endeavor and has been a platform for formal and informal discussions and sharing of ideas and exploring opportunities for collaborations. 
The theme for the workshop was conceptualized to discuss the vision plan 2021-31. And I think that we wanted to have some more time for uh, or to uh, deliberate on this uh, issue, but we did not get sufficient time. So maybe we will be coming up again, uh, maybe either in the sort of some uh, uh, smaller workshop or virtual meeting. We'll be having at least with those uh, zoos which have been 15 zoos which are there in the vision plan. We, altered, we also wanted to apprise the zoo directors of the possibilities for better collaboration with institutions working in the field of One Health, disease surveillance, and also incorporation of newer interventions in management practices for a species of conservation priority. Uh, we are grateful for the Honorable Minister of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change, Government of India, who has been a source of constant support and encouragement. He has provided directions for activities in zoos, ranging from engagement of youth, collaboration with museums, outreach of current issues in the sector for wildlife, environment, and climate change. He has also encouraged evaluations and self-reflection for better monitoring of the activities that zoos take up in ex situ conservation models. We hope this gathering and the dis discussions, the friendship forged and the professional rela relationships built will be a stepping stone for improved communications and improved implementation of conservation initiatives on the ground. CZA is committed to backing the scientific management of programs, planned education and outreach programs, and capacity enhancement across all sectors of the zoo. We also encourage fruitful multi-sectoral collaborations and adop adoption of innovation and technology in various aspects of monitoring. I would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to respected Sri Ashwini Kumar Chaubaji, Honorable Minister of State for Environment, Forest, Climate Change, Government of India, for his guidance and support to zoos and the programs like Adopt an Animal. And he was really overwhelmed uh, today when he visited the Nandan Kanan Zoo, and uh, he saw uh, uh, two uh, cubs of one lion and one uh, tiger. And he was really overwhelmed to see the attachment they had uh, with the zookeepers. And uh, so they uh, actually, uh, he has uh, just informed me that his office uh, shall be uh, giving a sort of citation uh, letter sending uh, from his office to both the zookeepers. And the, he told me to inform this to zoo management, right? So this is a very kind gesture on his part. I express my gratitude to Honorable Shri Pradeep Kumar Amadji, Honorable Minister of Forest Environment and Climate Change Department, Government of Odisha, for his sparing time for our workshop. And I'm sure, sir, without your support, this was not going to happen. And this was uh, uh, not in the, uh, a manner the way uh, we could organize this. So this was your kind support that, and you spared your time both for the inaugural and the closing session. So I express my heartfelt gratitude to you for this, sir. And I assure you, uh, like the issues which are pending with the CZA or wherever there is a need of any technical support, whether it is a master plan or the uh, uh, collection plan, we are always ready to help them out. And whatever issues are pending there, we'll just work with them to sort this out. I express my sincere thanks and gratitude to Sri Devidat Biswal, sir, Principal Chief Conservator of Forest and Head of Forest Force, uh, Government of Orissa, for extending his support and facilitating the smooth conduct of this workshop. Uh, I'm really thankful, sir, the day I met uh, and uh, requested, I know that Manoj initially had informed that you had some busy schedule, but despite that, you kindly consented to be present here, and I'm really thankful that you attended both the sessions, sir. My heartfelt thanks to Shri Sushil Kumar Popli, sir, Principal Chief Conservator of Forest and Chief Wildlife Warden, Government of Odisha, for being us through the planning and execution of workshop. And I know, sir, uh, uh, how much you have to put in your effort to streamline all the uh, uh, these uh, processes and to get this uh, uh, organized in a smooth way. So my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to you, sir. Now, coming to the resource person, we had some of the best resource persons uh, for the subject. And I express my most sincere thanks and gratitude to uh, uh, PC Tyagi, sir. And uh, Dr. Uh, Karthikian, probably he has led just because he had flight, Dr. Sindura, uh, Dr. Anup, Dr. Uma uh, Ramakrishnan. 
So on the behalf of CZA and the Nandan Kanan Zoological Park, I extend my heart, heartfelt thanks and gratitude to all of you. Now a big hand for uh, Manoj, Sujit and their team. Uh, it was not possible to organize this in such a smooth way. I know that they worked in, uh, day in and day out and uh, tirelessly. Uh, I, I know like sir was rightly saying that now you'll have good sleep today. So because for, I know that for last one week you have been working so hard. So I, I just express my thanks and gratitude to uh, your entire team and both of you. Thanks to uh, Mayfair for uh, all the hospitality, Mayfair Lagoon for all the hospitality and the wonderful arrangements they have made uh, here. I think the people who were staying must have been having a, quite a memorable uh, uh, stay uh, of this place. And this event also they were organized very uh, uh, meticulously. Uh, we still remember just a day before, uh, the hall was supposed to be handed over to us in the night of 12. And we came around 12 and we found that it is still, the stalls were here uh, just because some exhibition was, uh, uh, had been organized in this hall. And it got, could get cleared around 3 a.m. in the morning. And just in three, four hours, they made this hall ready for us. So it was really commendable. Actually, we were uh, uh, really worried that night, sir. So. Thank you to uh, Mayfair Lagoon and their team. Now, sir. Yes, sir. So now coming to the team of uh, NT, uh, CZA led by Akanksha. Uh, so, uh, so they all did a really uh, very good job. So. Uh, so right from the day it was announced uh, that the uh, that it came to our knowledge that it has to be organized here in Bhuvneshwar. So they were working together with the team of Nandan Kanan. So I uh, uh, just express my sincere thanks to uh, team CZA also. And now the participants, without their active participation, this was never uh, uh, going to be such a fruitful uh, conference. So in the last, I would like to express my most sincere gratitude to all the participants who traveled from so far away places and, they, and actively participated in the conference. I would I also like to extend my sincere thanks to uh, media, both electronic and print, who were present here and who uh, extended their support for coverage of the, this two day, day long conference. So I wish you all a very happy journey back home with good memories and we hope we'll be meeting soon and we'll be sharing the actionable points of this conference as early as possible as Poplisar has said. So, and we hope to see you all soon in the next conference. Thank you. Sir, I think I'll, uh... Request a last word to be made from my side, sir. Sir, it's just uh, you have offered the vote of thanks, so I was divested of the opportunity to thank you. So on behalf of every one of us, sir, it is your very calm guidance that actually uh, made all this happen, along with uh, Opli, sir, Biswal, sir. And right from the top, even uh, Honorable Minister was office was so kind to coordinate tirelessly with CM office. They were also kind. So, sir, uh, let me, uh, on behalf of every one of us here and Team Nandan Karan, every single person who worked along with uh, us, and Sanjeet, uh, big hand to you and all the participants, actually. Everyone, every single participant. So, again, I uh, welcome all of you to come back to Orissa with your families, maybe not as part of an official agenda or something, with more relaxed manner. Orissa, specifically, Bhuvneshwar has a lot to offer. So please do come. We'll be more than happy to host you as part of an extended zoo family. Thank you all very much once again.
Uh, thank you so much. Before you disperse, as a token of uh, gratitude, I would request Dr. Sanjay Kumar Shukla, Member Secretary, Central Zoo Authority, to kindly give a memento as a token of our appreciation and gratitude to Honorable Minister, Forest, Environment and Climate Change, Government of Odisha, Shri Pradeep Kumar Ramaji. I would now request uh, Mrs. Akansha Mahajan, uh, Deputy Inspector General uh, of Forest Central Zoo Authority, to kindly uh, give a, a token of our appreciation to Sri Rebi Datta Biswalji, Principal Chief Conservator of Forests and Head of Forest Force, Forest Environment and Climate Change, Government of India. I would now request Dr. Manoj Nair, Director, Nandan Garden Zoological Park, to kindly give a token of uh, appreciation to Sri Sushil Kumar Popliji, who is a Principal Chief Conservator of Forests and Chief Wildlife Warden, Government of Orissa. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, sirs esteemed dignitaries and to the participants for the two-day national for coming for this two-day national conference for zoo directors we now break for high tea i hope you've had a very good stay and uh, experience here thank you